Chapter 14 The Ball Ensign Mackambitch having gone to the Highland camp upon duty, and Bailey MacWeeble having retired to digest his dinner and Evan Dew's intimation of martial law in some blind change house, Waverley, with the Baron and the Chieftain, proceeded to Holyrood House. The two last were in full tide of spirits, and the Baron rallied in his way our hero upon the handsome figure which his new dress displayed to advantage. If you have any design upon the heart of a bonny Scotch lassie, I would premonish you, when you address her, to remember and quote the words of Virgilius. Nunc insanus amor duri me martis in armis. Tila intermedia ac adversos detonate hosts. Wilk versus Robertson of Struan, chief of the clan Donachy, unless the claims of Lude ought to be preferred primo loco, has thus elegantly rendered. For cruel love had gartened low my leg. And clad my hurdies in a phyla bag. Although, indeed, ye wear the trues, a garment wilk I approve maist of the TWA, as mere ancient and seemly. Or rather, said Fergus, hear my song. She wadna hay a lowland laird. Nor be an English lady. But she's away with Duncan Graham. And he's rowed her in his platy. By this time they reached the palace of Holyrood, and were announced respectively as they entered the apartments. It is but too well known how many gentlemen of rank, education, and fortune took a concern in the ill-fated and desperate undertaking of 1745. The ladies, also, of Scotland very generally espoused the cause of the gallant and handsome young prince, who threw himself upon the mercy of his countrymen rather like a hero of romance than a calculating politician. It is not, therefore, to be wondered that Edward, who had spent the greater part of his life in the solemn seclusion of Waverley Honor, should have been dazzled at the liveliness and elegance of the scene now exhibited in the long deserted halls of the Scottish palace. The accompaniments, indeed, fell short of splendor, being such as the confusion and hurry of the time admitted, still, however, the general effect was striking, and, the rank of the company considered, might well be called brilliant. It was not long before the lover's eye discovered the object of his attachment. Flora MacIver was in the act of returning to her seat, near the top of the room, with Rose Bradwardine by her side. Among much elegance and beauty, they had attracted a great degree of the public attention, being certainly two of the handsomest women present. The prince took much notice of both, particularly of Flora, with whom he danced, a preference which she probably owed to her foreign education and command of the French and Italian languages. When the bustle attending the conclusion of the dance permitted, Edward almost intuitively followed Fergus to the place where Miss MacIver was seated. The sensation of hope with which he had nursed his affection in absence of the beloved object seemed to vanish in her presence, and, like one striving to recover the particulars of a forgotten dream. He would have given the world at that moment to have recollected the grounds on which he had founded expectations which now seemed so delusive. He accompanied Fergus with downcast eyes, tingling ears, and the feelings of the criminal who, while the melancholy cart moves slowly through the crowds that have assembled to behold his execution, receives no clear sensation either from the noise which fills his ears or the tumult on which he casts his wandering look. Flora seemed a little, a very little, affected and discomposed at his approach. I bring you an adopted son of Ivor, said Fergus. And I receive him as a second brother, replied Flora. There was a slight emphasis on the word, which would have escaped every ear but one that was feverish with apprehension. It was, however, distinctly marked, and, combined with her whole tone and manner, plainly intimated, I will never think of Mr. Waverley as a more intimate connection. Edward stopped, bowed, and looked at Fergus, who bit his lip, a movement of anger which proved that he also had put a sinister interpretation on the reception which his sister had given his friend. This, then, is an end of my daydream. Such was Waverley's first thought, and it was so exquisitely painful as to banish from his cheek every drop of blood. Good God, said Rose Bradwardine, he is not yet recovered. These words, which she uttered with great emotion, were overheard by the chevalier himself, who stepped hastily forward, and, taking Waverley by the hand, inquired kindly after his health, and added that he wished to speak with him. By a strong and sudden effort, which the circumstances rendered indispensable, Waverley recovered himself so far as to follow the chevalier in silence to a recess in the apartment. Here the prince detained him some time, 
asking various questions about the great Tory and Catholic families of England, their connections, their influence, and the state of their affections towards the House of Stuart. To these queries Edward could not at any time have given more than general answers, and it may be supposed that, in the present state of his feelings, his responses were indistinct even to confusion. The Chevalier smiled once or twice at the incongruity of his replies, but continued the same style of conversation, although he found himself obliged to occupy the principal share of it. Until he perceived that Waverley had recovered his presence of mind. It is probable that this long audience was partly meant to further the idea which the prince desired should be entertained among his followers, that Waverley was a character of political influence. But it appeared, from his concluding expressions, that he had a different and good-natured motive, personal to our hero, for prolonging the conference. I cannot resist the temptation, he said, of boasting of my own discretion as a lady's confidant. You see, Mr. Waverley, that I know all, and I assure you I am deeply interested in the affair. But, my good young friend, you must put a more severe restraint upon your feelings. There are many here whose eyes can see as clearly as mine, but the prudence of whose tongues may not be equally trusted. So saying, he turned easily away and joined a circle of officers at a few paces distance. Leaving Waverley to meditate upon his parting expression, which, though not intelligible to him in its whole purport, was sufficiently so in the caution which the last word recommended. Making, therefore, an effort to show himself worthy of the interest which his new master had expressed, by instant obedience to his recommendation, he walked up to the spot where Flora and Miss Bradwardine were still seated. And having made his compliments to the latter, he succeeded, even beyond his own expectation, in entering into conversation upon general topics. If, my dear reader, thou hast ever happened to take post horses at, or at, one at least of which blanks, or more probably both, you will be able to fill up from an inn near your own residence, you must have observed. And doubtless with sympathetic pain, the reluctant agony with which the poor jades at first apply their galled necks to the collars of the harness. But when the irresistible arguments of the postboy have prevailed upon them to proceed a mile or two, they will become callous to the first sensation. And being warm in the harness, as the said postboy may term it, proceed as if their withers were altogether unwrung. This simile so much corresponds with the state of Waverley's feelings in the course of this memorable evening, that I prefer it, especially as being, I trust. Wholly original, to any more splendid illustration with which Bish's art of poetry might supply me. Exertion, like virtue, is its own reward, and our hero had, moreover, other stimulating motives for persevering in a display of affected composure and indifference to Flora's obvious unkindness. Pride, which supplies its caustic as an useful, though severe, remedy for the wounds of affection, came rapidly to his aid. Distinguished by the favor of a prince. Destined, he had room to hope, to play a conspicuous part in the revolution which awaited a mighty kingdom. Excelling, probably, in mental acquirements, and equaling at least in personal accomplishments, most of the noble and distinguished persons with whom he was now ranked. Young, wealthy, and highborn, could he, or ought he, to droop beneath the frown of a capricious beauty? O oh, nymph, unrelenting and cold as thou art! My bosom is proud as thine own! With the feeling expressed in these beautiful lines, which, however, were not then written, Waverley determined upon convincing Flora that he was not to be depressed by a rejection in which his vanity whispered that perhaps she did her own prospects as much injustice as his. And, to aid this change of feeling, there lurked the secret and unacknowledged hope that she might learn to prize his affection more highly, when she did not conceive it to be altogether within her own choice to attract or repulse it. There was a mystic tone of encouragement, also, in the Chevalier's words, though he feared they only referred to the wishes of Fergus in favor of an union between him and his sister. But the whole circumstances of time, place, and incident combined at once to awaken his imagination and to call upon him for a manly and decisive tone of conduct, leaving to fate to dispose of the issue. Should he appear to be the only one sad and disheartened on the eve of battle, how greedily would the tale be commented upon by the slander which had been already but too busy with his fame. Never, never, he internally resolved, shall my unprovoked enemies possess such an advantage over my reputation. They occur in Miss Seward's fine verses, beginning. To thy rocks, stormy lawn now, 
adieu. Under the influence of these mixed sensations, and cheered at times by a smile of intelligence and approbation from the prince as he passed the group, Waverley exerted his powers of fancy, animation, and eloquence, and attracted the general admiration of the company. The conversation gradually assumed the tone best qualified for the display of his talents and acquisitions. The gaiety of the evening was exalted in character, rather than checked, by the approaching dangers of the morrow. All nerves were strung for the future, and prepared to enjoy the present. This mood of mind is highly favorable for the exercise of the powers of imagination, for poetry, and for that eloquence which is allied to poetry. Waverley, as we have elsewhere observed, possessed at times a wonderful flow of rhetoric, and on the present occasion, he touched more than once the higher notes of feeling, and then again ran off in a wild voluntary of fanciful mirth. He was supported and excited by kindred spirits, who felt the same impulse of mood and time, and even those of more cold and calculating habits were hurried along by the torrent. Many ladies declined the dance, which still went forward, and under various pretenses joined the party to which the handsome young Englishman seemed to have attached himself. He was presented to several of the first rank, and his manners, which for the present were altogether free from the bashful restraint by which, in a moment of less excitation, they were usually clouded, gave universal delight. Flora MacIver appeared to be the only female present who regarded him with a degree of coldness and reserve. Yet even she could not suppress a sort of wonder at talents which, in the course of their acquaintance, she had never seen displayed with equal brilliancy and impressive effect. I do not know whether she might not feel a momentary regret at having taken so decisive a resolution upon the addresses of a lover who seemed fitted so well to fill a high place in the highest stations of society. Certainly she had hitherto accounted among the incurable deficiencies of Edward's disposition the mauvaise haunt which, as she had been educated in the first foreign circles, and was little acquainted with the shyness of English manners, was in her opinion too nearly related to timidity and imbecility of disposition. But if a passing wish occurred that Waverley could have rendered himself uniformly thus amiable and attractive, its influence was momentary. For circumstances had arisen since they met which rendered in her eyes the resolution she had formed respecting him final and irrevocable. With opposite feelings Rose Bradwardine bent her whole soul to listen. She felt a secret triumph at the public tribute paid to one whose merit she had learned to prize too early and too fondly. Without a thought of jealousy, without a feeling of fear, pain, or doubt, and undisturbed by a single selfish consideration, she resigned herself to the pleasure of observing the general murmur of applause. When Waverley spoke, her ear was exclusively filled with his voice, when others answered, her eye took its turn of observation, and seemed to watch his reply. Perhaps the delight which she experienced in the course of that evening, though transient, and followed by much sorrow, was in its nature the most pure and disinterested which the human mind is capable of enjoying. Baron, said the Chevalier, I would not trust my mistress in the company of your young friend. He is really, though perhaps somewhat romantic, one of the most fascinating young men whom I have ever seen. And by my honor, sir, replied the baron, the lad can sometimes be as douf as a sexagenary like myself. If your royal highness had seen him dreaming and dozing about the banks of Tully Velen like an hypochondriac person, or, as Burton's, Anatomia, hath it, a phrenesiac or lethargic patient. You would wonder where he hath sae suddenly acquired all this fine sprack festivity and jocularity. Truly, said Fergus MacIver, I think it can only be the inspiration of the Tartans, for, though Waverley be always a young fellow of sense and honor, I have hitherto often found him a very absent and inattentive companion. We are the more obliged to him, said the prince, for having reserved for this evening qualities which even such intimate friends had not discovered. But come, gentlemen, the night advances, and the business of tomorrow must be early thought upon. Each take charge of his fair partner, and honor a small refreshment with your company. He led the way to another suite of apartments, and assumed the seat and canopy at the head of a long range of tables with an air of dignity, mingled with courtesy, which well became his high birth and lofty pretensions. An hour had hardly flown away when the musicians played the signal for parting so well known in Scotland which is, or was wont to be, the old air of, good night and joy be why, you a. Uh. Good night, then, said the chevalier, rising. Good night, and joy be with you. Good night, 
fair ladies, who have so highly honored a proscribed and banished prince. Good night, my brave friends. May the happiness we have this evening experienced be an omen of our return to these our paternal halls, speedily and in triumph, and of many and many future meetings of mirth and pleasure in the palace of Holyrood. When the Baron of Bradwardine afterwards mentioned this adieu of the Chevalier, he never failed to repeat, in a melancholy tone. Audiat, idi voti phoebus succeder partem. Ment dedit, partem voliacers dispersit in auras. Which, as he added, is well rendered into English metre by my friend Bangar. A e half the prayer why, phoebus grace did find. The t'other half he whistled down the wind. Chapter 15 the march. The conflicting passions and exhausted feelings of Waverley had resigned him to late but sound repose. He was dreaming of Glenacoich, and had transferred to the halls of Ian Nan Chastel the festal train which so lately graced those of Holyrood. The pibroch too was distinctly heard. And this at least was no delusion, for the proud step of the chief piper, of the clan MacIver, was perambulating the court before the door of his chieftain's quarters, and as Mrs. Flockhart, apparently no friend to his minstrelsy, was pleased to observe, gang the very stain and lime was dingle why his screeching. Of course it soon became too powerful for Waverley's dream, with which it had at first rather harmonized. The sound of Callum's brogues in his apartment, for MacIver had again assigned Waverley to his care, was the next note of parting. Winna your honor bang up? Vich Ian Vore and Ta Prince are awa to the lang green glen ahint the clockin, that they see a, the king's park, and Moni ain'ts on his ain shanks the day that will be carried on ither folks ere night. The main body of the Highland army encamped, or rather bivouacked, in that part of the king's park which lies towards the village of Duddingston. Waverley sprung up, and, with Callum's assistance and instructions, adjusted his tartans in proper costume. Callum told him also, that his leather doorlock why, the lock on her was come fray dune, and she was awa again in the wane why, vich Ian vors wayless. By this periphrasis Waverley readily apprehended his portmanteau was intended. He thought upon the mysterious packet of the maid of the cavern, which seemed always to escape him when within his very grasp. But this was no time for indulgence of curiosity, and having declined Mrs. Flockhart's compliment of a morning, i.e. a matutinal dram, being probably the only man in the Chevalier's army by whom such a courtesy would have been rejected, he made his adieus and departed with Callum. Callum, said he, as they proceeded down a dirty close to gain the southern skirts of the cannon gate, what shall I do for a horse? Ta deal a mon think o, oh, said Callum. Vich Ian Vor's marching on foot at the head o oh, his kin, not to say ta prince, what is the like, why, his target on his shoulder, a mon Ian be neighbor like. And so I will, Callum, give me my target, so, there we are fixed. How does it look? Like the bra, Highlander tats painted on the board afore the Mickle Change House they see a lucky middlemasses, answered Callum. Meaning, I must observe, a high compliment, for in his opinion lucky middlemasses sign was an exquisite specimen of art. Waverley, however, not feeling the full force of this polite simile, asked him no further questions. Upon extricating themselves from the mean and dirty suburbs of the metropolis, and emerging into the open air, Waverley felt a renewal of both health and spirits, and turned his recollection with firmness upon the events of the preceding evening. And with hope and resolution towards those of the approaching day. When he had surmounted a small craggy eminence called Stee. Leonard's Hill, the King's Park, or the hollow between the mountain of Arthur's Seat and the rising grounds on which the southern part of Edinburgh is now built lay beneath him, and displayed a singular and animating prospect. It was occupied by the army of the Highlanders, now in the act of preparing for their march. Waverley had already seen something of the kind at the hunting match which he attended with Fergus MacIver. But this was on a scale of much greater magnitude, and incomparably deeper interest. The rocks, which formed the background of the scene, and the very sky itself, rang with the clang of the bagpipers, summoning forth, each with his appropriate pibroch, his chieftain and clan. The mountaineers, rousing themselves from their couch under the canopy of heaven with the hum and bustle of a confused and irregular multitude, like bees alarmed and arming in their hives, seemed to possess all the pliability of movement fitted to execute military maneuvers. 
Their motions appeared spontaneous and confused, but the result was order and regularity, so that a general must have praised the conclusion, though a martinet might have ridiculed the method by which it was attained. The sort of complicated medley created by the hasty arrangements of the various clans under their respective banners, for the purpose of getting into the order of march, was in itself a gay and lively spectacle. They had no tents to strike having generally, and by choice, slept upon the open field, although the autumn was now waning and the nights began to be frosty. For a little space, while they were getting into order, there was exhibited a changing, fluctuating, and confused appearance of waving tartans and floating plumes, and of banners displaying the proud gathering word of Clan Ronald. Ganayan Koheriga, Gainsay Who Dares, Loxloy, the watchword of the Macfarlands. Fourth, Fortune, and Fill the Fetters, the motto of the Marquis of Tullibardine, Bydand, that of Lord Louis Gordon, and the appropriate signal words and emblems of many other chieftains and clans. At length the mixed and wavering multitude arranged themselves into a narrow and dusky column of great length, stretching through the whole extent of the valley. In the front of the column the standard of the Chevalier was displayed, bearing a red cross upon a white ground, with the motto Tandem Triumphans. The few cavalry, being chiefly lowland gentry, with their domestic servants and retainers, formed the advanced guard of the army. And their standards, of which they had rather too many in respect of their numbers, were seen waving upon the extreme verge of the horizon. Many horsemen of this body, among whom Waverley accidentally remarked Balmawapple and his lieutenant, Jinker, which last, however, had been reduced, with several others, by the advice of the Baron of Bradwardine. To the situation of what he called reformed officers, or reformadas, added to the liveliness, though by no means to the regularity, of the scene, by galloping their horses as fast forward as the press would permit to join their proper station in the van. The fascinations of the Circes of the High Street, and the potations of strength with which they had been drenched overnight, had probably detained these heroes within the walls of Edinburgh somewhat later than was consistent with their morning duty. Of such loiterers, the prudent took the longer and circuitous, but more open, route to attain their place in the march, by keeping at some distance from the infantry, and making their way through the enclosures to the right at the expense of leaping over or pulling down the dry stone fences. The irregular appearance and vanishing of these small parties of horsemen, as well as the confusion occasioned by those who endeavoured, though generally without effect, to press to the front through the crowd of Highlanders, maugre their curses. Oaths, and opposition, added to the picturesque wildness what it took from the military regularity of the scene. While Waverley gazed upon this remarkable spectacle, rendered yet more impressive by the occasional discharge of cannon shot from the castle at the Highland Guards as they were withdrawn from its vicinity to join their main body, Callum. With his usual freedom of interference, reminded him that Vich Ian Vor's folk were nearly at the head of the column of march which was still distant, and that, they would gang very fast after the cannon fired. Thus admonished, Waverley walked briskly forward, yet often casting a glance upon the darksome clouds of warriors who were collected before and beneath him. A nearer view, indeed, rather diminished the effect impressed on the mind by the more distant appearance of the army. The leading men of each clan were well armed with broadsword, target, and fusee, to which all added the dirk, and most the steel pistol. But these consisted of gentlemen, that is, relations of the chief, however distant, and who had an immediate title to his countenance and protection. Finer and hardier men could not have been selected out of any army in Christendom. While the free and independent habits which each possessed, and which each was yet so well taught to subject to the command of his chief, and the peculiar mode of discipline adopted in Highland warfare, rendered them equally formidable by their individual courage and high spirit, and from their rational conviction of the necessity of acting in unison, and of giving their national mode of attack the fullest opportunity of success. But, in a lower rank to these, there were found individuals of an inferior description, the common peasantry of the highland country, who, although they did not allow themselves to be so called, and claimed often, with apparent truth, to be of more ancient descent than the masters whom they served, bore, nevertheless, the livery of extreme penury, being indifferently accoutred, and worse armed, half-naked, stinted in growth, and miserable in aspect. Each important clan had some of those helots attached to them, thus, the Macowls, though tracing their descent from Comhow, the father of Finn or Fingal, were a sort of Gibeonites or hereditary servants to the Stuarts of Appen. 
The Macbeths, descended from the unhappy monarch of that name, were subjects to the Mores and Clan Donachy, or Robertsons of Athole. And many other examples might be given, were it not for the risk of hurting any pride of clanship which may yet be left, and thereby drawing a highland tempest into the shop of my publisher. Now these same helots, though forced into the field by the arbitrary authority of the chieftains under whom they hewed wood and drew water, were in general very sparingly fed, ill-dressed, and worse armed. The latter circumstance was indeed owing chiefly to the General Disarming Act, which had been carried into effect ostensibly through the whole highlands. Although most of the chieftains contrived to elude its influence by retaining the weapons of their own immediate clansmen, and delivering up those of less value, which they collected from these inferior satellites. It followed, as a matter of course, that, as we have already hinted, many of these poor fellows were brought to the field in a very wretched condition. From this it happened that, in bodies, the van of which were admirably well armed in their own fashion, the rear resembled actual banditti. Here was a pole axe, there a sword without a scabbard. Here a gun without a lock, there a scythe set straight upon a pole, and some had only their dirks, and bludgeons, or stakes pulled out of hedges. The grim, uncombed, and wild appearance of these men, most of whom gazed with all the admiration of ignorance upon the most ordinary productions of domestic art, created surprise in the lowlands, but it also created terror. So little was the condition of the highlands known at that late period that the character and appearance of their population, while thus sallying forth as military adventurers, conveyed to the South Country lowlanders as much surprise as if an invasion of African Negroes or Eskimo Indians had issued forth from the northern mountains of their own native country. It cannot therefore be wondered if Waverley, who had hitherto judged of the Highlanders generally from the samples which the policy of Fergus had from time to time exhibited, should have felt damped and astonished at the daring attempt of a body not then exceeding four thousand men, and of whom not above half the number, at the utmost, were armed, to change the fate and alter the dynasty of the British kingdoms. As he moved along the column, which still remained stationary, an iron gun, the only piece of artillery possessed by the army which meditated so important a revolution, was fired as the signal of march. The chevalier had expressed a wish to leave this useless piece of ordnance behind him. But, to his surprise, the Highland chiefs interposed to solicit that it might accompany their march, pleading the prejudices of their followers, little accustomed to artillery, attached a degree of absurd importance to this field piece and expected it would contribute essentially to a victory which they could only owe to their own muskets and broadswords. Two or three French artillerymen were therefore appointed to the management of this military engine, which was drawn along by a string of highland ponies, and was, after all, only used for the purpose of firing signals. No sooner was its voice heard upon the present occasion than the whole line was in motion. A wild cry of joy from the advancing battalions rent the air and was then lost in the shrill clangor of the bagpipes, as the sound of these, in their turn, was partially drowned by the heavy tread of so many men put at once into motion. The banners glittered and shook as they moved forward, and the horse hastened to occupy their station as the advance guard, and to push on reconnoitering parties to ascertain and report the motions of the enemy. They vanished from Waverley's eye as they wheeled round the base of Arthur's seat, under the remarkable ridge of basaltic rocks which fronts the little lake of Duddingston. The infantry followed in the same direction, regulating their pace by another body which occupied a road more to the southward. It cost Edward some exertion of activity to attain the place which Fergus's followers occupied in the line of march. Chapter 16 An incident gives rise to unavailing reflections. When Waverley reached that part of the column which was filled by the clan of Mac Ivor, they halted, formed, and received him with a triumphant flourish upon the bagpipes and a loud shout of the men. Most of whom knew him personally, and were delighted to see him in the dress of their country and of their sept. You shout, said a highlander of a neighboring clan to Evan D.H.U., as if the chieftain were just come to your head. Mar e Bran is e a brat hair, if it be not Bran, it is Bran's brother, was the proverbial reply of Macambich. Bran, the well-known dog of Fingal, is often the theme of Highland proverb as well as song. Oh, then, it is the handsome Sassanac Duin Wassel that is to be married to Lady Flora? That may be, or it may not be. And it is neither your matter nor mine, Gregor. Fergus advanced to embrace the volunteer, 
and afford him a warm and hearty welcome. But he thought it necessary to apologize for the diminished numbers of his battalion, which did not exceed three hundred men, by observing he had sent a good many out upon parties. The real fact, however, was, that the defection of Donald Bean Lean had deprived him of at least thirty hardy fellows, whose services he had fully reckoned upon. And that many of his occasional adherents had been recalled by their several chiefs to the standards to which they most properly owed their allegiance. The rival chief of the Great Northern Branch, also, of his own clan had mustered his people, although he had not yet declared either for the government or for the chevalier. And by his intrigues had in some degree diminished the force with which Fergus took the field. To make amends for these disappointments, it was universally admitted that the followers of Vich Ian Vor, in point of appearance, equipment, arms, and dexterity in using them, equaled the most choice troops which followed the standard of Charles Edward. Old Ballancurric acted as his major, and, with the other officers who had known Waverley when at Glenacoich, gave our hero a cordial reception, as the sharer of their future dangers and expected honors. The route pursued by the Highland army, after leaving the village of Duddingston, was for some time the common post road betwixt Edinburgh and Haddington, until they crossed the Esk at Musselburgh, when, instead of keeping the low grounds towards the sea, they turned more inland and occupied the brow of the eminence called Carberry Hill. A place already distinguished in Scottish history as the spot where the lovely Mary surrendered herself to her insurgent subjects. This direction was chosen because the Chevalier had received notice that the army of the government, arriving by sea from Aberdeen, had landed at Dunbar, and quartered the night before to the west of Haddington. With the intention of falling down towards the seaside, and approaching Edinburgh by the lower coast road. By keeping the height, which overhung that road in many places, it was hoped the Highlanders might find an opportunity of attacking them to advantage. The army therefore halted upon the ridge of Carberry Hill, both to refresh the soldiers and as a central situation from which their march could be directed to any point that the motions of the enemy might render most advisable. While they remained in this position a messenger arrived in haste to desire MacIver to come to the prince, adding that their advanced post had had a skirmish with some of the enemy's cavalry, and that the Baron of Bradwardine had sent in a few prisoners. Waverley walked forward out of the line to satisfy his curiosity, and soon observed five or six of the troopers who, covered with dust, had galloped in to announce that the enemy were in full march westward along the coast. Passing still a little farther on, he was struck with a groan which issued from a hovel. He approached the spot, and heard a voice in the provincial English of his native county, which endeavoured, though frequently interrupted by pain, to repeat the Lord's Prayer. The voice of distress always found a ready answer in our hero's bosom. He entered the hovel, which seemed to be intended for what is called, in the pastoral counties of Scotland, a smearing house, and in its obscurity Edward could only at first discern a sort of red bundle. For those who had stripped the wounded man of his arms and part of his clothes had left him the dragoon cloak in which he was enveloped. For the love of God, said the wounded man, as he heard Waverley's step, give me a single drop of water. You shall have it, answered Waverley, at the same time raising him in his arms, bearing him to the door of the hut, and giving him some drink from his flask. I should know that voice, said the man. But looking on Waverley's dress with a bewildered look, no, this is not the young squire. This was the common phrase by which Edward was distinguished on the estate of Waverley honour and the sound now thrilled to his heart with the thousand recollections which the well-known accents of his native country had already contributed to awaken. Houghton, he said, gazing on the ghastly features which death was fast disfiguring, can this be you? I never thought to hear an English voice again, said the wounded man. They left me to live or die here as I could, when they found I would say nothing about the strength of the regiment. But, oh squire! How could you stay from us so long? and let us be tempted by that fiend of the pit, Ruffin. We should have followed you through flood and fire, to be sure. Ruffin. I assure you, Houghton, you have been vilely imposed upon. I often thought so, said Houghton, though they showed us your very seal. And so Tim's was shot and I was reduced to the ranks. Do not exhaust your strength in speaking, said Edward, I will get you a surgeon presently. He saw MacIver approaching, who was now returning from headquarters, where he had attended a council of war, and hastened to meet him. Brave news, shouted the chief, 
we shall be at it in less than two hours. The prince has put himself at the head of the advance, and, as he drew his sword, called out, My friends, I have thrown away the scabbard. Come, Waverley, we move instantly. A moment, a moment, this poor prisoner is dying. Where shall I find a surgeon? Why, where should you? We have none, you know, but two or three French fellows, who, I believe, are little better than Garçon's apothecaires. But the man will bleed to death. Poor fellow! said Fergus, in a momentary fit of compassion, then instantly added, but it will be a thousand men's fate before night, so come along. I cannot, I tell you he is a son of a tenant of my uncle's. Oh, if he's a follower of yours he must be looked to, I'll send Callum to you, but Dial. Seed Milia Molaghart, continued the impatient chieftain, what made an old soldier like Bradwardine send dying men here to cumber us? Callum came with his usual alertness, and, indeed, Waverley rather gained than lost in the opinion of the Highlanders by his anxiety about the wounded man. They would not have understood the general philanthropy which rendered it almost impossible for Waverley to have passed any person in such distress. But, as apprehending that the sufferer was one of his following they unanimously allowed that Waverley's conduct was that of a kind and considerate chieftain, who merited the attachment of his people. In about a quarter of an hour poor Humphrey breathed his last, praying his young master, when he returned to Waverley Honor, to be kind to old Job Houghton and his dame. And conjuring him not to fight with these wild petticoat men against old England. When his last breath was drawn, Waverley, who had beheld with sincere sorrow, and no slight tinge of remorse, the final agonies of mortality, now witnessed for the first time, commanded Callum to remove the body into the hut. This the young Highlander performed, not without examining the pockets of the defunct, which, however, he remarked had been pretty well sponged. He took the cloak, however, and proceeding with the provident caution of a spaniel hiding a bone, concealed it among some furs and carefully marked the spot, observing that, if he chanced to return that way, it would be an excellent roclay for his old mother Elspat. It was by a considerable exertion that they regained their place in the marching column, which was now moving rapidly forward to occupy the high grounds above the village of Tranent, between which and the sea lay the purposed march of the opposite army. This melancholy interview with his late sergeant forced many unavailing and painful reflections upon Waverley's mind. It was clear from the confession of the man that Colonel Gardiner's proceedings had been strictly warranted, and even rendered indispensable, by the steps taken in Edward's name to induce the soldiers of his troop to mutiny. The circumstance of the seal he now, for the first time, recollected, and that he had lost it in the cavern of the robber, being lean. That the artful villain had secured it, and used it as the means of carrying on an intrigue in the regiment for his own purposes, was sufficiently evident. And Edward had now little doubt that in the packet placed in his portmanteau by his daughter he should find farther light upon his proceedings. In the meanwhile the repeated expostulation of Houghton, Squire, why did you leave us? rung like a knell in his ears. Yes, he said, I have indeed acted towards you with thoughtless cruelty. I brought you from your paternal fields, and the protection of a generous and kind landlord, and when I had subjected you to all the rigor of military discipline, I shunned to bear my own share of the burden. And wandered from the duties I had undertaken, leaving alike those whom it was my business to protect, and my own reputation, to suffer under the artifices of villainy. Oh, indolence and indecision of mind, if not in yourselves vices, to how much exquisite misery and mischief do you frequently prepare the way? Chapter 17 The Eve of Battle Although the Highlanders marched on very fast, the sun was declining when they arrived upon the brow of those high grounds which command an open and extensive plain stretching northward to the sea, on which are situated. But at a considerable distance from each other, the small villages of Seton and Cockenzie, and the larger one of Preston. One of the low coast roads to Edinburgh passed through this plain, issuing upon it from the enclosures of Seton House, and at the town or village of Preston again entering the denies of an enclosed country. By this way the English general had chosen to approach the metropolis, both as most commodious for his cavalry. And being probably of opinion that by doing so he would meet in front with the Highlanders advancing from Edinburgh in the opposite direction. In this he was mistaken for the sound judgment of the chevalier, or of those to whose advice he listened, left the direct passage free, 
but occupied the strong ground by which it was overlooked and commanded. When the Highlanders reached the heights above the plain described, they were immediately formed in array of battle along the brow of the hill. Almost at the same instant the van of the English appeared issuing from among the trees and enclosures of Seton, with the purpose of occupying the level plain between the high ground and the sea. The space which divided the armies being only about half a mile in breadth. Waverley could plainly see the squadrons of dragoons issue, one after another, from the defile, with their vedettes in front, and form upon the plain, with their front opposed to that of the prince's army. They were followed by a train of field pieces, which, when they reached the flank of the dragoons, were also brought into line and pointed against the heights. The march was continued by three or four regiments of infantry marching in open column, their fixed bayonets showing like successive hedges of steel, and their arms glancing like lightning, as, at a signal given, they also at once wheeled up. And were placed in direct opposition to the Highlanders. A second train of artillery, with another regiment of horse, closed the long march, and formed on the left flank of the infantry, the whole line facing southward. While the English army went through these evolutions, the Highlanders showed equal promptitude and zeal for battle. As fast as the clans came upon the ridge which fronted their enemy, they were formed into line, so that both armies got into complete order of battle at the same moment. When this was accomplished, the Highlanders set up a tremendous yell, which was re-echoed by the heights behind them. The regulars, who were in high spirits, returned a loud shout of defiance, and fired one or two of their cannon upon an advanced post of the Highlanders. The latter displayed great earnestness to proceed instantly to the attack, Evan Dhu urging to Fergus, by way of argument, that the city of Roy was tottering like an egg upon a staff, and that they had at the vantage of the onset. For even a haggis, God bless her, could charge downhill. But the ground through which the mountaineers must have descended, although not of great extent, was impracticable in its character, being not only marshy but intersected with walls of dry stone. And traversed in its whole length by a very broad and deep ditch, circumstances which must have given the musketry of the regulars dreadful advantages before the mountaineers could have used their swords, on which they were taught to rely. The authority of the commanders was therefore interposed to curb the impetuosity of the highlanders, and only a few marksmen were sent down the descent to skirmish with the enemy's advanced posts and to reconnoiter the ground. Here, then, was a military spectacle of no ordinary interest or usual occurrence. The two armies, so different in aspect and discipline, yet each admirably trained in its own peculiar mode of war, upon whose conflict the temporary fate at least of Scotland appeared to depend, now faced each other like two gladiators in the arena. Each meditating upon the mode of attacking their enemy. The leading officers and the general staff of each army could be distinguished in front of their lines, busied with spyglasses to watch each other's motions and occupied in dispatching the orders and receiving the intelligence conveyed by the aides-de-camp and orderly men, who gave life to the scene by galloping along in different directions. As if the fate of the day depended upon the speed of their horses. The space between the armies was at times occupied by the partial and irregular contest of individual sharpshooters, and a hat or bonnet was occasionally seen to fall, as a wounded man was borne off by his comrades. These, however, were but trifling skirmishes, for it suited the views of neither party to advance in that direction. From the neighboring hamlets the peasantry cautiously showed themselves, as if watching the issue of the expected engagement. And at no great distance in the bay were two square-rigged vessels, bearing the English flag, whose tops and yards were crowded with less timid spectators. When this awful pause had lasted for a short time, Fergus, with another chieftain, received orders to detach their clans towards the village of Preston, in order to threaten the right flank of Cope's army and compel him to a change of position. To enable him to execute these orders, the chief of Glenacoich occupied the churchyard of Tranent, a commanding situation, and a convenient place, as Evan Dhu remarked, for any gentleman who might have the misfortune to be killed. And chance to be curious about Christian burial. To check or dislodge this party, the English general detached two guns, escorted by a strong party of cavalry. They approached so near that Waverley could plainly recognize the standard of the troop he had formerly commanded, and hear the trumpets and kettle drums sound the signal of advance which he had so often obeyed. He could hear, too, the well-known word given in the English dialect by the equally well-distinguished voice of the commanding officer, 
for whom he had once felt so much respect. It was at that instant, that, looking around him, he saw the wild dress and appearance of his highland associates, heard their whispers in an uncouth and unknown language, looked upon his own dress, so unlike that which he had worn from his infancy, and wished to awake from what seemed at the moment a dream, strange, horrible, and unnatural. Good God, he muttered, am I then a traitor to my country, a renegade to my standard, and a foe, as that poor dying wretch expressed himself, to my native England. Ere he could digest or smother the recollection, the tall military form of his late commander came full in view, for the purpose of reconnoitering. I can hit him now, said Callum, cautiously raising his fusee over the wall under which he lay couched, at scarce sixty yards distance. Edward felt as if he was about to see a parricide committed in his presence. For the venerable grey hair and striking countenance of the veteran recalled the almost paternal respect with which his officers universally regarded him. But ere he could say, hold, an aged Highlander who lay beside Callum Begg stopped his arm. Spare your shot, said the seer, his hour is not yet come. But let him beware of tomorrow, I see his winding sheet high upon his breast. Callum, flint to other considerations, was penetrable to superstition. He turned pale at the words of the Tyshatter, and recovered his peace. Colonel Gardiner, unconscious of the danger he had escaped, turned his horse round and rode slowly back to the front of his regiment. By this time the regular army had assumed a new line, with one flank inclined towards the sea and the other resting upon the village of Preston. And, as similar difficulties occurred in attacking their new position, Fergus and the rest of the detachment were recalled to their former post. This alteration created the necessity of a corresponding change in General Cope's army, which was again brought into a line parallel with that of the Highlanders. In these maneuvers on both sides the daylight was nearly consumed, and both armies prepared to rest upon their arms for the night in the lines which they respectively occupied. There will be nothing done tonight, said Fergus to his friend Waverley, ere we wrap ourselves in our plaids, let us go see what the baron is doing in the rear of the line. When they approached his post, they found the good old careful officer, after having sent out his night patrols and posted his sentinels, engaged in reading the evening service of the Episcopal Church to the remainder of his troop. His voice was loud and sonorous, and though his spectacles upon his nose, and the appearance of Saunders Saunderson, in military array, performing the functions of clerk, had something ludicrous, yet the circumstances of danger in which they stood. The military costume of the audience, and the appearance of their horses saddled and piqued behind them, gave an impressive and solemn effect to the office of devotion. I have confessed today, ere you were awake, whispered Fergus to Waverley, yet I am not so strict a Catholic as to refuse to join in this good man's prayers. Edward assented, and they remained till the baron had concluded the service. As he shut the book, now, lads, said he, have at them in the morning with heavy hands and light consciences. He then kindly greeted Mac Ivor and Waverley, who requested to know his opinion of their situation. Why, you know Tacitus Seth, in Rebus Bellicis Maxime Dominaler Fortuna, which is equiponderate with our vernacular adage, luck can maste in the Melly. But credit me, gentlemen, yon man is not a deacon, oh, his craft. He damps the spirits of the poor lads he commands by keeping them on the defensive, Wilk of itself implies inferiority or fear. Now will they lie on their arms yonder as anxious and as ill at ease as a toad under a harrow, while our men will be quite fresh and blithe for action in the morning. Well, good night. One thing troubles me, but if tomorrow goes well off, I will consult you about it, Glenacoich. I could almost apply to Mr. Bradwardine the character which Henry gives of Fluellen, said Waverley, as his friend and he walked towards their bivouac. Though it appears a little out of fashion. There is much care and valor in this Scotchman. He has seen much service, answered Fergus, and one is sometimes astonished to find how much nonsense and reason are mingled in his composition. I wonder what can be troubling his mind, probably something about Rose. Hark! The English are setting their watch. The roll of the drum and shrill accompaniment of the fife swelled up the hill, died away, resumed its thunder, and was at length hushed. The trumpets and kettle drums of the cavalry were next heard to perform the beautiful and wild point of war appropriated as a signal for that piece of nocturnal duty, and then finally sunk upon the wind with a shrill and mournful cadence. 
The friends, who had now reached their post, stood and looked round them ere they lay down to rest. The western sky twinkled with stars, but a frost mist, rising from the ocean, covered the eastern horizon, and rolled in white wreaths along the plain where the adverse army lay couched upon their arms. Their advanced posts were pushed as far as the side of the great ditch at the bottom of the descent, and had kindled large fires at different intervals. Gleaming with obscure and hazy luster through the heavy fog which encircled them with a doubtful halo. The highlanders, thick as leaves in Vallombrosa, lay stretched upon the ridge of the hill, buried, excepting their sentinels, in the most profound repose. How many of these brave fellows will sleep more soundly before tomorrow night, Fergus? said Waverley, with an involuntary sigh. You must not think of that, answered Fergus, whose ideas were entirely military. You must only think of your sword, and by whom it was given. All other reflections are now too late. With the opiate contained in this undeniable remark Edward endeavoured to lull the tumult of his conflicting feelings. The chieftain and he, combining their plaids, made a comfortable and warm couch. Callum, sitting down at their head, for it was his duty to watch upon the immediate person of the chief, began a long mournful song in Gaelic, to a low and uniform tune, which, like the sound of the wind at a distance, soon lulled them to sleep. Chapter 18 The Conflict When Fergus MacIver and his friend had slept for a few hours, they were awakened and summoned to attend the prince. The distant village clock was heard to toll three as they hastened to the place where he lay. He was already surrounded by his principal officers and the chiefs of clans. A bundle of pea straw, which had been lately his couch, now served for his seat. Just as Fergus reached the circle, the consultation had broken up. Courage, my brave friends, said the chevalier, and each one put himself instantly at the head of his command. A faithful friend has offered to guide us by a practicable, though narrow and circuitous, route, which, sweeping to our right, traverses the broken ground and morass, and enables us to gain the firm and open plain upon which the enemy are lying. This difficulty surmounted, heaven and your good swords must do the rest. The proposal spread unanimous joy, and each leader hastened to get his men into order with as little noise as possible. The army, moving by its right from off the ground on which they had rested, soon entered the path through the morass, conducting their march with astonishing silence and great rapidity. The mist had not risen to the higher grounds, so that for some time they had the advantage of starlight. But this was lost as the stars faded before approaching day, and the head of the marching column, continuing its descent, plunged as it were into the heavy ocean of fog, which rolled its white waves over the whole plain. And over the sea by which it was bounded. Some difficulties were now to be encountered, inseparable from darkness, a narrow, broken, and marshy path and the necessity of preserving union in the march. These, however, were less inconvenient to Highlanders, from their habits of life, than they would have been to any other troops, and they continued a steady and swift movement. As the clan of Ivor approached the firm ground, following the track of those who preceded them, the challenge of a patrol was heard through the mist, though they could not see the dragoon by whom it was made, who goes there. Hush! cried Fergus, hush! Let none answer, as he values his life, press forward, and they continued their march with silence and rapidity. The patrol fired his carabin upon the body, and the report was instantly followed by the clang of his horse's feet as he galloped off. Hylax and Limine Latrat, said the Baron of Bradwardine, who heard the shot, that loon will give the alarm. The clan of Fergus had now gained the firm plain, which had lately borne a large crop of corn. But the harvest was gathered in, and the expanse was unbroken by tree, bush, or interruption of any kind. The rest of the army were following fast, when they heard the drums of the enemy beat the general. Surprise, however, had made no part of their plan, so they were not disconcerted by this intimation that the foe was upon his guard and prepared to receive them. It only hastened their dispositions for the combat, which were very simple. The Highland army, which now occupied the eastern end of the wide plain, or stubble field, so often referred to, was drawn up in two lines, extending from the morass towards the sea. The first was destined to charge the enemy, the second to act as a reserve. The few horse, whom the prince headed in person, remained between the two lines. 
the adventurer had intimated a resolution to charge in person at the head of his first line. But his purpose was deprecated by all around him, and he was with difficulty induced to abandon it. Both lines were now moving forward, the first prepared for instant combat. The clans of which it was composed formed each a sort of separate phalanx, narrow in front, and in depth ten, twelve, or fifteen files, according to the strength of the following. The best armed and best born, for the words were synonymous, were placed in front of each of these irregular subdivisions. The others in the rear shouldered forward the front, and by their pressure added both physical impulse and additional ardor and confidence to those who were first to encounter the danger. Down with your plaid, Waverly, cried Fergus, throwing off his own, we'll win silks for our tartans before the sun is above the sea. The clansmen on every side stripped their plaids, prepared their arms, and there was an awful pause of about three minutes, during which the men, pulling off their bonnets, raised their faces to heaven and uttered a short prayer. Then pulled their bonnets over their brows and began to move forward, at first slowly. Waverly felt his heart at that moment throb as it would have burst from his bosom. It was not fear, it was not ardor, it was a compound of both, a new and deeply energetic impulse that with its first emotion chilled and astounded, then fevered and maddened his mind. The sounds around him combined to exalt his enthusiasm. The pipes played, and the clans rushed forward, each in its own dark column. As they advanced they mended their pace, and the muttering sounds of the men to each other began to swell into a wild cry. At this moment the sun, which was now risen above the horizon, dispelled the mist. The vapors rose like a curtain, and showed the two armies in the act of closing. The line of the regulars was formed directly fronting the attack of the Highlanders. It glittered with the appointments of a complete army, and was flanked by cavalry and artillery but the sight impressed no terror on the assailants. Forward, sons of Ivor, cried their chief, or the Camerons will draw the first blood. They rushed on with a tremendous yell. The rest is well known. The horse, who were commanded to charge the advancing Highlanders in the flank, received an irregular fire from their fusees as they ran on and, seized with a disgraceful panic, wavered, halted, disbanded, and galloped from the field. The artillery men, deserted by the cavalry, fled after discharging their pieces, and the Highlanders, who dropped their guns when fired and drew their broadswords, rushed with headlong fury against the infantry. It was at this moment of confusion and terror that Waverley remarked an English officer, apparently of high rank, standing, alone and unsupported, by a field piece, which, after the flight of the men by whom it was wrought. He had himself leveled and discharged against the clan of Mac Ivor, the nearest group of Highlanders within his aim. Struck with his tall, martial figure, and eager to save him from inevitable destruction, Waverley outstripped for an instant even the speediest of the warriors, and, reaching the spot first, called to him to surrender. The officer replied by a thrust with his sword, which Waverley received in his target, and in turning it aside the Englishman's weapon broke. At the same time the battle-axe of Dougald Mahoney was in the act of descending upon the officer's head. Waverley intercepted and prevented the blow, and the officer, perceiving further resistance unavailing, and struck with Edward's generous anxiety for his safety, resigned the fragment of his sword, and was committed by Waverley to Dugald. With strict charge to use him well, and not to pillage his person, promising him, at the same time, full indemnification for the spoil. On Edward's right the battle for a few minutes raged fierce and thick. The English infantry, trained in the wars in Flanders, stood their ground with great courage. But their extended files were pierced and broken in many places by the close masses of the clans. And in the personal struggle which ensued the nature of the Highlanders' weapons, and their extraordinary fierceness and activity, gave them a decided superiority over those who had been accustomed to trust much to their array and discipline. And felt that the one was broken and the other useless. Waverley, as he cast his eyes towards this scene of smoke and slaughter, observed Colonel Gardiner deserted by his own soldiers in spite of all his attempts to rally them. Yet spurring his horse through the field to take the command of a small body of infantry, who, with their backs arranged against the wall of his own park, for his house was close by the field of battle, continued a desperate and unavailing resistance. Waverley could perceive that he had already received many wounds, his clothes and saddle being marked with blood. To save this good and brave man became the instant object of his most anxious exertions. 
but he could only witness his fall. Ere Edward could make his way among the Highlanders, who, furious and eager for spoil, now thronged upon each other, he saw his former commander brought from his horse by the blow of a scythe, and beheld him receive, while on the ground. More wounds than would have let out twenty lives. When Waverley came up, however, perception had not entirely fled. The dying warrior seemed to recognize Edward, for he fixed his eye upon him with an upbraiding, yet sorrowful, look, and appeared to struggle, for utterance. But he felt that death was dealing closely with him, and resigning his purpose, and folding his hands as if in devotion, he gave up his soul to his creator. The look with which he regarded Waverley in his dying moments did not strike him so deeply at that crisis of hurry and confusion as when it recurred to his imagination at the distance of some time. Loud shouts of triumph now echoed over the whole field. The battle was fought and won, and the whole baggage, artillery, and military stores of the regular army remained in possession of the victors. Never was a victory more complete. Scarce any escaped from the battle, excepting the cavalry, who had left it at the very onset, and even these were broken into different parties and scattered all over the country. So far as our tale is concerned, we have only to relate the fate of Balmawapple, who, mounted on a horse as headstrong and stiff-necked as his rider, pursued the flight of the dragoons above four miles from the field of battle. When some dozen of the fugitives took heart of grace, turned round, and cleaving his skull with their broadswords, satisfied the world that the unfortunate gentleman had actually brains. The end of his life thus giving proof of a fact greatly doubted during its progress. His death was lamented by few. Most of those who knew him agreed in the pithy observation of Ensign Mackambich, that there, was Mare Tint, lost, at Sheriff Muir. His friend, Lieutenant Jinker, bent his eloquence only to exculpate his favorite mare from any share in contributing to the catastrophe. He had told the laird a thousand times, he said, that it was a burning shame to put a martingale upon the poor thing, when he would needs ride her why, a curb of half a yard lang. And that he could gnaw but bring himself, not to say her, to some mischief, by flinging her down, or otherwise, whereas, if he had had a wee bit rinnin ring on the snaffle, she wad ha reigned as cannily as a cadger's pownie. Such was the elegy of the Laird of Balmawapple. Chapter 19 An Unexpected Embarrassment When the battle was over, and all things coming into order, the Baron of Bradwardine, returning from the duty of the day, and having disposed those under his command in their proper stations, sought the chieftain of Glenacoich and his friend Edward Waverley. He found the former busied in determining disputes among his clansmen about points of precedence and deeds of valor, besides sundry high and doubtful questions concerning plunder. The most important of the last respected the property of a gold watch, which had once belonged to some unfortunate English officer. The party against whom judgment was awarded consoled himself by observing, she, that is, the watch, which he took for a living animal, died the very night which Ian Vor gave her to Murdoch. The machine, having, in fact, stopped for want of winding up. It was just when this important question was decided that the Baron of Bradwardine, with a careful and yet important expression of countenance, joined the two young men. He descended from his reeking charger, the care of which he recommended to one of his grooms. I seldom ban, sir, said he to the man. But if you play any of your hound's foot tricks, and leave queer barrack before he's sorted, to rin after Spilsey, deal be why, me if I do not give your Craig a thraw. He then stroked with great complacency the animal which had borne him through the fatigues of the day, and having taken a tender leave of him, will, my good young friends, a glorious and decisive victory, said he. But these loons of troopers fled our soon. I should have liked to have shown you the true points of the prelium equester, or equestrian combat, wilt their cowardice has postponed, and which I hold to be the pride and terror of warfare. Will, I have fought once more in this old quarrel though I admit I could not be so far ben as you lads, being that it was my point of duty to keep together our handful of horse. And no cavalier ought in any wise to begrudge honor that befalls his companions, even though they are ordered upon thrice his danger, Wilk, another time, by the blessing of God, may be his own case. But, Glenacoich, and you, Mr. Waverley, I pray ye to give me your best advice on a matter of mickle weight, and which deeply affects the honor of the house of Bradwardine. I crave your pardon, Ensign Mackambich, and yours, Inverafflin, and yours, Edrelshendrak, and yours, 
sir. The last person he addressed was Balankirik, who, remembering the death of his son, lowered on him with a look of savage defiance. The baron, quick as lightning at taking umbrage, had already bent his brow when Glenacoich dragged his major from the spot, and remonstrated with him, in the authoritative tone of a chieftain, on the madness of reviving a quarrel in such a moment. The ground is cumbered with carcasses, said the old mountaineer, turning sullenly away, one more would hardly have been kenned upon it, and if it wasna for your cell, vich e and vor, that one should be Bradwardine's or mine. The chief soothed while he hurried him away, and then returned to the baron. It is Balankirik, he said, in an under and confidential voice, father of the young man who fell eight years since in the unlucky affair at the mains. Ah! said the baron, instantly relaxing the doubtful sternness of his features, I can take Mikkel Frey a man to whom I have unhappily rendered sick a displeasure as that. You were right to apprise me, Glenacoich. He may look as black as midnight at Martinmas Air Cosmo Common Bradwardine shall say he does him rang. Ah! I have nay male lineage, and I should bear with one I have made childless, though you are aware the blood wit was made up to your eyes satisfaction by a Sithment, and that I have since expedited letters of slains. Weel, as I have said, I have no male issue, and yet it is needful that I maintain the honor of my house, and it is on that score I prayed ye for your peculiar and private attention. The two young men awaited to hear him, in anxious curiosity. I doubt na, lads, he proceeded, but your education has been sae seen to that ye understand the true nature of the feudal tenures? Fergus, afraid of an endless dissertation, answered, intimately, barren, and touched Waverley as a signal to express no ignorance. And ye are aware, I doubt not, that the holding of the barony of Bradwardine is of a nature alike honorable and peculiar, being Blanche, which Craig opines ought to be Ladinade Blancum, or rather Francum, a free holding, pro servicio detrahendi. Seu ex wendi, Caligas regis post battalion. Here Fergus turned his falcon eye upon Edward, with an almost imperceptible rise of his eyebrow, to which his shoulders corresponded in the same degree of elevation. Now, TWA points of dubitation occur to me upon this topic. First, whether this service, or feudal homage, be at any event due to the person of the prince, the words being, per expressum, Caligas Regis, the boots of the king himself, and I pray your opinion anent that particular before we proceed farther. Why, he is Prince Regent, answered MacIver, with laudable composure of countenance and in the court of France all the honours are rendered to the person of the regent which are due to that of the king. Besides, were I to pull off either of their boots, I would render that service to the young chevalier ten times more willingly than to his father. Aye, but I talk not of personal predilections. However, your authority is of great weight as to the usages of the court of France. And doubtless the prince, as alter ego, may have a right to claim the homagium of the great tenants of the crown since all faithful subjects are commanded, in the commission of regency, to respect him as the king's own person. Far, therefore, be it from me to diminish the luster of his authority by withholding this act of homage, so peculiarly calculated to give it splendor, for I question if the emperor of Germany hath his boots taken off by a free baron of the empire. But here leath the second difficulty, the prince wears no boots, but simply brogues and trues. This last dilemma had almost disturbed Fergus's gravity. Why, said he, you know, Baron, the proverb tells us, it's ill taking the breeks off a highland man, and the boots are here in the same predicament. The word Caligi, however, continued the Baron, though I admit that, by family tradition, and even in our ancient evidence, it is explained lie boots, means, in its primitive sense, rather sandals. And Caius Caesar, the nephew and successor of Caius Tiberius, received the agnomen of Caligula, a Caligula sign Caligis Levioribus, cabus adolescentur usus furat in exercitu germanici patri sway. And the Caligi were also proper to the monastic bodies, for we read in an ancient glossarium upon the rule of St. Benedict, in the abbey of St. Amund, that Caligi were tied with latchets. That will apply to the brogues, said Fergus. It will so, my dear Glenacoich, and the words are express. Caligi dicti sunt kia leganter, nam sochi non leganter, said tantum intermittunter, that is, Caligi are denominated from the ligatures wherewith they are bound. Whereas sochi, which may be analogous to our mules, whilk the English denominate slippers, are only slipped upon the feet. 
The words of the Charter are also alternative, exura scu detrahir. That is, to undo, as in the case of sandals or brogues, and to pull off, as we say vernacularly concerning boots. Yet I would we had more light, but I fear there is little chance of finding hereabout any erudite author de revestiaria. I should doubt it very much, said the chieftain, looking around on the straggling highlanders, who were returning loaded with spoils of the slain, though the residential vestiaria itself seems to be in some request at present. This remark coming within the baron's idea of jocularity, he honored it with a smile, but immediately resumed what to him appeared very serious business. Bailey Macweeble indeed holds an opinion that this honorary service is due, from its very nature, S.I. Peditor Tantum, only if His Royal Highness shall require of the great tenant of the crown to perform that personal duty. And indeed he pointed out the case in Dalton's Doubts and Queries, Grip Pitt v. Spicer, anent the eviction of an estate ob non salutum canonum, that is, for non-payment of a foot duty of three peppercorns a year. Wilk were taxed to be worth seven-eighths of a penny Scots, in Wilk the defender was a soilzeed. But I deem it safest, why, your good favor, to place myself in the way of rendering the prince this service, and to proffer performance thereof. And I shall cause the bailey to attend with a schedule of a protest, Wilk he has here prepared, taking out a paper, intimating that if it shall be His Royal Highness's pleasure to accept of other assistance at pulling off his caligi, whether the same shall be rendered boots or brogues, save that of the said Baron of Bradradine, who is in presence ready and willing to perform the same, it shall in no wise impinge upon or prejudice the right of the said Cosmo Common Bradradine to perform the said service in future. Nor shall it give any esquire, valet of the chamber, squire, or page, whose assistance it may please His Royal Highness to employ, any right, title, or ground for evicting from the said Cosmo Common Bradradine the estate and barony of Bradradine. And others held as aforesaid, by the due and faithful performance thereof. Fergus highly applauded this arrangement, and the baron took a friendly leave of them, with a smile of contented importance upon his visage. Long live our dear friend the baron, exclaimed the chief, as soon as he was out of hearing, for the most absurd original that exists north of the Tweed. I wish to heaven I had recommended him to attend the circle this evening with a boot catch under his arm. I think he might have adopted the suggestion if it had been made with suitable gravity. And how can you take pleasure in making a man of his worth so ridiculous? Begging pardon, my dear Waverley, you are as ridiculous as he. Why, do you not see that the man's whole mind is wrapped up in this ceremony? He has heard and thought of it since infancy as the most august privilege and ceremony in the world and I doubt not but the expected pleasure of performing it was a principal motive with him for taking up arms. Depend upon it, had I endeavored to divert him from exposing himself he would have treated me as an ignorant, conceited coxcomb, or perhaps might have taken a fancy to cut my throat. A pleasure which he once proposed to himself upon some point of etiquette not half so important, in his eyes, as this matter of boots or brogues, or whatever the caligi shall finally be pronounced by the learned. But I must go to headquarters, to prepare the prince for this extraordinary scene. My information will be well taken, for it will give him a hearty laugh at present, and put him on his guard against laughing when it might be very mal a propos. So, au revoir, my dear Waverley. Chapter 20 The English Prisoner The first occupation of Waverley, after he departed from the chieftain, was to go in quest of the officer whose life he had saved. He was guarded, along with his companions in misfortune, who were very numerous, in a gentleman's house near the field of battle. On entering the room where they stood crowded together, Waverley easily recognized the object of his visit, not only by the peculiar dignity of his appearance, but by the appendage of Dougald Mahoney, with his battle-axe, who had stuck to him from the moment of his captivity as if he had been skewered to his side. This close attendance was perhaps for the purpose of securing his promised reward from Edward, but it also operated to save the English gentleman from being plundered in the scene of general confusion. For Dougald sagaciously argued that the amount of the salvage which he might be allowed would be regulated by the state of the prisoner when he should deliver him over to Waverley. He hastened to assure Waverley, therefore, with more words than he usually employed, that he had keep it ta city a Roy Hale. And that he wasna a plaque the war since the fairy moment when his honor forbade her to gie him a bit clamwit why, her lahabarax. Waverley assured Dougald of a liberal recompense, 
and, approaching the English officer, expressed his anxiety to do anything which might contribute to his convenience under his present unpleasant circumstances. I am not so inexperienced a soldier, sir, answered the Englishman, as to complain of the fortune of war. I am only grieved to see those scenes acted in our own island which I have often witnessed elsewhere with comparative indifference. Another such day as this, said Waverley, and I trust the cause of your regrets will be removed, and all will again return to peace and order. The officer smiled and shook his head. I must not forget my situation so far as to attempt a formal confutation of that opinion, but, notwithstanding your success and the valor which achieved it, you have undertaken a task to which your strength appears wholly inadequate. At this moment Fergus pushed into the press. Come, Edward, come along, the prince has gone to Pinky House for the night, and we must follow or lose the whole ceremony of the Caligi. Your friend, the baron, has been guilty of a great piece of cruelty. He has insisted upon dragging Bailey Macweeble out to the field of battle. Now, you must know, the Bailey's greatest horror is an armed Highlander or a loaded gun. And there he stands, listening to the Baron's instructions concerning the protest, ducking his head like a seagull at the report of every gun and pistol that our idle boys are firing upon the fields and undergoing, by way of penance. At every symptom of flinching a severe rebuke from his patron, who would not admit the discharge of a whole battery of cannon, within point-blank distance, as an apology for neglecting a discourse in which the honor of his family is interested. But how has Mr. Bradwardine got him to venture so far, said Edward? Why, he had come as far as Musselburgh, I fancy, in hopes of making some of our wills. And the peremptory commands of the baron dragged him forward to Preston after the battle was over. He complains of one or two of our ragamuffins having put him in peril of his life by presenting their pieces at him. But as they limited his ransom to an English penny, I don't think we need trouble the provost marshal upon that subject. So come along, Waverley. Waverley, said the English officer, with great emotion. The nephew of Sir Everard Waverley, of, Shire? The same, sir, replied our hero, somewhat surprised at the tone in which he was addressed. I am at once happy and grieved, said the prisoner, to have met with you. I am ignorant, sir, answered Waverley, how I have deserved so much interest. Did your uncle never mention a friend called Talbot? I have heard him talk with great regard of such a person, replied Edward. A colonel, I believe, in the army, and the husband of Lady Emily Blandeville, but I thought Colonel Talbot had been abroad. I am just returned, answered the officer. And being in Scotland, thought it my duty to act where my services promised to be useful. Yes, Mr. Waverley, I am that Colonel Talbot, the husband of the lady you have named. And I am proud to acknowledge that I owe alike my professional rank and my domestic happiness to your generous and noble-minded relative. Good God! That I should find his nephew in such a dress, and engaged in such a cause. Sir, said Fergus, haughtily, the dress and cause are those of men of birth and honor. My situation forbids me to dispute your assertion, said Colonel Talbot. Otherwise it were no difficult matter to show that neither courage nor pride of lineage can gild a bad cause. But, with Mr. Waverley's permission and yours, sir, if yours also must be asked, I would willingly speak a few words with him on affairs connected with his own family. Mr. Waverley, sir, regulates his own motions. You will follow me, I suppose, to Pinky said Fergus, turning to Edward, when you have finished your discourse with this new acquaintance? So saying, the chief of Glenacoich adjusted his plaid with rather more than his usual air of haughty assumption and left the apartment. The interest of Waverley readily procured for Colonel Talbot the freedom of adjourning to a large garden belonging to his place of confinement. They walked a few paces in silence, Colonel Talbot apparently studying how to open what he had to say. At length he addressed Edward. Mr. Waverley, you have this day saved my life, and yet I would to God that I had lost it, ere I had found you wearing the uniform and cockade of these men. I forgive your reproach, Colonel Talbot. It is well meant, and your education and prejudices render it natural. But there is nothing extraordinary in finding a man whose honor has been publicly and unjustly assailed in the situation which promised most fair to afford him satisfaction on his calumniators. I should rather say, 
in the situation most likely to confirm the reports which they have circulated, said Colonel Talbot, by following the very line of conduct ascribed to you. Are you aware, Mr. Waverley, of the infinite distress, and even danger, which your present conduct has occasioned to your nearest relatives? Danger. Yes, sir, danger. When I left England your uncle and father had been obliged to find bail to answer a charge of treason, to which they were only admitted by the exertion of the most powerful interest. I came down to Scotland with the sole purpose of rescuing you from the gulf into which you have precipitated yourself. Nor can I estimate the consequences to your family of your having openly joined the rebellion, since the very suspicion of your intention was so perilous to them. Most deeply do I regret that I did not meet you before this last and fatal error. I am really ignorant, said Waverley, in a tone of reserve, why Colonel Talbot should have taken so much trouble on my account. Mr. Waverley, answered Talbot, I am dull at apprehending irony. And therefore I shall answer your words according to their plain meaning. I am indebted to your uncle for benefits greater than those which a son owes to a father. I acknowledge to him the duty of a son. And as I know there is no manner in which I can requite his kindness so well as by serving you, I will serve you, if possible, whether you will permit me or no. The personal obligation which you have this day laid me under, although, in common estimation, as great as one human being can bestow on another, adds nothing to my zeal on your behalf. Nor can that zeal be abetted by any coolness with which you may please to receive it. Your intentions may be kind, sir, said Waverley, drilly but your language is harsh, or at least peremptory. On my return to England, continued Colonel Talbot, after long absence, I found your uncle, Sir Everard Waverley, in the custody of a king's messenger, in consequence of the suspicion brought upon him by your conduct. He is my oldest friend, how often shall I repeat it, my best benefactor. He sacrificed his own views of happiness to mine, he never uttered a word, he never harbored a thought, that benevolence itself might not have thought or spoken. I found this man in confinement, rendered harsher to him by his habits of life, his natural dignity of feeling, and, forgive me, Mr. Waverley, by the cause through which this calamity had come upon him. I cannot disguise from you my feelings upon this occasion, they were most painfully unfavorable to you. Having by my family interest, which you probably know is not inconsiderable, succeeded in obtaining Sir Everard's release, I set out for Scotland. I saw Colonel Gardiner, a man whose fate alone is sufficient to render this insurrection forever execrable. In the course of conversation with him I found that, from late circumstances, from a re-examination of the persons engaged in the mutiny, and from his original good opinion of your character, he was much softened towards you. And I doubted not that, if I could be so fortunate as to discover you, all might yet be well but this unnatural rebellion has ruined all. I have, for the first time in a long and active military life, seen Britons disgrace themselves by a panic flight, and that before a foe without either arms or discipline. And now I find the heir of my dearest friend, the son, I may say, of his affections, sharing a triumph for which he ought the first to have blushed. Why should I lament Gardiner? His lot was happy compared to mine. There was so much dignity in Colonel Talbot's manner, such a mixture of military pride and manly sorrow, and the news of Sir Everard's imprisonment was told in so deep a tone of feeling, that Edward stood mortified, abashed, and distressed in presence of the prisoner who owed to him his life not many hours before. He was not sorry when Fergus interrupted their conference a second time. His Royal Highness commands Mr. Waverley's attendance. Colonel Talbot threw upon Edward a reproachful glance which did not escape the quick eye of the Highland chief. His immediate attendance, he repeated, with considerable emphasis. Waverley turned again towards the colonel. We shall meet again, he said, in the meanwhile, every possible accommodation. I desire none, said the colonel. Let me fare like the meanest of those brave men who, on this day of calamity, have preferred wounds and captivity to flight. I would almost exchange places with one of those who have fallen to know that my words have made a suitable impression on your mind. Let Colonel Talbot be carefully secured, said Fergus to the Highland officer who commanded the guard over the prisoners, it is the prince's particular command, he is a prisoner of the utmost importance. But let him want no accommodation suitable to his rank, said Waverley. 
consistent always with secure custody, reiterated Fergus. The officer signified his acquiescence in both commands, and Edward followed Fergus to the garden gate, where Callum Begg, with three saddle horses, awaited them. Turning his head, he saw Colonel Talbot reconducted to his place of confinement by a file of Highlanders. He lingered on the threshold of the door and made a signal with his hand towards Waverley, as if enforcing the language he had held towards him. Horses, said Fergus, as he mounted, are now as plenty as blackberries. Every man may have them for the catching. Come, let Callum adjust your stirrups and let us to Pinky House, as fast as these C.I. Devant Dragoon horses choose to carry us. Charles Edward took up his quarters after the battle at Pinky House, adjoining to Musselboro. Chapter 21 Rather unimportant. I was turned back, said Fergus to Edward as they galloped from Preston to Pinky House, by a message from the prince. But I suppose you know the value of this most noble Colonel Talbot as a prisoner. He is held one of the best officers among the Redcoats, a special friend and favorite of the Elector himself, and of that dreadful hero, the Duke of Cumberland. Who has been summoned from his triumphs at Fontenoy to come over and devour us poor Highlanders alive? Has he been telling you how the bells of St. James's ring? Not, turn again, Whittington, like those of Bow, in the days of yore? Fergus, said Waverley, with a reproachful look. Nay, I cannot tell what to make of you, answered the chief of MacIver, you are blown about with every wind of doctrine. Here have we gained a victory unparalleled in history, and your behavior is praised by every living mortal to the skies, and the prince is eager to thank you in person, and all our beauties of the white rose are pulling caps for you. And you, the poor chevalier of the day, are stooping on your horse's neck like a butterwoman riding to market, and looking as black as a funeral. I am sorry for poor Colonel Gardiner's death, he was once very kind to me. Why, then, be sorry for five minutes, and then be glad again, his chance today may be ours tomorrow, and what does it signify? The next best thing to victory is honorable death. But it is a peace aller, and one would rather a foe had it than oneself. But Colonel Talbot has informed me that my father and uncle are both imprisoned by government on my account. We'll put in bail, my boy. Old Andrew Ferrara shall lodge his security, and I should like to see him put to justify it in Westminster Hall. Nay, they are already at liberty, upon bail of a more civic disposition. Then why is thy noble spirit cast down, Edward? Dost think that the elector's ministers are such doves as to set their enemies at liberty at this critical moment if they could or durst confine and punish them? Assure thyself that either they have no charge against your relations on which they can continue their imprisonment, or else they are afraid of our friends, the jolly cavaliers of old England. At any rate, you need not be apprehensive upon their account, and we will find some means of conveying to them assurances of your safety. Edward was silenced but not satisfied with these reasons. He had now been more than once shocked at the small degree of sympathy which Fergus exhibited for the feelings even of those whom he loved, if they did not correspond with his own mood at the time. And more especially if they thwarted him while earnest in a favorite pursuit. Fergus sometimes indeed observed that he had offended Waverley, but, always intent upon some favorite plan or project of his own, he was never sufficiently aware of the extent or duration of his displeasure so that the reiteration of these petty offenses somewhat cooled the volunteer's extreme attachment to his officer. The chevalier received Waverley with his usual favor, and paid him many compliments on his distinguished bravery. He then took him apart, made many inquiries concerning Colonel Talbot, and when he had received all the information which Edward was able to give concerning him and his connections, he proceeded, I cannot but think, Mr. Waverley, that since this gentleman is so particularly connected with our worthy and excellent friend, Sir Everard Waverley, and since his lady is of the house of Blandeville, whose devotion to the true and loyal principles of the Church of England is so generally known, the colonel's own private sentiments cannot be unfavorable to us, whatever mask he may have assumed to accommodate himself to the times. If I am to judge from the language he this day held to me, I am under the necessity of differing widely from your royal highness. Well, it is worth making a trial at least. I therefore entrust you with the charge of Colonel Talbot, with power to act concerning him as you think most advisable, and I hope you will find means of ascertaining what are his real dispositions towards our royal father's restoration. 
I am convinced, said Waverley, bowing, that if Colonel Talbot chooses to grant his parole, it may be securely depended upon. But if he refuses it, I trust your royal highness will devolve on some other person than the nephew of his friend the task of laying him under the necessary restraint. I will trust him with no person but you, said the prince, smiling, but peremptorily repeating his mandate. It is of importance to my service that there should appear to be a good intelligence between you, even if you are unable to gain his confidence in earnest. You will therefore receive him into your quarters, and in case he declines giving his parole, you must apply for a proper guard. I beg you will go about this directly. We return to Edinburgh tomorrow. Being thus remanded to the vicinity of Preston, Waverley lost the Baron of Bradwardine's solemn act of homage. So little, however, was he at this time in love with vanity, that he had quite forgotten the ceremony in which Fergus had labored to engage his curiosity. But next day a formal, gazette, was circulated, containing a detailed account of the Battle of Gladsmere, as the Highlanders chose to denominate their victory. It concluded with an account of the court afterwards held by the Chevalier at Pinky House, which contained this among other high-flown descriptive paragraphs. Since that fatal treaty which annihilates Scotland as an independent nation, it has not been our happiness to see her princes receive, and her nobles discharge, those acts of feudal homage which, founded upon the splendid actions of Scottish valor, recall the memory of her early history. With the manly and chivalrous simplicity of the ties which united to the crown the homage of the warriors by whom it was repeatedly upheld and defended. But on the evening of the twentieth our memories were refreshed with one of those ceremonies which belonged to the ancient days of Scotland's glory. After the circle was formed, Cosmo Common Bradwardine of that ilk, Colonel in the service, etc., 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 came before the prince, attended by Mr. D. Macweeble, the bailey of his ancient barony of Bradwardine, who, we understand, has been lately named a commissary, and, under form of instrument, claimed permission to perform to the person of his royal highness, as representing his father. The service used and won't, for which, under a charter of Robert Bruce, of which the original was produced and inspected by the masters of his royal highness's chancery for the time being. The claimant held the barony of Bradwardine and lands of Tully Veolan. His claim being admitted and registered, his royal highness having placed his foot upon a cushion, the baron of Bradwardine, kneeling upon his right knee, proceeded to undo the latchet of the brogue, or low-heeled highland shoe, which our gallant young hero wears in compliment to his brave followers. When this was performed, his royal highness declared the ceremony completed. And, embracing the gallant veteran, protested that nothing but compliance with an ordinance of Robert Bruce could have induced him to receive even the symbolical performance of a menial office from hands which had fought so bravely to put the crown upon the head of his father. The Baron of Bradwardine then took instruments in the hands of Mr. Commissary Macweeble, bearing that all points and circumstances of the act of homage had been right et soliniter acta et paracta. And a corresponding entry was made in the protocol of the Lord High Chamberlain and in the record of Chancery. We understand that it is in contemplation of His Royal Highness, when His Majesty's pleasure can be known, to raise Colonel Bradwardine to the peerage, by the title of Viscount Bradwardine of Bradwardine and Tully Veolan, and that, in the meanwhile, His Royal Highness, in his father's name and authority, has been pleased to grant him an honorable augmentation to his paternal coat of arms, being a budget or bootjack, disposed salterwise with a naked broadsword, to be born in the dexter cantle of the shield. And, as an additional motto, on a scroll beneath, the words, draw and draw off. Were it not for the recollection of Fergus's raillery, thought Waverley to himself, when he had perused this long and grave document, how very tolerably would all this sound. And how little should I have thought of connecting it with any ludicrous idea. Well, after all, everything has its fair as well as its seamy side. And truly I do not see why the baron's bootjack may not stand as fair in heraldry as the water buckets, wagons, cart wheels, plow socks, shuttles, candlesticks, and other ordinaries, conveying ideas of anything save chivalry, which appear in the arms of some of our most ancient gentry. This, however, is an episode in respect to the principal story. When Waverley returned to Preston and rejoined Colonel Talbot, he found him recovered from the strong and obvious emotions with which a concurrence of unpleasing events had affected him. He had regained his natural manner, which was that of an English gentleman and soldier, manly, 
open and generous, but not unsusceptible of prejudice against those of a different country, or who opposed him in political tenets. When Waverley acquainted Colonel Talbot with the Chevalier's purpose to commit him to his charge, I did not think to have owed so much obligation to that young gentleman, he said, as is implied in this destination. I can at least cheerfully join in the prayer of the honest Presbyterian clergyman, that, as he has come among us seeking an earthly crown, his labors may be speedily rewarded with a heavenly one. I shall willingly give my parole not to attempt an escape without your knowledge, since, in fact, it was to meet you that I came to Scotland, and I am glad it has happened even under this predicament. But I suppose we shall be but a short time together. Your chevalier, that is a name we may both give to him, with his plaids and blue caps, will, I presume, be continuing his crusade southward? The clergyman's name was Mac Vicar. Protected by the canon of the castle, he preached every Sunday in the West Kirk while the Highlanders were in possession of Edinburgh. And it was in presence of some of the Jacobites that he prayed for Prince Charles Edward in the terms quoted in the text. Not as I hear, I believe the army makes some stay in Edinburgh to collect reinforcements. And to besiege the castle, said Talbot, smiling sarcastically. Well, unless my old commander, General Preston, turn false metal, or the castle sink into the North Lock, events which I deem equally probable, I think we shall have some time to make up our acquaintance. I have a guess that this gallant chevalier has a design that I should be your proselyte, and, as I wish you to be mine, there cannot be a more fair proposal than to afford us fair conference together. But, as I spoke today under the influence of feelings I rarely give way to, I hope you will excuse my entering again upon controversy till we are somewhat better acquainted. Chapter 22 Intrigues of Love and Politics it is not necessary to record in these pages the triumphant entrance of the Chevalier into Edinburgh after the decisive affair at Preston. One circumstance, however, may be noticed, because it illustrates the high spirit of Flora MacIver. The Highlanders by whom the prince was surrounded, in the license and extravagance of this joyful moment, fired their pieces repeatedly, and one of these having been accidentally loaded with ball. The bullet grazed the young lady's temple as she waved her handkerchief from a balcony. Fergus, who beheld the accident, was at her side in an instant. And, on seeing that the wound was trifling, he drew his broadsword with the purpose of rushing down upon the man by whose carelessness she had incurred so much danger, when, holding him by the plaid, do not harm the poor fellow, she cried. For heaven's sake, do not harm him. But thank God with me that the accident happened to Flora MacIver, for had it befallen a wig, they would have pretended that the shot was fired on purpose. Waverley escaped the alarm which this accident would have occasioned to him, as he was unavoidably delayed by the necessity of accompanying Colonel Talbot to Edinburgh. They performed the journey together on horseback, and for some time, as if to sound each other's feelings and sentiments, they conversed upon general and ordinary topics. When Waverley again entered upon the subject which he had most at heart, the situation, namely, of his father and his uncle, Colonel Talbot seemed now rather desirous to alleviate than to aggravate his anxiety. This appeared particularly to be the case when he heard Waverley's history, which he did not scruple to confide to him. And so, said the colonel, there has been no malice prepense, as lawyers, I think, term it, in this rash step of yours. And you have been trepanned into the service of this Italian knight-errant by a few civil speeches from him and one or two of his Highland recruiting sergeants? It is sadly foolish, to be sure, but not nearly so bad as I was led to expect. However, you cannot desert, even from the pretender, at the present moment, that seems impossible. But I have little doubt that, in the dissensions incident to this heterogeneous mass of wild and desperate men, some opportunity may arise. By availing yourself of which you may extricate yourself honorably from your rash engagement before the bubble burst. If this can be managed, I would have you go to a place of safety in Flanders which I shall point out. And I think I can secure your pardon from government after a few months' residence abroad. I cannot permit you, Colonel Talbot, answered Waverley, to speak of any plan which turns on my deserting an enterprise in which I may have engaged hastily, but certainly voluntarily, and with the purpose of abiding the issue. Well, said Colonel Talbot, smiling, leave me my thoughts and hopes at least at liberty, if not my speech. But have you never examined your mysterious packet? It is in my baggage, replied Edward, we shall find it in Edinburgh. 
In Edinburgh they soon arrived. Waverley's quarters had been assigned to him, by the prince's express orders, in a handsome lodging, where there was accommodation for Colonel Talbot. His first business was to examine his portmanteau, and, after a very short search, out tumbled the expected packet. Waverley opened it eagerly. Under a blank cover, simply addressed to E. Waverley, E.S.Q., he found a number of open letters. The uppermost were two from Colonel Gardiner addressed to himself. The earliest in date was a kind and gentle remonstrance for neglect of the writer's advice respecting the disposal of his time during his leave of absence, the renewal of which, he reminded Captain Waverley, would speedily expire. Indeed, the letter proceeded, had it been otherwise, the news from abroad and my instructions from the war office must have compelled me to recall it, as there is great danger, since the disaster in Flanders. Both of foreign invasion and insurrection among the disaffected at home. I therefore entreat you will repair as soon as possible to the headquarters of the regiment. And I am concerned to add that this is still the more necessary as there is some discontent in your troop, and I postpone inquiry into particulars until I can have the advantage of your assistance. The second letter, dated eight days later, was in such a style as might have been expected from the colonel's receiving no answer to the first. It reminded Waverley of his duty as a man of honor, an officer, and a Briton took notice of the increasing dissatisfaction of his men, and that some of them had been heard to hint that their captain encouraged and approved of their mutinous behavior. And, finally, the writer expressed the utmost regret and surprise that he had not obeyed his commands by repairing to headquarters, reminded him that his leave of absence had been recalled, and conjured him. In a style in which paternal remonstrance was mingled with military authority, to redeem his error by immediately joining his regiment. That I may be certain, concluded the letter, that this actually reaches you, I dispatch it by Corporal Timms of your troop, with orders to deliver it into your own hand. Upon reading these letters Waverley, with great bitterness of feeling, was compelled to make the amand honorable to the memory of the brave and excellent writer. For surely, as Colonel Gardiner must have had every reason to conclude they had come safely to hand, less could not follow, on their being neglected, than that third and final summons, which Waverley actually received at Glenacoich though too late to obey it. And his being superseded, in consequence of his apparent neglect of this last command, was so far from being a harsh or severe proceeding, that it was plainly inevitable. The next letter he unfolded was from the major of the regiment, acquainting him that a report to the disadvantage of his reputation was public in the country, stating, that one Mr. Falconer of Ballyhopple, or some such name, had proposed in his presence a treasonable toast, which he permitted to pass in silence, although it was so gross an affront to the royal family that a gentleman in company, not remarkable for his zeal for government, had nevertheless taken the matter up, and that, supposing the account true, Captain Waverley had thus suffered another, comparatively unconcerned. To resent an affront directed against him personally as an officer, and to go out with the person by whom it was offered. The major concluded that no one of Captain Waverley's brother officers could believe this scandalous story but that it was necessarily their joint opinion that his own honor, equally with that of the regiment, depended upon its being instantly contradicted by his authority, etc. 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 What do you think of all this? said Colonel Talbot, to whom Waverley handed the letters after he had perused them. Think. It renders thought impossible. It is enough to drive me mad. Be calm, my young friend. Let us see what are these dirty scrawls that follow. The first was addressed. For Master W. Ruffin, these. Dear Sir, some of our young gulpins will not bite, thof I told them you shewed me the squire's own seal. But Tims will deliver you the letters as desired, and tell old Adam he gave them to squire's hond, as to be sure yours is the same, and shall be ready for signal, and hoy for hoy church and sashfral, as Fader sings at harvest womb. Yours, Dear Sir. H. H. Poscriff. Do ye tell Squire we longs to hear from him, and has dudings about his not writing himself, and Life Tenant Bottler is smoky. This Ruffin, I suppose, then, is your Donald of the Cavern, who has intercepted your letters, and carried on a correspondence with the poor devil Houghton, as if under your authority? It seems too true. But who can Adam be? Possibly Adam, for poor Gardiner a sort of pun on his name. The other letters were to the same purpose, 
and they soon received yet more complete light upon Donald Bean's machinations. John Hodges, one of Waverley's servants, who had remained with the regiment and had been taken at Preston, now made his appearance. He had sought out his master with the purpose of again entering his service. From this fellow they learned that some time after Waverley had gone from the headquarters of the regiment, a peddler, called Ruthven, Ruffn, or Rivane, known among the soldiers by the name of Wily Will, had made frequent visits to the town of Dundee. He appeared to possess plenty of money, sold his commodities very cheap, seemed always willing to treat his friends at the alehouse, and easily ingratiated himself with many of Waverley's troop, particularly Sergeant Houghton and one Timms. Also a non-commissioned officer. To these he unfolded, in Waverley's name, a plan for leaving the regiment and joining him in the Highlands, where report said the clans had already taken arms in great numbers. The men, who had been educated as Jacobites, so far as they had any opinion at all, and who knew their landlord, Sir Everard, had always been supposed to hold such tenets, easily fell into the snare. That Waverley was at a distance in the Highlands was received as a sufficient excuse for transmitting his letters through the medium of the peddler. And the sight of his well-known seal seemed to authenticate the negotiations in his name, where writing might have been dangerous. The cabal, however, began to take air, from the premature mutinous language of those concerned. Wiley will justify his appellative, for, after suspicion arose, he was seen no more. When the Gazette appeared in which Waverley was superseded, great part of his troop broke out into actual mutiny, but were surrounded and disarmed by the rest of the regiment. In consequence of the sentence of a court-martial, Houghton and Timms were condemned to be shot, but afterwards permitted to cast lots for life. Houghton, the survivor, showed much penitence, being convinced, from the rebukes and explanations of Colonel Gardiner, that he had really engaged in a very heinous crime. It is remarkable that, as soon as the poor fellow was satisfied of this, he became also convinced that the instigator had acted without authority from Edward, saying, if it was dishonorable and against old England. The squire could know not about it. He never did, or thought to do, anything dishonorable, no more didn't Sir Everard, nor none of them afore him, and in that belief he would live and die that Ruffin had done it all of his own head. The strength of conviction with which he expressed himself upon this subject, as well as his assurances that the letters intended for Waverley had been delivered to Ruthven, made that revolution in Colonel Gardiner's opinion which he expressed to Talbot. The reader has long since understood that Donald Bean Lean played the part of tempter on this occasion. His motives were shortly these. Of an active and intriguing spirit, he had been long employed as a subaltern agent and spy by those in the confidence of the Chevalier, to an extent beyond what was suspected even by Fergus MacIver, whom, though obliged to him for protection, he regarded with fear and dislike. To success in this political department he naturally looked for raising himself by some bold stroke above his present hazardous and precarious trade of rapine. He was particularly employed in learning the strength of the regiments in Scotland, the character of the officers, etc., and had long had his eye upon Waverley's troop as open to temptation. Donald even believed that Waverley himself was at bottom in the steward interest, which seemed confirmed by his long visit to the Jacobite Baron of Bradwardine. When, therefore, he came to his cave with one of Glenacoich's attendants, the robber, who could never appreciate his real motive, which was mere curiosity. Was so sanguine as to hope that his own talents were to be employed in some intrigue of consequence, under the auspices of this wealthy young Englishman. Nor was he undeceived by Waverley's neglecting all hints and openings afforded for explanation. His conduct passed for prudent reserve, and somewhat piqued Donald Bean, supposing himself left out of a secret where confidence promised to be advantageous, determined to have his share in the drama. Whether a regular part were assigned him or not. For this purpose during Waverley's sleep he possessed himself of his seal, as a token to be used to any of the troopers whom he might discover to be possessed of the captain's confidence. His first journey to Dundee, the town where the regiment was quartered, undeceived him in his original supposition, but opened to him a new field of action. He knew there would be no service so well rewarded by the friends of the Chevalier as seducing a part of the regular army to his standard. For this purpose he opened the machinations with which the reader is already acquainted, and which form a clue to all the intricacies and obscurities of the narrative previous to Waverley's leaving Glenacoich. By Colonel Talbot's advice, 
Waverly declined detaining in his service the lad whose evidence had thrown additional light on these intrigues. He represented to him, that it would be doing the man an injury to engage him in a desperate undertaking, and that, whatever should happen. His evidence would go some length at least in explaining the circumstances under which Waverley himself had embarked in it. Waverley therefore wrote a short state of what had happened to his uncle and his father, cautioning them, however, in the present circumstances, not to attempt to answer his letter. Talbot then gave the young man a letter to the commander of one of the English vessels of war cruising in the Frith, requesting him to put the bearer ashore at Berwick, with a pass to proceed to Shire. He was then furnished with money to make an expeditious journey, and directed to get on board the ship by means of bribing a fishing boat, which, as they afterwards learned, he easily effected. Tired of the attendance of Callum Begg, who, he thought, had some disposition to act as a spy on his motions, Waverley hired as a servant a simple Edinburgh swain, who had mounted the white cockade in a fit of spleen and jealousy. Because Jenny Jopp had danced a whole night with Corporal Bullock of the Fusiliers. Chapter 23 Intrigues of Society and Love Colonel Talbot became more kindly in his demeanor towards Waverley after the confidence he had reposed in him, and, as they were necessarily much together, the character of the colonel rose in Waverley's estimation. There seemed at first something harsh in his strong expressions of dislike and censure, although no one was in the general case more open to conviction. The habit of authority had also given his manners some peremptory hardness notwithstanding the polish which they had received from his intimate acquaintance with the higher circles. As a specimen of the military character, he differed from all whom Waverley had as yet seen. The soldiership of the Baron of Bradwardine was marked by pedantry. That of Major Melville by a sort of martinet attention to the minutiae and technicalities of discipline, rather suitable to one who was to maneuver a battalion than to him who was to command an army. The military spirit of Fergus was so much warped and blended with his plans and political views, that it was less that of a soldier than of a petty sovereign. But Colonel Talbot was in every point the English soldier. His whole soul was devoted to the service of his king and country, without feeling any pride in knowing the theory of his art with the baron, or its practical minutiae with the major. Or in applying his science to his own particular plans of ambition, like the chieftain of Glenacoich. Added to this, he was a man of extended knowledge and cultivated taste, although strongly tinged, as we have already observed, with those prejudices which are peculiarly English. The character of Colonel Talbot dawned upon Edward by degrees. For the delay of the Highlanders in the fruitless siege of Edinburgh Castle occupied several weeks, during which Waverley had little to do excepting to seek such amusement as society afforded. He would willingly have persuaded his new friend to become acquainted with some of his former intimates. But the colonel, after one or two visits, shook his head, and declined farther experiment. Indeed he went farther, and characterized the baron as the most intolerable formal pedant he had ever had the misfortune to meet with, and the chief of Glenacoich as a Frenchified Scotchman. Possessing all the cunning and plausibility of the nation where he was educated, with the proud, vindictive, and turbulent humor of that of his birth. If the devil, he said, had sought out an agent expressly for the purpose of embroiling this miserable country, I do not think he could find a better than such a fellow as this, whose temper seems equally active, supple, and mischievous. And who is followed, and implicitly obeyed, by a gang of such cutthroats as those whom you are pleased to admire so much. The ladies of the party did not escape his censure. He allowed that Flora Mac Ivor was a fine woman, and Rose Bradwardine a pretty girl but he alleged that the former destroyed the effect of her beauty by an affectation of the grand airs which she had probably seen practiced in the mock court of St. Germain's. As for Rose Bradwardine, he said it was impossible for any mortal to admire such a little uninformed thing, whose small portion of education was as ill adapted to her sex or youth as if she had appeared with one of her father's old campaign coats upon her person for her sole garment. Now much of this was mere spleen and prejudice in the excellent colonel, with whom the white cockade on the breast, the white rose in the hair, and the mac at the beginning of a name would have made a devil out of an angel. And indeed he himself jocularly allowed that he could not have endured Venus herself if she had been announced in a drawing room by the name of Miss Mac Jupiter. Waverley, it may easily be believed, looked upon these young ladies with very different eyes. During the period of the siege he paid them almost daily visits, 
although he observed with regret that his suit made as little progress in the affections of the former as the arms of the chevalier in subduing the fortress. She maintained with rigor the rule she had laid down of treating him with indifference, without either affecting to avoid him or to shun intercourse with him. Every word, every look, was strictly regulated to accord with her system. And neither the dejection of Waverley nor the anger which Fergus scarcely suppressed could extend Flora's attention to Edward beyond that which the most ordinary politeness demanded. On the other hand, Rose Bradwardine gradually rose in Waverley's opinion. He had several opportunities of remarking that, as her extreme timidity wore off, her manners assumed a higher character. That the agitating circumstances of the stormy time seemed to call forth a certain dignity of feeling and expression which he had not formerly observed. And that she omitted no opportunity within her reach to extend her knowledge and refine her taste. Flora MacIver called Rose her pupil, and was attentive to assist her in her studies, and to fashion both her taste and understanding. It might have been remarked by a very close observer that in the presence of Waverley she was much more desirous to exhibit her friend's excellences than her own. But I must request of the reader to suppose that this kind and disinterested purpose was concealed by the most cautious delicacy, studiously shunning the most distant approach to affectation. So that it was as unlike the usual exhibition of one pretty woman affecting to prone her another as the friendship of David and Jonathan might be to the intimacy of two Bond Street loungers. The fact is that, though the effect was felt, the cause could hardly be observed. Each of the ladies, like two excellent actresses, were perfect in their parts, and performed them to the delight of the audience. And such being the case, it was almost impossible to discover that the elder constantly ceded to her friend that which was most suitable to her talents. But to Waverley, Rose Bradwardine possessed an attraction which few men can resist, from the marked interest which she took in everything that affected him. She was too young and too inexperienced to estimate the full force of the constant attention which she paid to him. Her father was too abstractedly immersed in learned and military discussions to observe her partiality, and Flora MacIver did not alarm her by remonstrance. Because she saw in this line of conduct the most probable chance of her friend securing at length a return of affection. The truth is, that in her first conversation after their meeting Rose had discovered the state of her mind to that acute and intelligent friend although she was not herself aware of it. From that time Flora was not only determined upon the final rejection of Waverley's addresses, but became anxious that they should, if possible, be transferred to her friend. Nor was she less interested in this plan, though her brother had from time to time talked, as between jest and earnest, of paying his suit to Miss Bradwardine. She knew that Fergus had the true continental latitude of opinion respecting the institution of marriage, and would not have given his hand to an angel unless for the purpose of strengthening his alliances and increasing his influence and wealth. The baron's whim of transferring his estate to the distant heir male, instead of his own daughter, was therefore likely to be an insurmountable obstacle to his entertaining any serious thoughts of Rose Bradwardine. Indeed, Fergus's brain was a perpetual workshop of scheme and intrigue, of every possible kind and description. While, like many a mechanic of more ingenuity than steadiness, he would often unexpectedly, and without any apparent motive, abandon one plan and go earnestly to work upon another. Which was either fresh from the forge of his imagination or had at some former period been flung aside half-finished. It was therefore often difficult to guess what line of conduct he might finally adopt upon any given occasion. Although Flora was sincerely attached to her brother, whose high energies might indeed have commanded her admiration even without the ties which bound them together, she was by no means blind to his faults. Which she considered as dangerous to the hopes of any woman who should found her ideas of a happy marriage in the peaceful enjoyment of domestic society and the exchange of mutual and engrossing affection. The real disposition of Waverley, on the other hand, notwithstanding his dreams of tented fields and military honor, seemed exclusively domestic. He asked and received no share in the busy scenes which were constantly going on around him and was rather annoyed than interested by the discussion of contending claims, rights, and interests which often passed in his presence. All this pointed him out as the person formed to make happy a spirit like that of Rose, which corresponded with his own. She remarked this point in Waverley's character one day while she sat with Miss Bradwardine. His genius and elegant taste, answered Rose, cannot be interested in such trifling discussions. What is it to him, for example? whether the chief of the Massendaligers, 
who has brought out only fifty men, should be a colonel or a captain. And how could Mr. Waverley be supposed to interest himself in the violent altercation between your brother and young Coronaskian whether the post of honor is due to the eldest cadet of a clan or the youngest? My dear Rose, if he were the hero you suppose him he would interest himself in these matters, not indeed as important in themselves, but for the purpose of mediating between the ardent spirits who actually do make them the subject of discord. You saw when Coronaskian raised his voice in great passion, and laid his hand upon his sword, Waverley lifted his head as if he had just awaked from a dream, and asked with great composure what the matter was. Well, and did not the laughter they fell into at his absence of mind serve better to break off the dispute than anything he could have said to them? True, my dear, answered Flora. But not quite so creditably for Waverley as if he had brought them to their senses by force of reason. Would you have him peacemaker general between all the gunpowder highlanders in the army? I beg your pardon, Flora, your brother, you know, is out of the question, he has more sense than half of them. But can you think the fierce, hot, furious spirits of whose brawls we see much and hear more, and who terrify me out of my life every day in the world, are at all to be compared to Waverley? I do not compare him with those uneducated men, my dear Rose. I only lament that, with his talents and genius, he does not assume that place in society for which they eminently fit him, and that he does not lend their full impulse to the noble cause in which he has enlisted. Are there not Lochiel, and P, and M, and G, all men of the highest education as well as the first talents, why will he not stoop like them to be alive and useful? I often believe his zeal is frozen by that proud cold-blooded Englishman whom he now lives with so much. Colonel Talbot? He is a very disagreeable person, to be sure. He looks as if he thought no Scottish woman worth the trouble of handing her a cup of tea. But Waverley is so gentle, so well informed. Yes, said Flora, smiling, he can admire the moon and quote a stanza from Tasso. Besides, you know how he fought, added Miss Bradwardine. For mere fighting, answered Flora, I believe all men, that is, who deserve the name, are pretty much alike there is generally more courage required to run away. They have besides, when confronted with each other, a certain instinct for strife, as we see in other male animals, such as dogs, bulls, and so forth. But high and perilous enterprise is not Waverley's forte. He would never have been his celebrated ancestor Sir Nigel, but only Sir Nigel's eulogist and poet. I will tell you where he will be at home, my dear, and in his place, in the quiet circle of domestic happiness, lettered indolence, and elegant enjoyments of Waverley honor. And he will refit the old library in the most exquisite Gothic taste, and garnish its shelves with the rarest and most valuable volumes, and he will draw plans and landscapes, and write verses, and rear temples, and dig grottoes. And he will stand in a clear summer night in the colonnade before the hall, and gaze on the deer as they stray in the moonlight, or lie shadowed by the boughs of the huge old fantastic oaks and he will repeat verses to his beautiful wife, who will hang upon his arm, and he will be a happy man. And she will be a happy woman, thought poor Rose. But she only sighed and dropped the conversation. Chapter 24 Fergus a Suitor Waverley had, indeed, as he looked closer into the state of the Chevalier's court, less reason to be satisfied with it. It contained, as they say an acorn includes all the ramifications of the future oak, as many seeds of tracasserie and intrigue as might have done honor to the court of a large empire. Every person of consequence had some separate object, which he pursued with a fury that Waverley considered as altogether disproportioned to its importance. Almost all had their reasons for discontent, although the most legitimate was that of the worthy old baron, who was only distressed on account of the common cause. We shall hardly, said he one morning to Waverley when they had been viewing the castle, we shall hardly gain the obsidional crown, which you what well was made of the roots or grain which takes root within the place besieged. Or it may be of the herb wood bind, parietaria, or pellitory. We shall not, I say, gain it by this same blockade or leaguer of Edinburgh Castle. For this opinion he gave most learned and satisfactory reasons, that the reader may not care to hear repeated. Having escaped from the old gentleman, Waverley went to Fergus's lodgings by appointment, to await his return from Holyrood House. I am to have a particular audience tomorrow, said Fergus to Waverley overnight, 
and you must meet me to wish me joy of the success which I securely anticipate. The morrow came, and in the chief's apartment he found Ensign Mackambich waiting to make report of his turn of duty in a sort of ditch which they had dug across the castle hill and called a trench. In a short time the chief's voice was heard on the stair in a tone of impatient fury, Callum. Why, Callum beg. Dial. He entered the room with all the marks of a man agitated by a towering passion. And there were few upon whose features rage produced a more violent effect. The veins of his forehead swelled when he was in such agitation, his nostril became dilated, his cheek and eye inflamed, and his look that of a demoniac. These appearances of half-suppressed rage were the more frightful because they were obviously caused by a strong effort to temper with discretion an almost ungovernable paroxysm of passion, and resulted from an internal conflict of the most dreadful kind, which agitated his whole frame of mortality. As he entered the apartment he unbuckled his broadsword, and throwing it down with such violence that the weapon rolled to the other end of the room, I know not what, he exclaimed. Withholds me from taking a solemn oath that I will never more draw it in his cause. Load my pistols, Callum, and bring them hither instantly, instantly. Callum, whom nothing ever startled, dismayed, or disconcerted, obeyed very coolly. Evan D.H.U., upon whose brow the suspicion that his chief had been insulted called up a corresponding storm, swelled in sullen silence, awaiting to learn where or upon whom vengeance was to descend. So, Waverley, you are there, said the chief, after a moment's recollection. Yes, I remember I asked you to share my triumph, and you have come to witness my disappointment we shall call it. Evan now presented the written report he had in his hand, which Fergus threw from him with great passion. I wish to God, he said, the old den would tumble down upon the heads of the fools who attack and the knaves who defend it. I see, Waverley, you think I am mad. Leave us, Evan, but be within call. The colonel's in an unco kippage, said Mrs. Flockhart to Evan as he descended, I wish he may be weal, the very veins on his brent brow are swelled like whipcord. What he know tack something? He usually lets blood for these fits, answered the Highland ancient with great composure. When this officer left the room, the chieftain gradually reassumed some degree of composure. I know, Waverley, he said, that Colonel Talbot has persuaded you to curse ten times a day your engagement with us, nay, never deny it, for I am at this moment tempted to curse my own. Would you believe it, I made this very morning two suits to the prince, and he has rejected them both, what do you think of it? What can I think, answered Waverley, till I know what your requests were? Why? What signifies what they were, man? I tell you it was I that made them, I to whom he owes more than to any three who have joined the standard, for I negotiated the whole business, and brought in all the Perthshire men when not one would have stirred. I am not likely, I think, to ask anything very unreasonable, and if I did, they might have stretched a point. Well, but you shall know all, now that I can draw my breath again with some freedom. You remember my Earl's patent. It is dated some years back, for services then rendered, and certainly my merit has not been diminished, to say the least, by my subsequent behavior. Now, sir, I value this bauble of a coronet as little as you can, or any philosopher on earth. For I hold that the chief of such a clan as the Slyak Nan Ivor is superior in rank to any earl in Scotland. But I had a particular reason for assuming this cursed title at this time. You must know that I learned accidentally that the prince has been pressing that old foolish baron of Bradwardine to disinherit his male heir, or nineteenth or twentieth cousin, who has taken a command in the elector of Hanover's militia. And to settle his estate upon your pretty little friend Rose. And this, as being the command of his king and overlord, who may alter the destination of a fief at pleasure, the old gentleman seems well reconciled to. And what becomes of the homage? Curse the homage. I believe Rose is to pull off the Queen's slipper on her coronation day, or some such trash. Well, sir, as Rose Bradwardine would always have made a suitable match for me but for this idiotical predilection of her father for the air mail. It occurred to me there now remained no obstacle unless that the Baron might expect his daughter's husband to take the name of Bradwardine, which you know would be impossible in my case. And that this might be evaded by my assuming the title to which I had so good a right, and which, of course, would supersede that difficulty. 
if she was to be also Viscountess Brad Radin in her own right after her father's demise, so much the better, I could have no objection. But, Fergus, said Waverley, I had no idea that you had any affection for Miss Brad Radin, and you are always sneering at her father. I have as much affection for Miss Brad Radin, my good friend, as I think it necessary to have for the future mistress of my family and the mother of my children. She is a very pretty, intelligent girl, and is certainly of one of the very first Lowland families, and, with a little of Flora's instructions and forming, will make a very good figure. As to her father, he is an original, it is true, and an absurd one enough. But he has given such severe lessons to Sir H. E. W. Halbert, that dear defunct the Laird of Balmawapple, and others, that nobody dare laugh at him, so his absurdity goes for nothing. I tell you there could have been no earthly objection, none. I had settled the thing entirely in my own mind. But had you asked the Baron's consent, said Waverley, or Roses? To what purpose? To have spoken to the Baron before I had assumed my title would have only provoked a premature and irritating discussion on the subject of the change of name, when, as Earl of Glenacoich, I had only to propose to him to carry his d, d Baron bootjack party per pale, or in a scutcheon of pretense, or in a separate shield perhaps, any way that would not blemish my own coat of arms. And as to Rose, I don't see what objection she could have made if her father was satisfied. Perhaps the same that your sister makes to me, you being satisfied. Fergus gave a broad stare at the comparison which this supposition implied, but cautiously suppressed the answer which rose to his tongue. Oh, we should easily have arranged all that. So, sir, I craved a private interview, and this morning was assigned, and I asked you to meet me here, thinking, like a fool, that I should want your countenance as bridesman. Well, I state my pretension, they are not denied. The promises so repeatedly made and the patent granted, they are acknowledged. But I propose, as a natural consequence, to assume the rank which the patent bestowed. I have the old story of the jealousy of C. and M., trumped up against me. I resist this pretext, and offer to procure their written acquiescence, in virtue of the date of my patent as prior to their silly claims, I assure you I would have had such a consent from them, if it had been at the point of the sword. And then out comes the real truth. And he dares to tell me to my face that my patent must be suppressed for the present, for fear of disgusting that rascally coward and feignant, naming the rival chief of his own clan who has no better title to be a chieftain than I to be emperor of China, and who is pleased to shelter his dastardly reluctance to come out, agreeable to his promise twenty times pledged, under a pretended jealousy of the prince's partiality to me. And, to leave this miserable driveller without a pretense for his cowardice, the prince asks it as a personal favour of me, forsooth, not to press my just and reasonable request at this moment. After this, put your faith in princes. And did your audience end here? End? Oh no. I was determined to leave him no pretense for his ingratitude, and I therefore stated, with all the composure I could muster, for I promise you I trembled with passion. The particular reasons I had for wishing that His Royal Highness would impose upon me any other mode of exhibiting my duty and devotion, as my views in life made what at any other time would have been a mere trifle at this crisis a severe sacrifice. And then I explained to him my full plan. And what did the prince answer? Answer. Why, it is well it is written, curse not the king, no, not in thy thought. Why, he answered that truly he was glad I had made him my confidant, to prevent more grievous disappointment, for he could assure me, upon the word of a prince, that Miss Bradwardine's affections were engaged. And he was under a particular promise to favor them. So, my dear Fergus, said he, with his most gracious cast of smile, as the marriage is utterly out of question, there need be no hurry, you know, about the earldom. And so he glided off and left me planté la. And what did you do? I'll tell you what I could have done at that moment, sold myself to the devil or the elector, whichever offered the dearest revenge. However, I am now cool. I know he intends to marry her to some of his rascally Frenchmen or his Irish officers, but I will watch them close, and let the man that would supplant me look well to himself. By Sona Copersi, Sr. After some further conversation, unnecessary to be detailed, Waverley took leave of the chieftain, whose fury had now subsided into a deep and strong desire of vengeance, and returned home. 
scarce able to analyze the mixture of feelings which the narrative had awakened in his own bosom. Chapter 25 To one thing constant never. I am the very child of caprice, said Waverley to himself, as he bolted the door of his apartment and paced it with hasty steps. What is it to me that Fergus MacIver should wish to marry Rose Bradwardine? I love her not, I might have been loved by her perhaps. But rejected her simple, natural, and affecting attachment, instead of cherishing it into tenderness, and dedicated myself to one who will never love mortal man, unless old Warwick, the kingmaker, should arise from the dead. The baron too, I would not have cared about his estate, and so the name would have been no stumbling block. The devil might have taken the baron moors and drawn off the royal caligi for anything I would have minded. But, framed as she is for domestic affection and tenderness, for giving and receiving all those kind and quiet attentions which sweeten life to those who pass it together, she is sought by Fergus MacIver. He will not use her ill, to be sure. Of that he is incapable. But he will neglect her after the first month. He will be too intent on subduing some rival chieftain or circumventing some favorite at court, on gaining some heathy hill and lake or adding to his band some new troop of caterans, to inquire what she does, or how she amuses herself. And then will canker sorrow eat her bud. And chase the native beauty from her cheek. And she will look as hollow as a ghost. And dim and meager as an ague fit. And so she'll die. And such a catastrophe of the most gentle creature on earth might have been prevented if Mr. Edward Waverley had had his eyes. Upon my word, I cannot understand how I thought Flora so much, that is, so very much, handsomer than Rose. She is taller indeed, and her manner more formed, but many people think Miss Bradwardine's more natural, and she is certainly much younger. I should think Flora is two years older than I am. I will look at them particularly this evening. And with this resolution Waverley went to drink tea, as the fashion was sixty years since, at the house of a lady of quality attached to the cause of the Chevalier, where he found, as he expected, both the ladies. All rose as he entered, but Flora immediately resumed her place and the conversation in which she was engaged. Rose, on the contrary, almost imperceptibly made a little way in the crowded circle for his advancing the corner of a chair. Her manner, upon the whole, is most engaging, said Waverley to himself. A dispute occurred whether the Gaelic or Italian language was most liquid, and best adapted for poetry. The opinion for the Gaelic, which probably might not have found supporters elsewhere, was here fiercely defended by seven Highland ladies, who talked at the top of their lungs, and screamed the company deaf with examples of Celtic euphonia. Flora, observing the lowland ladies sneer at the comparison, produced some reasons to show that it was not altogether so absurd. But Rose, when asked for her opinion, gave it with animation in praise of Italian, which she had studied with Waverley's assistance. She has a more correct ear than Flora, though a less accomplished musician, said Waverley to himself. I suppose Miss MacIver will next compare MacMurrow Nan Fawn to Ariosto. Lastly, it so befell that the company differed whether Fergus should be asked to perform on the flute, at which he was an adept, or Waverley invited to read a play of Shakespeare. And the lady of the house good humouredly undertook to collect the votes of the company for poetry or music. Under the condition that the gentlemen whose talents were not laid under contribution that evening should contribute them to enliven the next. It chanced that Rose had the casting vote. Now Flora, who seemed to impose it as a rule upon herself never to countenance any proposal which might seem to encourage Waverley, had voted for music, providing the Baron would take his violin to accompany Fergus. I wish you joy of your taste, Miss MacIver, thought Edward, as they sought for his book. I thought it better when we were at Glenacoich, but certainly the Baron is no great performer, and Shakespeare is worth listening to. Romeo and Juliet was selected, and Edward read with taste, feeling, and spirit several scenes from that play. All the company applauded with their hands, and many with their tears. Flora, to whom the drama was well known, was among the former. Rose, to whom it was altogether new, belonged to the latter class of admirers. She has more feeling too, said Waverley, internally. The conversation turning upon the incidents of the play and upon the characters, Fergus declared that the only one worth naming, as a man of fashion and spirit, was Mercutio. I could not, he said, 
quite follow all his old-fashioned wit, but he must have been a very pretty fellow, according to the ideas of his time. And it was a shame, said Ensign Mackambich, who usually followed his colonel everywhere, for that Tibbert, or Taggart, or whatever was his name, to stick him under the other gentleman's arm while he was reading the fray. The ladies, of course, declared loudly in favor of Romeo, but this opinion did not go undisputed. The mistress of the house and several other ladies severely reprobated the levity with which the hero transfers his affections from Rosalind to Juliet. Flora remained silent until her opinion was repeatedly requested, and then answered, she thought the circumstance objected to not only reconcilable to nature, but such as in the highest degree evinced the art of the poet. Romeo is described, said she, as a young man peculiarly susceptible of the softer passions, his love is at first fixed upon a woman who could afford it no return. This he repeatedly tells you. From love's weak, childish bow she lives unharmed. And again. She hath forsworn to love. Now, as it was impossible that Romeo's love, supposing him a reasonable being, could continue to subsist without hope, the poet has, with great art, seized the moment when he was reduced actually to despair to throw in his way an object more accomplished than her by whom he had been rejected, and who is disposed to repay his attachment. I can scarce conceive a situation more calculated to enhance the ardor of Romeo's affection for Juliet than his being at once raised by her from the state of drooping melancholy in which he appears first upon the scene to the ecstatic state in which he exclaims. Come what sorrow can. It cannot countervail the exchange of joy. That one short moment gives me in her sight. Good now, Miss MacIver, said a young lady of quality, do you mean to cheat us out of our prerogative? Will you persuade us love cannot subsist without hope, or that the lover must become fickle if the lady is cruel? Oh fie! I did not expect such an unsentimental conclusion. A lover, my dear Lady Betty, said Flora, may, I conceive, persevere in his suit under very discouraging circumstances. Affection can, now and then, withstand very severe storms of rigor, but not a long polar frost of downright indifference. Don't, even with your attractions, try the experiment upon any lover whose faith you value. Love will subsist on wonderfully little hope, but not altogether without it. It will be just like Duncan MacGurdy's mare, said Evan, if your ladyships please, he wanted to use her by degrees to live without meat, and just as he had put her on a straw a day the poor thing died. Evan's illustration set the company a laughing, and the discourse took a different turn. Shortly afterwards the party broke up, and Edward returned home, musing on what Flora had said. I will love my Rosalind no more, said he. She has given me a broad enough hint for that, and I will speak to her brother and resign my suit. But for a Juliet, would it be handsome to interfere with Fergus's pretensions, though it is impossible they can ever succeed. And should they miscarry, what then? Why then allure come allure? And with this resolution of being guided by circumstances did our hero commit himself to repose. Chapter 26 A Brave Man in Sorrow If my fair readers should be of opinion that my hero's levity in love is altogether unpardonable, I must remind them that all his griefs and difficulties did not arise from that sentimental source. Even the lyric poet who complained so feelingly of the pains of love could not forget, that at the same time he was, in debt and in drink, which, doubtless, were great aggravations of his distress. There were, indeed, whole days in which Waverley thought neither of Flora nor Rose Bradwardine, but which were spent in melancholy conjectures on the probable state of matters at Waverley Honor. And the dubious issue of the civil contest in which he was pledged. Colonel Talbot often engaged him in discussions upon the justice of the cause he had espoused. Not, he said, that it is possible for you to quit it at this present moment, for, come what will, you must stand by your rash engagement. But I wish you to be aware that the right is not with you, that you are fighting against the real interests of your country. And that you ought, as an Englishman and a patriot, to take the first opportunity to leave this unhappy expedition before the snowball melts. In such political disputes Waverley usually opposed the common arguments of his party, with which it is unnecessary to trouble the reader. But he had little to say when the colonel urged him to compare the strength by which they had undertaken to overthrow the government with that which was now assembling very rapidly for its support. To this statement Waverley had but one answer, 
if the cause I have undertaken be perilous, there would be the greater disgrace in abandoning it. And in his turn he generally silenced Colonel Talbot, and succeeded in changing the subject. One night, when, after a long dispute of this nature, the friends had separated and our hero had retired to bed, he was awakened about midnight by a suppressed groan. He started up and listened. It came from the apartment of Colonel Talbot, which was divided from his own by a wainscot partition, with a door of communication. Waverley approached this door and distinctly heard one or two deep-drawn sighs. What could be the matter? The colonel had parted from him apparently in his usual state of spirits. He must have been taken suddenly ill. Under this impression he opened the door of communication very gently, and perceived the colonel, in his nightgown, seated by a table, on which lay a letter and a picture. He raised his head hastily, as Edward stood uncertain whether to advance or retire, and Waverley perceived that his cheeks were stained with tears. As if ashamed at being found giving way to such emotion, Colonel Talbot rose with apparent displeasure and said, with some sternness, I think, Mr. Waverley, my own apartment and the hour might have secured even a prisoner against. Do not say intrusion, Colonel Talbot, I heard you breathe hard and feared you were ill, that alone could have induced me to break in upon you. I am well, said the Colonel, perfectly well. But you are distressed, said Edward, is there anything can be done? Nothing, Mr. Waverley, I was only thinking of home, and some unpleasant occurrences there. Good God, my uncle! exclaimed Waverley. No, it is a grief entirely my own. I am ashamed you should have seen it disarm me so much, but it must have its course at times, that it may be at others more decently supported. I would have kept it secret from you. For I think it will grieve you, and yet you can administer no consolation. But you have surprised me, I see you are surprised yourself, and I hate mystery. Read that letter. The letter was from Colonel Talbot's sister, and in these words. I received yours, my dearest brother, by Hodges. Sir E. W. and Mr. R. are still at large, but are not permitted to leave London. I wish to heaven I could give you as good an account of matters in the square. But the news of the unhappy affair at Preston came upon us, with the dreadful addition that you were among the fallen. You know Lady Emily's state of health, when your friendship for Sir E. induced you to leave her. She was much harassed with the sad accounts from Scotland of the rebellion having broken out. But kept up her spirits, as, she said, it became your wife, and for the sake of the future heir, so long hoped for in vain. Alas, my dear brother, these hopes are now ended. Notwithstanding all my watchful care, this unhappy rumor reached her without preparation. She was taken ill immediately, and the poor infant scarce survived its birth. Would to God this were all! But although the contradiction of the horrible report by your own letter has greatly revived her spirits, yet dr. apprehends, I grieve to say, serious, and even dangerous, consequences to her health, especially from the uncertainty in which she must necessarily remain for some time. Aggravated by the ideas she has formed of the ferocity of those with whom you are a prisoner. Do therefore, my dear brother, as soon as this reaches you, endeavor to gain your release, by parole, by ransom, or any way that is practicable. I do not exaggerate Lady Emily's state of health, but I must not, dare not, suppress the truth. Ever, my dear Philip, your most affectionate sister. Lucy Talbot. Edward stood motionless when he had perused this letter, for the conclusion was inevitable, that, by the colonel's journey in quest of him, he had incurred this heavy calamity. It was severe enough, even in its irremediable part, for Colonel Talbot and Lady Emily, long without a family, had fondly exulted in the hopes which were now blasted. But this disappointment was nothing to the extent of the threatened evil. And Edward, with horror, regarded himself as the original cause of both. Ere he could collect himself sufficiently to speak, Colonel Talbot had recovered his usual composure of manner, though his troubled eye denoted his mental agony. She is a woman, my young friend, who may justify even a soldier's tears. He reached him the miniature, exhibiting features which fully justified the eulogium. And yet, God knows, what you see of her there is the least of the charms she possesses, possessed, I should perhaps say, but God's will be done. You must fly, you must fly instantly to her relief. 
It is not, it shall not be too late. Fly. How is it possible? I am a prisoner, upon parole. I am your keeper, I restore your parole, I am to answer for you. You cannot do so consistently with your duty, nor can I accept a discharge from you, with due regard to my own honor. You would be made responsible. I will answer it with my head, if necessary, said Waverley impetuously. I have been the unhappy cause of the loss of your child, make me not the murderer of your wife. No, my dear Edward, said Talbot, taking him kindly by the hand, you are in no respect to blame, and if I concealed this domestic distress for two days, it was lest your sensibility should view it in that light. You could not think of me, hardly knew of my existence, when I left England in quest of you. It is a responsibility, heaven knows, sufficiently heavy for mortality, that we must answer for the foreseen and direct result of our actions. For their indirect and consequential operation the great and good being, who alone can foresee the dependence of human events on each other, hath not pronounced his frail creatures liable. But that you should have left Lady Emily, said Waverley, with much emotion, in the situation of all others the most interesting to a husband, to seek a. I only did my duty, answered Colonel Talbot, calmly, and I do not, ought not. To regret it. If the path of gratitude and honor were always smooth and easy, there would be little merit in following it, but it moves often in contradiction to our interest and passions, and sometimes to our better affections. These are the trials of life, and this, though not the least bitter, the tears came unbidden to his eyes, is not the first which it has been my fate to encounter. But we will talk of this tomorrow, he said, wringing Waverley's hands. Good night, strive to forget it for a few hours. It will dawn, I think, by six, and it is now past two. Good night. Edward retired, without trusting his voice with a reply. Chapter 27 Exertion When Colonel Talbot entered the breakfast parlor next morning, he learned from Waverley's servant that our hero had been abroad at an early hour and was not yet returned. The morning was well advanced before he again appeared. He arrived out of breath but with an air of joy that astonished Colonel Talbot. There, said he, throwing a paper on the table, there is my morning's work. Alec, pack up the colonel's clothes. Make haste, make haste. The colonel examined the paper with astonishment. It was a pass from the Chevalier to Colonel Talbot, to repair to Leith, or any other port in possession of His Royal Highness's troops, and there to embark for England or elsewhere, at his free pleasure he only giving his parole of honor not to bear arms against the house of Stuart for the space of a twelvemonth. In the name of God, said the colonel, his eyes sparkling with eagerness, how did you obtain this? I was at the Chevalier's levee as soon as he usually rises. He was gone to the camp at Duddingston. I pursued him thither, asked and obtained an audience, but I will tell you not a word more, unless I see you begin to pack. Before I know whether I can avail myself of this passport, or how it was obtained? Oh, you can take out the things again, you know. Now I see you busy, I will go on. When I first mentioned your name, his eyes sparkled almost as bright as yours did two minutes since. Had you, he earnestly asked, shown any sentiments favorable to his cause? Not in the least, nor was there any hope you would do so. His countenance fell. I requested your freedom. Impossible, he said. Your importance as a friend and confidant of such and such personages made my request altogether extravagant. I told him my own story and yours. And asked him to judge what my feelings must be by his own. He has a heart, and a kind one, Colonel Talbot, you may say what you please. He took a sheet of paper and wrote the pass with his own hand. I will not trust myself with my counsel, he said, they will argue me out of what is right. I will not endure that a friend, valued as I value you, should be loaded with the painful reflections which must afflict you in case of further misfortune in Colonel Talbot's family, nor will I keep a brave enemy a prisoner under such circumstances. Besides, said he, I think I can justify myself to my prudent advisers by pleading the good effect such lenity will produce on the minds of the great English families with whom Colonel Talbot is connected. There the politician peeped out, said the colonel. Well, at least he concluded like a king's son, take the passport, I have added a condition for form's sake, but if the colonel objects to it, 
let him depart without giving any parole whatever. I come here to war with men, but not to distress or endanger women. Well, I never thought to have been so much indebted to the pretend. To the prince, said Waverley, smiling. To the chevalier, said the colonel. It is a good traveling name, and which we may both freely use. Did he say anything more? Only asked if there was anything else he could oblige me in. And when I replied in the negative, he shook me by the hand, and wished all his followers were as considerate, since some friends of mine not only asked all he had to bestow, but many things which were entirely out of his power. Or that of the greatest sovereign upon earth. Indeed, he said, no prince seemed, in the eyes of his followers, so like the deity as himself, if you were to judge from the extravagant requests which they daily preferred to him. Poor young gentleman, said the colonel, I suppose he begins to feel the difficulties of his situation. Well, dear Waverley, this is more than kind, and shall not be forgotten while Philip Talbot can remember anything. My life, Shaw, let Emily thank you for that, this is a favor worth fifty lives. I cannot hesitate on giving my parole in the circumstances, there it is, he wrote it out in form. And now, how am I to get off? All that is settled, your baggage is packed, my horses wait, and a boat has been engaged, by the prince's permission, to put you on board the fox frigate. I send a messenger down to Leith on purpose. That will do excellently well. Captain Beaver is my particular friend, he will put me ashore at Barrack or Shields, from whence I can ride post to London, and you must entrust me with the packet of papers which you recovered by means of your Miss Bean Lean. I may have an opportunity of using them to your advantage. But I see your Highland friend, Glen, what do you call his barbarous name? And his orderly with him, I must not call him his orderly cutthroat any more, I suppose. See how he walks as if the world were his own, with the bonnet on one side of his head and his plaid puffed out across his breast. I should like now to meet that youth where my hands were not tied, would tame his pride, or he should tame mine. For shame, Colonel Talbot. You swell at sight of tartan as the bull is said to do at scarlet. You and MacIver have some points not much unlike, so far as national prejudice is concerned. The latter part of this discourse took place in the street. They passed the chief, the colonel and he sternly and punctiliously greeting each other, like two duelists before they take their ground. It was evident the dislike was mutual. I never see that surly fellow that dogs his heels, said the colonel after he had mounted his horse, but he reminds me of lines I have somewhere heard, upon the stage, I think. Close behind him. Stock sullen Bertram, like a sorcerer's fiend. Pressing to be employed. I assure you, Colonel, said Waverley, that you judge too harshly of the Highlanders. Not a wit, not a wit, I cannot spare them a jot, I cannot bait them an ace. Let them stay in their own barren mountains, and puff and swell and hang their bonnets on the horns of the moon, if they have a mind, but what business have they to come where people wear breeches, and speak an intelligible language? I mean intelligible in comparison to their gibberish, for even the lowlanders talk a kind of English little better than the negroes in Jamaica. I could pity the P.R., I mean the, Chevalier himself, for having so many desperadoes about him. And they learn their trade so early. There is a kind of subaltern imp, for example, a sort of sucking devil, whom your friend Glenna, Glenamuck there, has sometimes in his train. To look at him, he is about fifteen years. But he is a century old in mischief and villainy. He was playing at quoits the other day in the court, a gentleman, a decent-looking person enough, came past, and as a quoit hit his shin, he lifted his cane. But my young bravo whips out his pistol, like Beau Clincher in the trip to the Jubilee and had not a scream of guard as low from an upper window set all parties a scampering for fear of the inevitable consequences. The poor gentleman would have lost his life by the hands of that little cockatrice. A fine character you'll give of Scotland upon your return, Colonel Talbot. Oh, just as shallow, said the colonel, will save me the trouble, baron, baron, beggars all, beggars all. Mary, good air, and that only when you're fairly out of Edinburgh, and not yet come to Leith, as is our case at present. In a short time they arrived at the seaport. The boat rocked at the pier of Leith. Full loud the wind blew down the ferry. The ship rode at the barrack law. 
Farewell, Colonel, may you find all as you would wish it. Perhaps we may meet sooner than you expect, they talk of an immediate route to England. Tell me nothing of that, said Talbot. I wish to carry no news of your motions. Simply, then, adieu. Say, with a thousand kind greetings, all that is dutiful and affectionate to Sir Everard and Aunt Rachel. Think of me as kindly as you can, speak of me as indulgently as your conscience will permit, and once more adieu. And adieu, my dear Waverley, many, many thanks for your kindness. Unplayed yourself on the first opportunity. I shall ever think on you with gratitude, and the worst of my censure shall be, K. Diable Aloitiel fair dawn set galere? And thus they parted, Colonel Talbot going on board of the boat and Waverley returning to Edinburgh. Chapter 28 The March It is not our purpose to intrude upon the province of history. We shall therefore only remind our readers that about the beginning of November the young Chevalier, at the head of about six thousand men at the utmost, resolved to peril his cause on an attempt to penetrate into the center of England. Although aware of the mighty preparations which were made for his reception, they set forward on this crusade in weather which would have rendered any other troops incapable of marching, but which in reality gave these active mountaineers advantages over a less hardy enemy. In defiance of a superior army lying upon the borders, under Field Marshal Wade, they besieged and took Carlisle, and soon afterwards prosecuted their daring march to the southward. As Colonel MacIver's regiment marched in the van of the clans, he and Waverley, who now equaled any Highlander in the endurance of fatigue, and was become somewhat acquainted with their language, were perpetually at its head. They marked the progress of the army, however, with very different eyes. Fergus, all air and fire, and confident against the world in arms, measured nothing but that every step was a yard nearer London. He neither asked, expected, nor desired any aid except that of the clans to place the Stuarts once more on the throne. And when by chance a few adherents joined the standard, he always considered them in the light of new claimants upon the favors of the future monarch, who, he concluded, must therefore subtract for their gratification so much of the bounty which ought to be shared among his highland followers. Edward's views were very different. He could not but observe that in those towns in which they proclaimed James III, no man cried, God bless him. The mob stared and listened, heartless, stupefied, and dull, but gave few signs even of that boisterous spirit which induces them to shout upon all occasions for the mere exercise of their most sweet voices. The Jacobites had been taught to believe that the northwestern counties abounded with wealthy squires and hardy yeomen, devoted to the cause of the White Rose. But of the wealthier Tories they saw little. Some fled from their houses, some feigned themselves sick, some surrendered themselves to the government as suspected persons. Of such as remained, the ignorant gazed with astonishment, mixed with horror and aversion, at the wild appearance, unknown language, and singular garb of the Scottish clans. And to the more prudent their scanty numbers, apparent deficiency in discipline, and poverty of equipment seemed certain tokens of the calamitous termination of their rash undertaking. Thus the few who joined them were such as bigotry of political principle blinded to consequences, or whose broken fortunes induced them to hazard all on a risk so desperate. The Baron of Bradwardeen, being asked what he thought of these recruits, took a long pinch of snuff, and answered drilly, that he could not but have an excellent opinion of them. Since they resembled precisely the followers who attached themselves to the good King David at the cave of Adullam, Videlicet, every one that was in distress, and every one that was in debt, and every one that was discontented. Which the Vulgate renders bitter of soul. And doubtless, he said, they will prove mighty men of their hands, and there is much need that they should, for I have seen many a sour look cast upon us. But none of these considerations moved Fergus. He admired the luxuriant beauty of the country, and the situation of many of the seats which they passed. Is Waverley Honour like that house, Edward? It is one half larger. Is your uncle's park as fine a one as that? It is three times as extensive, and rather resembles a forest than a mere park. Flora will be a happy woman. I hope Miss MacIver will have much reason for happiness unconnected with Waverley Honour. I hope so too. But to be mistress of such a place will be a pretty addition to the sum total. An addition, the want of which, I trust, will be amply supplied by some other means. 
How, said Fergus, stopping short and turning upon Waverley, how am I to understand that, Mr. Waverley? Had I the pleasure to hear you aright? Perfectly right, Fergus. And am I to understand that you no longer desire my alliance and my sister's hand? Your sister has refused mine, said Waverley, both directly and by all the usual means by which ladies repress undesired attentions. I have no idea, answered the chieftain, of a lady dismissing or a gentleman withdrawing his suit, after it has been approved of by her legal guardian, without giving him an opportunity of talking the matter over with the lady. You did not, I suppose, expect my sister to drop into your mouth like a ripe plum the first moment you chose to open it? As to the lady's title to dismiss her lover, Colonel, replied Edward, it is a point which you must argue with her, as I am ignorant of the customs of the Highlands in that particular. But as to my title to acquiesce in a rejection from her without an appeal to your interest, I will tell you plainly, without meaning to undervalue Miss MacIver's admitted beauty and accomplishments, that I would not take the hand of an angel. With an empire for her dowry, if her consent were extorted by the importunity of friends and guardians, and did not flow from her own free inclination. An angel, with the dowry of an empire, repeated Fergus, in a tone of bitter irony, is not very likely to be pressed upon a shire squire. But, sir, changing his tone, if Flora MacIver have not the dowry of an empire, she is my sister. And that is sufficient at least to secure her against being treated with anything approaching to levity. She is Flora MacIver, sir, said Waverley, with firmness, which to me, were I capable of treating any woman with levity, would be a more effectual protection. The brow of the chieftain was now fully clouded. But Edward felt too indignant at the unreasonable tone which he had adopted to avert the storm by the least concession. They both stood still while this short dialogue passed, and Fergus seemed half disposed to say something more violent, but, by a strong effort, suppressed his passion, and, turning his face forward, walked sullenly on. As they had always hitherto walked together, and almost constantly side by side, Waverley pursued his course silently in the same direction. Determined to let the chief take his own time in recovering the good humor which he had so unreasonably discarded, and firm in his resolution not to bait him an inch of dignity. After they had marched on in this sullen manner about a mile, Fergus resumed the discourse in a different tone. I believe I was warm, my dear Edward, but you provoke me with your want of knowledge of the world. You have taken pet at some of Flora's prudery, or high flying notions of loyalty, and now, like a child, you quarrel with the plaything you have been crying for, and beat me, your faithful keeper. Because my arm cannot reach to Edinburgh to hand it to you. I am sure, if I was passionate, the mortification of losing the alliance of such a friend, after your arrangement had been the talk of both Highlands and Lowlands, and that without so much as knowing why or wherefore, might well provoke calmer blood than mine. I shall write to Edinburgh and put all to rights, that is, if you desire I should do so as indeed I cannot suppose that your good opinion of Flora, it being such as you have often expressed to me, can be at once laid aside. Colonel MacIver, said Edward, who had no mind to be hurried farther or faster than he chose in a matter which he had already considered as broken off, I am fully sensible of the value of your good offices. And certainly, by your zeal on my behalf in such an affair, you do me no small honor. But as Miss MacIver has made her election freely and voluntarily, and as all my attentions in Edinburgh were received with more than coldness, I cannot, in justice either to her or myself, consent that she should again be harassed upon this topic. I would have mentioned this to you some time since, but you saw the footing upon which we stood together, and must have understood it. Had I thought otherwise I would have earlier spoken. But I had a natural reluctance to enter upon a subject so painful to us both. Oh, very well, Mr. Waverley, said Fergus, haughtily, the thing is at an end. I have no occasion to press my sister upon any man. Nor have I any occasion to court repeated rejection from the same young lady, answered Edward, in the same tone. I shall make due inquiry, however, said the chieftain, without noticing the interruption, and learn what my sister thinks of all this, we will then see whether it is to end here. Respecting such inquiries, you will of course be guided by your own judgment, said Waverley. It is, I am aware, impossible Miss MacIver can change her mind, and were such an unsupposable case to happen, it is certain I will not change mine. 
I only mention this to prevent any possibility of future misconstruction. Gladly at this moment would MacIver have put their quarrel to a personal arbitrament, his eye flashed fire, and he measured Edward as if to choose where he might best plant a mortal wound. But although we do not now quarrel according to the modes and figures of Carranza or Vincent Saviola, no one knew better than Fergus that there must be some decent pretext for a mortal duel. For instance, you may challenge a man for treading on your corn in a crowd, or for pushing you up to the wall, or for taking your seat in the theater. But the modern code of honor will not permit you to found a quarrel upon your right of compelling a man to continue addresses to a female relative which the fair lady has already refused. So that Fergus was compelled to stomach this supposed affront until the whirligig of time, whose motion he promised himself he would watch most sedulously, should bring about an opportunity of revenge. Waverley's servant always led a saddle horse for him in the rear of the battalion to which he was attached, though his master seldom rode. But now, incensed at the domineering and unreasonable conduct of his late friend, he fell behind the column and mounted his horse, resolving to seek the Baron of Bradwardine and request permission to volunteer in his troop instead of the MacIver regiment. A happy time of it I should have had, thought he, after he was mounted, to have been so closely allied to this superb specimen of pride and self-opinion and passion. A colonel. Why, he should have been a generalissimo. A petty chief of three or four hundred men. His pride might suffice for the cham of Tartary, the Grand Seigneur, the Great Mogul. I am well free of him. Were Flora an angel, she would bring with her a second Lucifer of ambition and wrath for a brother-in-law. The Baron, whose learning, like Sancho's jests while in the Sierra Morina, seemed to grow moldy for want of exercise, joyfully embraced the opportunity of Waverley's offering his service in his regiment, to bring it into some exertion. The good-natured old gentleman, however, labored to effect a reconciliation between the two quondam friends. Fergus turned a cold ear to his remonstrances, though he gave them a respectful hearing. And as for Waverley, he saw no reason why he should be the first in courting a renewal of the intimacy which the chieftain had so unreasonably disturbed. The baron then mentioned the matter to the prince, anxious to prevent quarrels in his little army, declared he would himself remonstrate with Colonel MacIver on the unreasonableness of his conduct. But, in the hurry of their march, it was a day or two before he had an opportunity to exert his influence in the manner proposed. In the meanwhile Waverley turned the instructions he had received while in Gardiner's dragoons to some account, and assisted the baron in his command as a sort of adjutant. Parmi les avogles unborn est roi, says the French proverb. And the cavalry, which consisted chiefly of lowland gentlemen, their tenants and servants, formed a high opinion of Waverley's skill and a great attachment to his person. This was indeed partly owing to the satisfaction which they felt at the distinguished English volunteers leaving the Highlanders to rank among them. For there was a latent grudge between the horse and foot, not only owing to the difference of the services, but because most of the gentlemen, living near the Highlands, had at one time or other had quarrels with the tribes in their vicinity. And all of them looked with a jealous eye on the Highlanders' avowed pretensions to superior valor and utility in the prince's service. Chapter 29 the confusion of King Agramont's camp. It was Waverley's custom sometimes to ride a little apart from the main body, to look at any object of curiosity which occurred on the march. They were now in Lancashire, when, attracted by a castellated old hall, he left the squadron for half an hour to take a survey and slight sketch of it. As he returned down the avenue he was met by Ensign Macambich. This man had contracted a sort of regard for Edward since the day of his first seeing him at Tully Veolan and introducing him to the Highlands. He seemed to loiter, as if on purpose to meet with our hero. Yet, as he passed him, he only approached his stirrup and pronounced the single word, beware, and then walked swiftly on, shunning all further communication. Edward, somewhat surprised at this hint, followed with his eyes the course of Evan, who speedily disappeared among the trees. His servant, Alec Polworth, who was in attendance, also looked after the Highlander, and then riding up close to his master, said, The ne'er be in me, sir, if I think you're safe among the Highland Rinderouts. What do you mean, Alec? said Waverley. The MacIvers, sir, hae gotten it into their heads that ye hae affronted their young leddy, Miss Flora, and I hae heard may than ain say, they wadna tack muckle to mac a black cock o ye. 
And ye can well enough there's money o oh, them wadna mind a bobby the wising a ball through the prince himself, and the chief gi them the wink, or whether he did or no, if they thought it a thing that would please him when it was doon. Waverley, though confident that Fergus MacIver was incapable of such treachery, was by no means equally sure of the forbearance of his followers. He knew that, where the honor of the chief or his family was supposed to be touched, the happiest man would be he that could first avenge the stigma. And he had often heard them quote a proverb, that the best revenge was the most speedy and most safe. Coupling this with the hint of Evan, he judged it most prudent to set spurs to his horse and ride briskly back to the squadron. Ere he reached the end of the long avenue, however, a ball whistled past him, and the report of a pistol was heard. It was that devil's buckle, Callum Beg, said Alec, I saw him whisk away through a mangaresas. Edward, justly incensed at this act of treachery, galloped out of the avenue, and observed the battalion of MacIver at some distance moving along the common in which it terminated. He also saw an individual running very fast to join the party. This he concluded was the intended assassin, who, by leaping an enclosure, might easily make a much shorter path to the main body than he could find on horseback. Unable to contain himself, he commanded Alec to go to the Baron of Bradwardine, who was at the head of his regiment about half a mile in front, and acquaint him with what had happened. He himself immediately rode up to Fergus's regiment. The chief himself was in the act of joining them. He was on horseback, having returned from waiting on the prince. On perceiving Edward approaching, he put his horse in motion towards him. Colonel MacIver, said Waverley, without any farther salutation, I have to inform you that one of your people has this instant fired at me from a lurking place. As that, answered MacIver, accepting the circumstance of a lurking place, is a pleasure which I presently propose to myself, I should be glad to know which of my clansmen dared to anticipate me. I shall certainly be at your command whenever you please, the gentleman who took your office upon himself is your page there, Callum Beg. Stand forth from the ranks, Callum. Did you fire at Mr. Waverley? No, answered the unblushing Callum. You did, said Alec Polworth, who was already returned, having met a trooper by whom he dispatched an account of what was going forward to the Baron of Bradwardine, while he himself returned to his master at full gallop. Neither sparing the rowels of his spurs nor the sides of his horse. You did, I saw you as plainly as I ever saw the Auld Kirk at Cowdingham. You lie, replied Callum, with his usual impenetrable obstinacy. The combat between the knights would certainly, as in the days of chivalry, have been preceded by an encounter between the squires, for Alec was a stout-hearted merceman, and feared the bow of Cupid far more than a Highlander's Dirk or Claymore. But Fergus, with his usual tone of decision, demanded Callum's pistol. The cock was down, the pan and muzzle were black with the smoke, it had been that instant fired. Take that, said Fergus, striking the boy upon the head with the heavy pistol butt with his whole force, take that for acting without orders, and lying to disguise it. Callum received the blow without appearing to flinch from it, and fell without sign of life. Stand still, upon your lives, said Fergus to the rest of the clan, I blow out the brains of the first man who interferes between Mr. Waverley and me. They stood motionless, Evan Dhu alone showed symptoms of vexation and anxiety. Callum lay on the ground bleeding copiously, but no one ventured to give him any assistance. It seemed as if he had gotten his death blow. And now for you, Mr. Waverley. Please to turn your horse twenty yards with me upon the common. Waverley complied. And Fergus, confronting him when they were a little way from the line of march, said, with great affected coolness, I could not but wonder, sir, at the fickleness of taste which you were pleased to express the other day. But it was not an angel, as you justly observed, who had charms for you, unless she brought an empire for her fortune. I have now an excellent commentary upon that obscure text. I am at a loss even to guess at your meaning, Colonel MacIver, unless it seems plain that you intend to fasten a quarrel upon me. Your affected ignorance shall not serve you, sir. The prince, the prince himself has acquainted me with your maneuvers. I little thought that your engagements with Miss Bradwardine were the reason of your breaking off your intended match with my sister. I suppose the information that the Baron had altered the destination of his estate was quite a sufficient reason for slighting your friend's sister and carrying off your friend's mistress. 
Did the prince tell you I was engaged to Miss Bradwardine? said Waverley. Impossible. He did, sir, answered MacIver, so either draw and defend yourself or resign your pretensions to the lady. This is absolute madness, exclaimed Waverley, or some strange mistake. Oh, no evasion. Draw your sword, said the infuriated chieftain, his own already unsheathed. Must I fight in a madman's quarrel? Then give up now, and forever, all pretensions to Miss Bradwardine's hand. What title have you, cried Waverley, utterly losing command of himself, what title have you, or any man living, to dictate such terms to me? And he also drew his sword. At this moment the Baron of Bradwardine, followed by several of his troop, came up on the spur, some from curiosity, others to take part in the quarrel which they indistinctly understood had broken out between the MacIvers and their corps. The clan, seeing them approach, put themselves in motion to support their chieftain, and a scene of confusion commenced which seemed likely to terminate in bloodshed. A hundred tongues were in motion at once. The baron lectured, the chieftain stormed, the highlanders screamed in Gaelic, the horsemen cursed and swore in lowland scotch. At length matters came to such a pass that the baron threatened to charge the MacIvers unless they resumed their ranks, and many of them, in return, presented their firearms at him and the other troopers. The confusion was privately fostered by old Ballancurrick, who made no doubt that his own day of vengeance was arrived, when, behold, a cry arose of, Room! Make way! Place a Monsignor! Place a Monsignor! This announced the approach of the prince, who came up with a party of Fitzjames's foreign dragoons that acted as his bodyguard. His arrival produced some degree of order. The Highlanders reassumed their ranks, the cavalry fell in and formed squadron, and the baron and chieftain were silent. The prince called them and Waverley before him. Having heard the original cause of the quarrel through the villainy of Callum Beg, he ordered him into custody of the provost marshal for immediate execution, in the event of his surviving the chastisement inflicted by his chieftain. Fergus, however, in a tone betwixt claiming a right and asking a favor, requested he might be left to his disposal and promised his punishment should be exemplary. To deny this might have seemed to encroach on the patriarchal authority of the chieftains, of which they were very jealous, and they were not persons to be disobliged. Callum was therefore left to the justice of his own tribe. The prince next demanded to know the new cause of quarrel between Colonel MacIver and Waverley. There was a pause. Both gentlemen found the presence of the Baron of Bradwardine, for by this time all three had approached the Chevalier by his command, an insurmountable barrier against entering upon a subject where the name of his daughter must unavoidably be mentioned. They turned their eyes on the ground, with looks in which shame and embarrassment were mingled with displeasure. The prince, who had been educated amongst the discontented and mutinous spirits of the court of Esti. Germains, where feuds of every kind were the daily subject of solicitude to the dethroned sovereign, had served his apprenticeship, as old Frederick of Prussia would have said, to the trade of royalty. To promote or restore concord among his followers was indispensable. Accordingly he took his measures. Monsieur de Beaujou. Monseigneur, said a very handsome French cavalry officer who was in attendance. I as la bonte d'Aligner ces Montagnards la, ainsi que la cavalerie, sil vous plate, et de les remettre à la marque. Vous parlez si bien el angua, c'est la ni vous donneroit pas beaucoup de pain. Ah! Pas du tout, Monsignor, replied Mons. Le Comte de Beaujou, his head bending down to the neck of his little prancing highly managed charger. Accordingly he piaffed away, in high spirits and confidence, to the head of Fergus's regiment, although understanding not a word of Gaelic and very little English. Messrs Les Sauvages Acassais, that is, gentlemen savages, have the goodness de arranger vous. The clan, comprehending the order more from the gesture than the words, and seeing the prince himself present, hastened to dress their ranks. Ah! Ver well. Dad is fort bien, said the Comte de Beaujou. Gentlemen sauvages. Mais, trace bien. Eh bien. Chuest ce que vous appelez visage, monsieur? To a lounging trooper who stood by him. Ah, we. Oui. Face. J. E. Vous remercie, monsieur. Gentlechams, 
have de goodness to make de face to de right par file, dat is, by files. Marsh. Mays, tres bien, encore, messers, il faut vous mettre à la marque. Marche donc, au nom de Dieu, parce que j'ai oublié le mot anglais. Mays vous eats de braves gens, et me comprenez tres bien. The count next hastened to put the cavalry in motion. Gentlemen's cavalry, you must fall in. Ah. Par ma foi, I did not say fall off. I am afeard the little gross fat gentleman is moche hurt. Ah, mon dieu. C'est le commissaire que nous a port les premières nouvelles de C.E. Maudit Fracas. Je suis trop fâche, monsieur. But poor Macweeble, who, with a sword stuck across him, and a white cockade as large as a pancake, now figured in the character of a commissary. Being overturned in the bustle occasioned by the troopers hastening to get themselves in order in the prince's presence, before he could rally his galloway, slunk to the rear amid the unrestrained laughter of the spectators. Eh bien, Messrs, will to de right. Ah! Dad is it. Eh, Monsieur de Bradradine, I as la bonte de vous mettre à la tête de votre regiment, car, pardieu, jnn pouce plus. The Baron of Bradradine was obliged to go to the assistance of Monsieur de Beaujou, after he had fairly expended his few English military phrases. One purpose of the Chevalier was thus answered. The other he proposed was, that in the eagerness to hear and comprehend commands issued through such an indistinct medium in his own presence. The thoughts of the soldiers in both corps might get a current different from the angry channel in which they were flowing at the time. Charles Edward was no sooner left with the chieftain and Waverley, the rest of his attendants being at some distance, than he said, If I owed less to your disinterested friendship. I could be most seriously angry with both of you for this very extraordinary and causeless broil, at a moment when my father's service so decidedly demands the most perfect unanimity. But the worst of my situation is, that my very best friends hold they have liberty to ruin themselves, as well as the cause they are engaged in, upon the slightest caprice. Both the young men protested their resolution to submit every difference to his arbitration. Indeed, said Edward, I hardly know of what I am accused. I sought Colonel MacIver merely to mention to him that I had narrowly escaped assassination at the hand of his immediate dependent, a dastardly revenge which I knew him to be incapable of authorizing. As to the cause for which he is disposed to fasten a quarrel upon me, I am ignorant of it, unless it be that he accuses me, most unjustly, of having engaged the affections of a young lady in prejudice of his pretensions. If there is an error, said the chieftain, it arises from a conversation which I held this morning with His Royal Highness himself. With me, said the Chevalier, how can Colonel MacIver have so far misunderstood me? He then led Fergus aside, and, after five minutes' earnest conversation, spurred his horse towards Edward. Is it possible, nay, ride up, Colonel, for I desire no secrets, is it possible, Mr. Waverley, that I am mistaken in supposing that you are an accepted lover of Miss Bradwardine? A fact of which I was by circumstances, though not by communication from you, so absolutely convinced that I alleged it to Vich Ian Vore this morning as a reason why, without offence to him. You might not continue to be ambitious of an alliance which, to an unengaged person, even though once repulsed, holds out too many charms to be lightly laid aside. Your Royal Highness, said Waverley, must have found it on circumstances altogether unknown to me, when you did me the distinguished honor of supposing me an accepted lover of Miss Bradwardine. I feel the distinction implied in the supposition, but I have no title to it. For the rest, my confidence in my own merit is too justly slight to admit of my hoping for success in any quarter after positive rejection. The Chevalier was silent for a moment, looking steadily at them both, and then said, Upon my word, Mr. Waverley, you are a less happy man than I conceived I had very good reason to believe you. But now, gentlemen, allow me to be umpire in this matter, not as Prince Regent but as Charles Stuart, a brother adventurer with you in the same gallant cause. Lay my pretensions to be obeyed by you entirely out of view, and consider your own honor and how far it is well or becoming to give our enemies the advantage and our friends the scandal of showing that, few as we are, we are not united. And forgive me if I add, that the names of the ladies who have been mentioned crave more respect from us all than to be made themes of discord. 
He took Fergus a little apart and spoke to him very earnestly for two or three minutes, and then returning to Waverley, said, I believe I have satisfied Colonel MacIver that his resentment was founded upon a misconception, to which, indeed, I myself gave rise. And I trust Mr. Waverley is too generous to harbor any recollection of what is past when I assure him that such is the case. You must state this matter properly to your clan, Vich Ian Vor, to prevent a recurrence of their precipitate violence. Fergus bowed. And now, gentlemen, let me have the pleasure to see you shake hands. They advanced coldly, and with measured steps, each apparently reluctant to appear most forward in concession. They did, however, shake hands, and parted, taking a respectful leave of the chevalier. Charles Edward then rode to the head of the MacIvers, threw himself from his horse, begged a drink out of old Balancurica's canteen, and marched about half a mile along with them, inquiring into the history and connections of Slyak Nan Iver. Adroitly using the few words of Gaelic he possessed, and affecting a great desire to learn it more thoroughly. He then mounted his horse once more, and galloped to the baron's cavalry, which was in front, halted them, and examined their accoutrements and state of discipline, took notice of the principal gentlemen, and even of the cadets. Inquired after their ladies, and commended their horses, rode about an hour with the Baron of Bradwardine, and endured three long stories about Field Marshal the Duke of Berwick. Ah, uh, Boju, mon cher ami, said he, as he returned to his usual place in the line of march, came on métier de prince errant est en wyant, parfois. Mais, courage. C'est le grand jeu, après tout. Chapter 30 A Skirmish The reader need hardly be reminded that, after a council of war held at Derby on the 5th of December, the Highlanders relinquished their desperate attempt to penetrate farther into England, and, greatly to the dissatisfaction of their young and daring leader, positively determined to return northward. They commenced their retreat accordingly, and, by the extreme celerity of their movements, outstripped the motions of the Duke of Cumberland, who now pursued them with a very large body of cavalry. This retreat was a virtual resignation of their towering hopes. None had been so sanguine as Fergus MacIver, none, consequently, was so cruelly mortified at the change of measures. He argued, or rather remonstrated, with the utmost vehemence at the council of war, and, when his opinion was rejected, shed tears of grief and indignation. From that moment his whole manner was so much altered that he could scarcely have been recognized for the same soaring and ardent spirit, for whom the whole earth seemed too narrow but a week before. The retreat had continued for several days, when Edward, to his surprise, early on the 12th of December, received a visit from the chieftain in his quarters, in a hamlet about halfway between Shap and Penrith. Having had no intercourse with the chieftain since their rupture, Edward waited with some anxiety an explanation of this unexpected visit, nor could he help being surprised, and somewhat shocked, with the change in his appearance. His eye had lost much of its fire, his cheek was hollow, his voice was languid, even his gait seemed less firm and elastic than it was wont, and his dress, to which he used to be particularly attentive, was now carelessly flung about him. He invited Edward to walk out with him by the little river in the vicinity, and smiled in a melancholy manner when he observed him take down and buckle on his sword. As soon as they were in a wild sequestered path by the side of the stream, the chief broke out, Our fine adventure is now totally ruined, Waverley, and I wish to know what you intend to do, nay, never stare at me, man. I tell you I received a packet from my sister yesterday, and, had I got the information it contained sooner, it would have prevented a quarrel which I am always vexed when I think of. In a letter written after our dispute, I acquainted her with the cause of it, and she now replies to me that she never had, nor could have, any purpose of giving you encouragement, so that it seems I have acted like a madman. Poor Flora! She writes in high spirits, what a change will the news of this unhappy retreat make in her state of mind. Waverley, who was really much affected by the deep tone of melancholy with which Fergus spoke, affectionately entreated him to banish from his remembrance any unkindness which had arisen between them, and they once more shook hands. But now with sincere cordiality. Fergus again inquired of Waverley what he intended to do. Had you not better leave this luckless army, and get down before us into Scotland, and embark for the continent from some of the eastern ports that are still in our possession? When you are out of the kingdom, your friends will easily negotiate your pardon, and, to tell you the truth, 
I wish you would carry Rose Bradwardine with you as your wife, and take Flora also under your joint protection. Edward looked surprised. She loves you, and I believe you love her, though, perhaps, you have not found it out, for you are not celebrated for knowing your own mind very pointedly. He said this with a sort of smile. How, answered Edward, can you advise me to desert the expedition in which we are all embarked? Embarked, said Fergus, the vessel is going to pieces, and it is full time for all who can to get into the long boat and leave her. Why, what will other gentlemen do, answered Waverley, and why did the Highland chiefs consent to this retreat if it is so ruinous? Oh, replied Mac Ivor, they think that, as on former occasions, the heading, hanging, and forfeiting will chiefly fall to the lot of the lowland gentry. That they will be left secure in their poverty and their fastnesses, there, according to their proverb, to listen to the wind upon the hill till the waters abate. But they will be disappointed. They have been too often troublesome to be so repeatedly passed over, and this time John Bull has been too heartily frightened to recover his good humor for some time. The Hanoverian ministers always deserve to be hanged for rascals. But now, if they get the power in their hands, as, sooner or later, they must, since there is neither rising in England nor assistance from France. They will deserve the gallows as fools if they leave a single clan in the highlands in a situation to be again troublesome to government. I, they will make rude and branch work, I warrant them. And while you recommend flight to me, said Edward, a counsel which I would rather die than embrace, what are your own views? Oh, answered Fergus, with a melancholy air, my fate is settled. Dead or captive I must be before tomorrow. What do you mean by that, my friend? said Edward. The enemy is still a day's march in our rear, and if he comes up, we are still strong enough to keep him in check. Remember Gladsmere. What I tell you is true notwithstanding, so far as I am individually concerned. Upon what authority can you found so melancholy a prediction? asked Waverley. On one which never failed a person of my house. I have seen, he said, lowering his voice, I have seen the Bodak glass. Bodak glass? Yes. Have you been so long at Glenacoich, and never heard of the Grey Spectre? Though indeed there is a certain reluctance among us to mention him. No, never. Ah. It would have been a tale for poor Flora to have told you. Or, if that hill were Benmore, and that long blue lake, which you see just winding towards yon mountainous country, were Loch Tay, or my own Loch and Ree, the tale would be better suited with scenery. However, let us sit down on this knoll. Even Saddleback and Ullswater will suit what I have to say better than the English hedgerows, enclosures, and farmhouses. You must know, then, that when my ancestor, Ian Nan Chastel, wasted Northumberland, there was associated with him in the expedition a sort of Southland chief, or captain of a band of lowlanders, called Halbert Hall. In their return through the Cheviots they quarreled about the division of the great booty they had acquired and came from words to blows. The lowlanders were cut off to a man, and their chief fell the last, covered with wounds by the sword of my ancestor. Since that time his spirit has crossed the vich Ian vor of the day when any great disaster was impending, but especially before approaching death. My father saw him twice, once before he was made prisoner at Sheriff Muir, another time on the morning of the day on which he died. How can you, my dear Fergus, tell such nonsense with a grave face? I do not ask you to believe it. But I tell you the truth, ascertained by three hundred years' experience at least, and last night by my own eyes. The particulars, for heaven's sake, said Waverley, with eagerness. I will, on condition you will not attempt a jest on the subject. Since this unhappy retreat commenced I have scarce ever been able to sleep for thinking of my clan, and of this poor prince, whom they are leading back like a dog in a string, whether he will or no and of the downfall of my family. Last night I felt so feverish that I left my quarters and walked out, in hopes the keen frosty air would brace my nerves, I cannot tell how much I dislike going on, for I know you will hardly believe me. However, I crossed a small footbridge, and kept walking backwards and forwards, when I observed with surprise by the clear moonlight a tall figure in a grey plaid, such as shepherds wear in the south of Scotland, which, move at what pace I would kept regularly about four yards before me. You saw a Cumberland peasant in his ordinary dress, probably. No, 
I thought so at first, and was astonished at the man's audacity in daring to dog me. I called to him, but received no answer. I felt an anxious throbbing at my heart, and to ascertain what I dreaded, I stood still and turned myself on the same spot successively to the four points of the compass. By heaven, Edward, turn where I would, the figure was instantly before my eyes, at precisely the same distance. I was then convinced it was the Bodak glass. My hair bristled and my knees shook. I manned myself, however, and determined to return to my quarters. My ghastly visitant glided before me, for I cannot say he walked, until he reached the footbridge, there he stopped and turned full round. I must either wade the river or pass him as close as I am to you. A desperate courage, founded on the belief that my death was near, made me resolve to make my way in despite of him. I made the sign of the cross, drew my sword, and uttered, in the name of God, evil spirit, give place. Vich Ian Vor, it said, in a voice that made my very blood curdle, beware of tomorrow. It seemed at that moment not half a yard from my sword's point, but the words were no sooner spoken than it was gone, and nothing appeared further to obstruct my passage. I got home and threw myself on my bed, where I spent a few hours heavily enough, and this morning, as no enemy was reported to be near us, I took my horse and rode forward to make up matters with you. I would not willingly fall until I am in charity with a wronged friend. Edward had little doubt that this phantom was the operation of an exhausted frame and depressed spirits, working on the belief common to all Highlanders in such superstitions. He did not the less pity Fergus, for whom, in his present distress, he felt all his former regard revive. With the view of diverting his mind from these gloomy images, he offered, with the baron's permission, which he knew he could readily obtain, to remain in his quarters till Fergus's corps should come up, and then to march with them as usual. The chief seemed much pleased, yet hesitated to accept the offer. We are, you know, in the rear, the post of danger in a retreat. And therefore the post of honor. Well, replied the chieftain, let Alec have your horse in readiness, in case we should be overmatched, and I shall be delighted to have your company once more. The rearguard were late in making their appearance, having been delayed by various accidents and by the badness of the roads. At length they entered the hamlet. When Waverley joined the clan MacIver, arm in arm with their chieftain, all the resentment they had entertained against him seemed blown off at once. Evan Dhu received him with a grin of congratulation. And even Callum, who was running about as active as ever, pale indeed, and with a great patch on his head, appeared delighted to see him. That gallows bird's skull, said Fergus, must be harder than marble. The lock of the pistol was actually broken. How could you strike so young a lad so hard, said Waverley, with some interest. Why, if I did not strike hard sometimes, the rascals would forget themselves. They were now in full march, every caution being taken to prevent surprise. Fergus's people, and a fine clan regiment from Badenoch, commanded by Clooney Macpherson, had the rear. They had passed a large open moor, and were entering into the enclosures which surround a small village called Clifton. The winter sun had set, and Edward began to rally Fergus upon the false predictions of the Grey Spirit. The Ides of March are not past, said Mac Ivor, with a smile, when, suddenly casting his eyes back on the moor, a large body of cavalry was indistinctly seen to hover upon its brown and dark surface. To line the enclosures facing the open ground and the road by which the enemy must move from it upon the village was the work of a short time. While these maneuvers were accomplishing, night sunk down, dark and gloomy, though the moon was at full. Sometimes, however, she gleamed forth a dubious light upon the scene of action. The Highlanders did not long remain undisturbed in the defensive position they had adopted. Favored by the night, one large body of dismounted dragoons attempted to force the enclosures, while another, equally strong, strove to penetrate by the high road. Both were received by such a heavy fire as disconcerted their ranks and effectually checked their progress. Unsatisfied with the advantage thus gained, Fergus, to whose ardent spirit the approach of danger seemed to restore all its elasticity, drawing his sword and calling out, Claymore. Encouraged his men, by voice and example, to break through the hedge which divided them and rush down upon the enemy. Mingling with the dismounted dragoons, they forced them, at the sword point, to fly to the open moor, 
where a considerable number were cut to pieces. But the moon, which suddenly shone out, showed to the English the small number of assailants, disordered by their own success. Two squadrons of horse moving to the support of their companions, the Highlanders endeavored to recover the enclosures. But several of them, amongst others their brave chieftain, were cut off and surrounded before they could effect their purpose. Waverley, looking eagerly for Fergus, from whom, as well as from the retreating body of his followers, he had been separated in the darkness and tumult, saw him, with Evan Dhu and Callum, defending themselves desperately against a dozen of horsemen, who were hewing at them with their long broadswords. The moon was again at that moment totally overclouded, and Edward, in the obscurity, could neither bring aid to his friends nor discover which way lay his own road to rejoin the rearguard. After once or twice narrowly escaping being slain or made prisoner by parties of the cavalry whom he encountered in the darkness, he at length reached an enclosure, and, clambering over it, concluded himself in safety and on the way to the highland forces, whose pipes he heard at some distance. For Fergus hardly a hope remained, unless that he might be made prisoner. Revolving his fate with sorrow and anxiety, the superstition of the Bodak glass recurred to Edward's recollection, and he said to himself, with internal surprise, what, can the devil speak truth? Chapter 31 Chapter of Accidents Edward was in a most unpleasant and dangerous situation. He soon lost the sound of the bagpipes. And, what was yet more unpleasant, when, after searching long in vain and scrambling through many enclosures, he at length approached the high road, he learned, from the unwelcome noise of kettle drums and trumpets, that the English cavalry now occupied it, and consequently were between him and the Highlanders. Precluded, therefore, from advancing in a straight direction, he resolved to avoid the English military and endeavor to join his friends by making a circuit to the left, for which a beaten path, deviating from the main road in that direction, seemed to afford facilities. The path was muddy and the night dark and cold, but even these inconveniences were hardly felt amidst the apprehensions which falling into the hands of the king's forces reasonably excited in his bosom. After walking about three miles, he at length reached a hamlet. Conscious that the common people were in general unfavorable to the cause he had espoused, yet desirous, if possible, to procure a horse and guide to Penrith, where he hoped to find the rear, if not the main body, of the Chevalier's army. He approached the alehouse of the place. There was a great noise within, he paused to listen. A round English oath or two, and the burden of a campaign song convinced him the hamlet also was occupied by the Duke of Cumberland's soldiers. Endeavoring to retire from it as softly as possible, and blessing the obscurity which hitherto he had murmured against, Waverley groped his way the best he could along a small paling, which seemed the boundary of some cottage garden. As he reached the gate of this little enclosure, his outstretched hand was grasped by that of a female, whose voice at the same time uttered, Edward, is thou, man? Here is some unlucky mistake, thought Edward struggling, but gently, to disengage himself. Nain o oh, thy found, now, man, or the red quotes will hear thee. They hae been howlering and poolering every ain that passed alehouse door this noit to make them drive their wagons and sick loik. Come into fathers, or they'll do ho a mischief. A good hint, thought Waverley, following the girl through the little garden into a brick-paved kitchen, where she set herself to kindle a match at an expiring fire and with the match to light a candle. She had no sooner looked on Edward than she dropped the light, with a shrill scream of, Oh, Fayther, Fayther. The father, thus invoked, speedily appeared, a sturdy old farmer, in a pair of leather breeches, and boots pulled on without stockings, having just started from his bed. The rest of his dress was only a Westmoreland statesman's robe to chamber, that is, his shirt. His figure was displayed to advantage by a candle which he bore in his left hand, in his right he brandished a poker. What hast ho here, wench? Oh! cried the poor girl, almost going off in hysterics, I thought it was Ned Williams, and it is one of the plaid men. And what was the ganging to do why, Ned Williams at this time oh, noit? To this, which was, perhaps, one of the numerous class of questions more easily asked than answered, the rosy-cheeked damsel made no reply, but continued sobbing and wringing her hands. And thee, lad, dost ho know that the dragoons be a town? Dost ho know that, mon? Add, they'll sliver thee like a turnip, mon. 
I know my life is in great danger, said Waverley, but if you can assist me, I will reward you handsomely. I am no Scotchman, but an unfortunate English gentleman. Be ho Scot or no, said the honest farmer, I wish thou hadst kept the other side of the hallan. But since thou art here, Jacob Jobson will betray no man's blood. And the plaids were gay canny, and did not do so much mischief when they were here yesterday. Accordingly, he set seriously about sheltering and refreshing our hero for the night. The fire was speedily rekindled, but with precaution against its light being seen from without. The jolly yeoman cut a rasher of bacon, which Sicily soon broiled, and her father added a swinging tankard of his best ale. It was settled that Edward should remain there till the troops marched in the morning, then hire or buy a horse from the farmer, and, with the best directions that could be obtained, endeavor to overtake his friends. A clean, though coarse, bed received him after the fatigues of this unhappy day. With the morning arrived the news that the Highlanders had evacuated Penrith, and marched off towards Carlisle. That the Duke of Cumberland was in possession of Penrith, and that detachments of his army covered the roads in every direction. To attempt to get through undiscovered would be an act of the most frantic temerity. Ned Williams, the right Edward, was now called to counsel by Sicily and her father. Ned, who perhaps did not care that his handsome namesake should remain too long in the same house with his sweetheart, for fear of fresh mistakes, proposed that Waverley, exchanging his uniform and plaid for the dress of the country, should go with him to his father's farm near Ullswater, and remain in that undisturbed retirement until the military movements in the country should have ceased to render his departure hazardous. A price was also agreed upon, at which the stranger might board with Farmer Williams if he thought proper, till he could depart with safety. It was of moderate amount. The distress of his situation, among this honest and simple-hearted race, being considered as no reason for increasing their demand. The necessary articles of dress were accordingly procured, and, by following bypaths known to the young farmer, they hoped to escape any unpleasant rencontre. A recompense for their hospitality was refused peremptorily by old Jobson and his cherry-cheeked daughter, a kiss paid the one and a hearty shake of the hand the other. Both seemed anxious for their guest's safety, and took leave of him with kind wishes. In the course of their route Edward, with his guide, traversed those fields which the night before had been the scene of action. A brief gleam of December's sun shone sadly on the broad heath, which, towards the spot where the great northwest road entered the enclosures of Lord Lonsdale's property, exhibited dead bodies of men and horses, and the usual companions of war. A number of carrion crows, hawks, and ravens. And this, then, was thy last field, said Waverley to himself, his eye filling at the recollection of the many splendid points of Fergus's character, and of their former intimacy. All his passions and imperfections forgotten, here fell the last vich Ian Vore, on a nameless heath. And in an obscure night skirmish was quenched that ardent spirit, who thought it little to cut away for his master to the British throne. Ambition, policy, bravery, all far beyond their sphere, here learned the fate of mortals. The sole support, too, of a sister whose spirit, as proud and unbending, was even more exalted than thine own. Here ended all thy hopes for Flora, and the long and valued line which it was thy boast to raise yet more highly by thy adventurous valor. As these ideas pressed on Waverley's mind, he resolved to go upon the open heath and search if, among the slain, he could discover the body of his friend, with the pious intention of procuring for him the last rites of sepulture. The timorous young man who accompanied him remonstrated upon the danger of the attempt, but Edward was determined. The followers of the camp had already stripped the dead of all they could carry away. But the country people, and used to scenes of blood, had not yet approached the field of action, though some stood fearfully gazing at a distance. About sixty or seventy dragoons lay slain within the first enclosure, upon the highroad, and on the open moor. Of the highlanders, not above a dozen had fallen, chiefly those who, venturing too far on the moor, could not regain the strong ground he could not find the body of Fergus among the slain. On a little knoll, separated from the others, lay the carcasses of three English dragoons, two horses, and the page Callum Beg, whose hard skull a trooper's broadsword had, at length, effectually cloven. It was possible his clan had carried off the body of Fergus, but it was also possible he had escaped, especially as Evan D.H.U., who would never leave his chief, was not found among the dead. 
or he might be prisoner, and the less formidable denunciation inferred from the appearance of the Bodak glass might have proved the true one. The approach of a party sent for the purpose of compelling the country people to bury the dead, and who had already assembled several peasants for that purpose, now obliged Edward to rejoin his guide. Who awaited him in great anxiety and fear under shade of the plantations. After leaving this field of death, the rest of their journey was happily accomplished. At the house of Farmer Williams, Edward passed for a young kinsman, educated for the church, who was come to reside there till the civil tumults permitted him to pass through the country. This silenced suspicion among the kind and simple yeomanry of Cumberland, and accounted sufficiently for the grave manners and retired habits of the new guest. The precaution became more necessary than Waverley had anticipated, as a variety of incidents prolonged his stay at Fastweight, as the farm was called. A tremendous fall of snow rendered his departure impossible for more than ten days. When the roads began to become a little practicable, they successively received news of the retreat of the Chevalier into Scotland, then, that he had abandoned the frontiers, retiring upon Glasgow. And that the Duke of Cumberland had formed the siege of Carlisle. His army, therefore, cut off all possibility of Waverley's escaping into Scotland in that direction. On the eastern border Marshal Wade, with a large force, was advancing upon Edinburgh. And all along the frontier, parties of militia, volunteers, and partisans were in arms to suppress insurrection, and apprehend such stragglers from the Highland army as had been left in England. The surrender of Carlisle, and the severity with which the rebel garrison were threatened, soon formed an additional reason against venturing upon a solitary and hopeless journey through a hostile country and a large army. To carry the assistance of a single sword to a cause which seemed altogether desperate. In this lonely and secluded situation, without the advantage of company or conversation with men of cultivated minds, the arguments of Colonel Talbot often recurred to the mind of our hero. A still more anxious recollection haunted his slumbers, it was the dying look and gesture of Colonel Gardiner. Most devoutly did he hope, as the rarely occurring post brought news of skirmishes with various success, that it might never again be his lot to draw his sword in civil conflict. Then his mind turned to the supposed death of Fergus, to the desolate situation of Flora, and, with yet more tender recollection, to that of Rose Bradwardine, who was destitute of the devoted enthusiasm of loyalty. Which to her friend hallowed and exalted misfortune. These reveries he was permitted to enjoy, undisturbed by queries or interruption. And it was in many a winter walk by the shores of Ullswater that he acquired a more complete mastery of a spirit tamed by adversity than his former experience had given him. And that he felt himself entitled to say firmly, though perhaps with a sigh, that the romance of his life was ended, and that its real history had now commenced. He was soon called upon to justify his pretensions by reason and philosophy. Chapter 32. A Journey to London. The family at Fastweight were soon attached to Edward. He had, indeed, that gentleness and urbanity which almost universally attracts corresponding kindness. And to their simple ideas his learning gave him consequence, and his sorrows interest. The last he ascribed, evasively, to the loss of a brother in the skirmish near Clifton. And in that primitive state of society, where the ties of affection were highly deemed of, his continued depression excited sympathy, but not surprise. In the end of January his more lively powers were called out by the happy union of Edward Williams, the son of his host, with Cicely Jobson. Our hero would not cloud with sorrow the festivity attending the wedding of two persons to whom he was so highly obliged. He therefore exerted himself, danced, sung, played at the various games of the day, and was the blithest of the company. The next morning, however, he had more serious matters to think of. The clergyman who had married the young couple was so much pleased with the supposed student of divinity, that he came next day from Penrith on purpose to pay him a visit. This might have been a puzzling chapter had he entered into any examination of our hero's supposed theological studies, but fortunately he loved better to hear and communicate the news of the day. He brought with him two or three old newspapers, in one of which Edward found a piece of intelligence that soon rendered him deaf to every word which the Reverend Mr. Twigtithe was saying upon the news from the north, and the prospect of the Duke speedily overtaking and crushing the rebels. This was an article in these, or nearly these words. Died at his house, in Hill Street, Berkeley Square, upon the 10th INST, 
Richard Waverley, ESQ, second son of Sir Giles Waverley of Waverley Honor, etc. etc. He died of a lingering disorder, augmented by the unpleasant predicament of suspicion in which he stood, having been obliged to find bail to a high amount to meet an impending accusation of high treason. An accusation of the same grave crime hangs over his elder brother, Sir Everard Waverley, the representative of that ancient family. And we understand the day of his trial will be fixed early in the next month, unless Edward Waverley, son of the deceased Richard, and heir to the baronet, shall surrender himself to justice. In that case we are assured it is His Majesty's gracious purpose to drop further proceedings upon the charge against Sir Everard. This unfortunate young gentleman is ascertained to have been in arms in the pretender's service, and to have marched along with the Highland troops into England. But he has not been heard of since the skirmish at Clifton, on the December 18th last. Such was this distracting paragraph. Good God, exclaimed Waverley, am I then a parricide? Impossible. My father, who never showed the affection of a father while he lived, cannot have been so much affected by my supposed death as to hasten his own, no, I will not believe it, it were distraction to entertain for a moment such a horrible idea. But it were, if possible, worse than parricide to suffer any danger to hang over my noble and generous uncle, who has ever been more to me than a father, if such evil can be averted by any sacrifice on my part. While these reflections passed like the stings of scorpions through Waverley's sensorium, the worthy divine was startled in a long disquisition on the Battle of Falkirk by the ghastliness which they communicated to his looks. And asked him if he was ill? Fortunately the bride, all smirk and blush, had just entered the room. Mrs. Williams was none of the brightest of women, but she was good-natured, and readily concluding that Edward had been shocked by disagreeable news in the papers, interfered so judiciously, that, without exciting suspicion, she drew off Mr. Twigtide's attention, and engaged it until he soon after took his leave. Waverley then explained to his friends that he was under the necessity of going to London with as little delay as possible. One cause of delay, however, did occur, to which Waverley had been very little accustomed. His purse, though well stocked when he first went to Tully Veolan, had not been reinforced since that period. And although his life since had not been of a nature to exhaust it hastily, for he had lived chiefly with his friends or with the army, yet he found that, after settling with his kind landlord, he should be too poor to encounter the expense of traveling post. The best course, therefore, seemed to be to get into the Great North Road about Barbridge, and there take a place in the Northern Diligence, a huge old-fashioned tub, drawn by three horses, which completed the journey from Edinburgh to London, God willing, as the advertisement expressed it, in three weeks. Our hero, therefore, took an affectionate farewell of his Cumberland friends, whose kindness he promised never to forget, and tacitly hoped one day to acknowledge by substantial proofs of gratitude. After some petty difficulties and vexatious delays, and after putting his dress into a shape better befitting his rank, though perfectly plain and simple, he accomplished crossing the country. And found himself in the desired vehicle vis a vis to Mrs. Nosebag, the lady of Lieutenant Nosebag, adjutant and riding master of the Dragoons, a jolly woman of about fifty, wearing a blue habit, faced with scarlet and grasping a silver-mounted horsewhip. This lady was one of those active members of society who take upon them fair le phrase de conversation. She had just returned from the north, and informed Edward how nearly her regiment had cut the petticoat people into ribbons at Falkirk, only somehow there was one of those nasty, awkward marshes, that they are never without in Scotland, I think. And so our poor dear little regiment suffered something, as my nosebag says, in that unsatisfactory affair. You, sir, have served in the dragoons? Waverley was taken so much at unawares that he acquiesced. Oh, I knew it at once, I saw you were military from your air, and I was sure you could be none of the foot wobblers, as my nosebag calls them. What regiment, pray? Here was a delightful question. Waverley, however, justly concluded that this good lady had the whole army list by heart, and, to avoid detection by adhering to truth, answered, Gardener's Dragoons, ma'am. But I have retired some time. Oh I, those as won the race at the Battle of Preston, as my nosebag says. Pray, sir, were you there? I was so unfortunate, madam, he replied, as to witness that engagement. 
And that was a misfortune that few of gardeners stood to witness, I believe, sir, ha. 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 I beg your pardon, but a soldier's wife loves a joke. Devil confound you, thought Waverly, what infernal luck has penned me up with this inquisitive hag. Fortunately the good lady did not stick long to one subject. We are coming to Fairy Bridge now, she said, where there was a party of ours left to support the Beatles, and constables, and justices, and these sort of creatures that are examining papers and stopping rebels, and all that. They were hardly in the inn before she dragged Waverly to the window, exclaiming, Yonder comes Corporal Bradoon, of our poor dear troop, he's coming with the constable man. Bradoon's one of my lambs, as Nosebag calls M. Come, mister. Uh, uh, pray, what's your name, sir? Butler, ma'am, said Waverly, resolved rather to make free with the name of a former fellow officer than run the risk of detection by inventing one not to be found in the regiment. Oh, you got a troop lately, when that shabby fellow, Waverly, went over to the rebels? Lord, I wish our old cross Captain Crump would go over to the rebels, that nosebag might get the troop. Lord, what can Bradoon be standing swinging on the bridge for? I'll be hanged if he ain't hazy, as nosebag says. Come, sir, as you and I belong to the service, we'll go put the rascal in mind of his duty. Waverly, with feelings more easily conceived than described, saw himself obliged to follow this doughty female commander. The gallant trooper was as like a lamb as a drunk corporal of dragoons, about six feet high, with very broad shoulders, and very thin legs, not to mention a great scar across his nose, could well be. Mrs. Nosebag addressed him with something which, if not an oath, sounded very like one, and commanded him to attend to his duty. UBD, D for a, commenced the gallant cavalier. But, looking up in order to suit the action to the words, and also to enforce the epithet which he meditated with an adjective applicable to the party, he recognized the speaker, made his military salaam, and altered his tone. Lord love your handsome face, Madam Nosebag, is it you? Why, if a poor fellow does happen to fire a slug of a morning, I am sure you were never the lady to bring him to harm. Well, you rascal lion, go mind your duty. This gentleman and I belong to the service, but be sure you look after that shy cock in the slouched hat that sits in the corner of the coach. I believe he's one of the rebels in disguise. D, and her gooseberry wig, said the corporal, when she was out of hearing, that gimlet-eyed jade, mother adjutant, as we call her, is a greater plague to the regiment than Previt Marshal, Sergeant Major, and old Hubble de Shuff, the colonel into the bargain. Come, Master Constable, let's see if this shy cock, as she calls him, who, by the way, was a Quaker from Leeds, with whom Mrs. Nosebag had had some tart argument on the legality of bearing arms, will stand godfather to a sup of brandy, for your Yorkshire ale is cold on my stomach. The vivacity of this good lady, as it helped Edward out of this scrape, was like to have drawn him into one or two others. In every town where they stopped she wished to examine the corps de garde, if there was one, and once very narrowly missed introducing Waverly to a recruiting sergeant of his own regiment. Then she captained and butlered him till he was almost mad with vexation and anxiety. And never was he more rejoiced in his life at the termination of a journey than when the arrival of the coach in London freed him from the attentions of Madame Nosebag. Chapter 33 What's to be done next? It was twilight when they arrived in town. And having shaken off his companions, and walked through a good many streets to avoid the possibility of being traced by them, Edward took a hackney coach and drove to Colonel Talbot's house. In one of the principal squares at the west end of the town. That gentleman, by the death of relations, had succeeded since his marriage to a large fortune, possessed considerable political interest, and lived in what is called great style. When Waverley knocked at his door he found it at first difficult to procure admittance, but at length was shown into an apartment where the colonel was at table. Lady Emily, whose very beautiful features were still pallid from indisposition, sat opposite to him. The instant he heard Waverley's voice, he started up and embraced him. Frank Stanley, my dear boy, how do you do? Emily, my love, this is young Stanley. The blood started to the lady's cheek as she gave Waverley a reception in which courtesy was mingled with kindness, 
while her trembling hand and faltering voice showed how much she was startled and discomposed. Dinner was hastily replaced, and while Waverley was engaged in refreshing himself, the colonel proceeded, I wonder you have come here, Frank, the doctors tell me the air of London is very bad for your complaints. You should not have risked it. But I am delighted to see you, and so is Emily, though I fear we must not reckon upon your staying long. Some particular business brought me up, muttered Waverley. I supposed so, but I shan't allow you to stay long. Spontoon, to an elderly military-looking servant out of livery, take away these things, and answer the bell yourself, if I ring. Don't let any of the other fellows disturb us. My nephew and I have business to talk of. When the servants had retired, in the name of God, Waverley, what has brought you here? It may be as much as your life is worth. Dear Mr. Waverley, said Lady Emily, to whom I owe so much more than acknowledgments can ever pay, how could you be so rash? My father, my uncle, this paragraph, he handed the paper to Colonel Talbot. I wish to heaven these scoundrels were condemned to be squeezed to death in their own presses, said Talbot. I am told there are not less than a dozen of their papers now published in town, and no wonder that they are obliged to invent lies to find sale for their journals. It is true, however, my dear Edward, that you have lost your father. But as to this flourish of his unpleasant situation having grated upon his spirits and hurt his health, the truth is, for though it is harsh to say so now, yet it will relieve your mind from the idea of weighty responsibility, the truth then is. That Mr. Richard Waverley, through this whole business, showed great want of sensibility, both to your situation and that of your uncle. And the last time I saw him, he told me, with great glee, that, as I was so good as to take charge of your interests, he had thought it best to patch up a separate negotiation for himself. And make his peace with government through some channels which former connections left still open to him. And my uncle, my dear uncle? Is in no danger whatever. It is true, looking at the date of the paper, there was a foolish report some time ago to the purport here quoted, but it is entirely false. Sir Everard is gone down to Waverley Honor, freed from all uneasiness, unless upon your own account. But you are in peril yourself, your name is in every proclamation, warrants are out to apprehend you. How and when did you come here? Edward told his story at length, suppressing his quarrel with Fergus, for, being himself partial to Highlanders, he did not wish to give any advantage to the colonel's and national prejudice against them. Are you sure it was your friend Glenn's footboy you saw dead in Clifton Moor? Quite positive. Then that little limb of the devil has cheated the gallows, for cutthroat was written in his face. Though, turning to Lady Emily, it was a very handsome face too. But for you, Edward, I wish you would go down again to Cumberland, or rather I wish you had never stirred from thence, for there is an embargo in all the seaports, and a strict search for the adherence of the pretender. And the tongue of that confounded woman will wag in her head like the clack of a mill till somehow or other she will detect Captain Butler to be a feigned personage. Do you know anything, asked Waverley, of my fellow traveller? Her husband was my sergeant major for six years, she was a buxom widow, with a little money, he married her, was steady, and got on by being a good drill. I must send Spontoon to see what she is about. He will find her out among the old regimental connections. Tomorrow you must be indisposed, and keep your room from fatigue. Lady Emily is to be your nurse, and Spontoon and I your attendants. You bear the name of a near relation of mine, whom none of my present people ever saw, except Spontoon, so there will be no immediate danger. So pray feel your head ache and your eyes grow heavy as soon as possible, that you may be put upon the sick list, and, Emily, do you order an apartment for Frank Stanley, with all the attentions which an invalid may require. In the morning the colonel visited his guest. Now, said he, I have some good news for you. Your reputation as a gentleman and officer is effectually cleared of neglect of duty and accession to the mutiny in Gardiner's regiment. I have had a correspondence on this subject with a very zealous friend of yours, your Scottish parson, Morton, his first letter was addressed to Sir Everard, but I relieved the good baronet of the trouble of answering it. You must know, that your freebooting acquaintance, Donald of the Cave, has at length fallen into the hands of the Philistines. He was driving off the cattle of a certain proprietor, called Killen, something or other. Killen curate? 
the same. Now the gentleman being, it seems, a great farmer, and having a special value for his breed of cattle, being, moreover, rather of a timid disposition, had got a party of soldiers to protect his property. So Donald ran his head unawares into the lion's mouth, and was defeated and made prisoner. Being ordered for execution, his conscience was assailed on the one hand by a Catholic priest, on the other by your friend Morton. He repulsed the Catholic chiefly on account of the doctrine of extreme unction, which this economical gentleman considered as an excessive waste of oil. So his conversion from a state of impenitence fell to Mr. Morton's share, who, I dare say, acquitted himself excellently, though I suppose Donald made but a queer kind of Christian after all. He confessed, however, before a magistrate, one Major Melville, who seems to have been a correct, friendly sort of person, his full intrigue with Houghton, explaining particularly how it was carried on. And fully acquitting you of the least accession to it. He also mentioned his rescuing you from the hands of the volunteer officer, and sending you, by orders of the Pret, Chevalier, I mean, as a prisoner to Dune, from whence he understood you were carried prisoner to Edinburgh. These are particulars which cannot but tell in your favor. He hinted that he had been employed to deliver and protect you, and rewarded for doing so. But he would not confess by whom, alleging that, though he would not have minded breaking any ordinary oath to satisfy the curiosity of Mr. Morton, to whose pious admonitions he owed so much, yet, in the present case he had been sworn to silence upon the edge of his dirk, which, it seems, constituted, in his opinion, an inviolable obligation. And what is become of him? Oh, he was hanged at Stirling after the rebels raised the siege, with his lieutenant and four plaids besides, he having the advantage of a gallows more lofty than his friends. Well, I have little cause either to regret or rejoice at his death. And yet he has done me both good and harm to a very considerable extent. His confession, at least, will serve you materially, since it wipes from your character all those suspicions which gave the accusation against you a complexion of a nature different from that with which so many unfortunate gentlemen, now or lately in arms against the government, may be justly charged. Their treason, I must give it its name, though you participate in its guilt, is an action arising from mistaken virtue, and therefore cannot be classed as a disgrace, though it be doubtless highly criminal. Where the guilty are so numerous, clemency must be extended to far the greater number, and I have little doubt of procuring a remission for you, providing we can keep you out of the claws of justice till she has selected and gorged upon her victims. For in this, as in other cases, it will be according to the vulgar proverb, first come, first served. Besides, government are desirous at present to intimidate the English Jacobites, among whom they can find few examples for punishment. This is a vindictive and timid feeling which will soon wear off, for of all nations the English are least bloodthirsty by nature. But it exists at present, and you must therefore be kept out of the way in the meantime. Now entered Spontoon with an anxious countenance. By his regimental acquaintances he had traced out Madame Nosebag, and found her full of ire, fuss, and fidget at discovery of an impostor who had traveled from the north with her under the assumed name of Captain Butler of Gardiner's Dragoons. She was going to lodge an information on the subject, to have him sought for as an emissary of the pretender, but Spontoon, an old soldier, while he pretended to approve, contrived to make her delay her intention. No time, however, was to be lost, the accuracy of this good dame's description might probably lead to the discovery that Waverley was the pretended Captain Butler, an identification fraught with danger to Edward, perhaps to his uncle, and even to Colonel Talbot. Which way to direct his course was now, therefore, the question. To Scotland, said Waverley. To Scotland, said the Colonel, with what purpose? Not to engage again with the rebels, I hope. No. I considered my campaign ended when, after all my efforts, I could not rejoin them, and now, by all accounts, they are gone to make a winter campaign in the Highlands, where such adherents as I am would rather be burdensome than useful. Indeed, it seems likely that they only prolong the war to place the Chevalier's person out of danger, and then to make some terms for themselves. To burden them with my presence would merely add another party, whom they would not give up and could not defend. I understand they left almost all their English adherents in garrison at Carlisle, for that very reason. And on a more general view, Colonel, to confess the truth, though it may lower me in your opinion, 
I am heartily tired of the trade of war, and am, as Fletcher's humorous lieutenant says, even as weary of this fighting. Fighting. Pooh, what have you seen but a skirmish or two? Ah. If you saw war on the grand scale, sixty or a hundred thousand men in the field on each side. I am not at all curious, Colonel. Enough, says our homely proverb, is as good as a feast. The plumed troops and the big war used to enchant me in poetry, but the night marches, vigils, couches under the wintry sky, and such accompaniments of the glorious trade, are not at all to my taste in practice. Then for dry blows, I had my fill of fighting at Clifton, where I escaped by a hair's breadth half a dozen times, and you, I should think, he stopped. Had enough of it at Preston? You mean to say, answered the colonel, laughing. But, tis my vocation, Hal. It is not mine, though, said Waverley, and having honorably got rid of the sword, which I drew only as a volunteer, I am quite satisfied with my military experience, and shall be in no hurry to take it up again. I am very glad you are of that mind, but then what would you do in the north? In the first place, there are some seaports on the eastern coast of Scotland still in the hands of the Chevalier's friends. Should I gain any of them, I can easily embark for the continent. Good, your second reason? Why, to speak the very truth, there is a person in Scotland upon whom I now find my happiness depends more than I was always aware, and about whose situation I am very anxious. Then Emily was right, and there is a love affair in the case after all? And which of these two pretty Scotch women? whom you insisted upon my admiring, is the distinguished fair. Not Miss Glen, I hope. No. Ah, pass for the other. Simplicity may be improved, but pride and conceit never. Well, I don't discourage you, I think it will please Sir Everard, from what he said when I jested with him about it. Only I hope that intolerable Papa, with his brogue, and his snuff, and his Latin, and his insufferable long stories about the Duke of Berwick, will find it necessary hereafter to be an inhabitant of foreign parts. But as to the daughter, though I think you might find as fitting a match in England, yet if your heart be really set upon the Scotch rosebud, why the baronet has a great opinion of her father and of his family. And he wishes much to see you married and settled, both for your own sake and for that of the three ermines passant, which may otherwise pass away altogether. But I will bring you his mind fully upon the subject, since you are debarred correspondence for the present, for I think you will not be long in Scotland before me. Indeed. And what can induce you to think of returning to Scotland? No relenting longings towards the land of mountains and floods, I am afraid. None, on my word. But Emily's health is now, thank God, re-established, and, to tell you the truth, I have little hopes of concluding the business which I have at present most at heart until I can have a personal interview with His Royal Highness the Commander-in-Chief. For, as Fluellen says, the Duke doth love me well, and I thank heaven I have deserved some love at his hands. I am now going out for an hour or two to arrange matters for your departure. Your liberty extends to the next room, Lady Emily's parlor, where you will find her when you are disposed for music, reading, or conversation. We have taken measures to exclude all servants but Spontoon, who is as true as steel. In about two hours Colonel Talbot returned and found his young friend conversing with his lady. She pleased with his manners and information, and he delighted at being restored, though but for a moment, to the society of his own rank, from which he had been for some time excluded. And now, said the colonel, hear my arrangements, for there is little time to lose. This youngster, Edward Waverley, alias Williams, alias Captain Butler, must continue to pass by his fourth alias of Francis Stanley, my nephew. He shall set out tomorrow for the north, and the chariot shall take him the first two stages. Spontoon shall then attend him, and they shall ride post as far as Huntingdon. And the presence of Spontoon, well known on the road as my servant, will check all disposition to inquiry. At Huntingdon you will meet the real Frank Stanley. He is studying at Cambridge. But, a little while ago, doubtful if Emily's health would permit me to go down to the north myself, I procured him a passport from the Secretary of State's office to go in my stead. As he went chiefly to look after you, his journey is now unnecessary. He knows your story, you will dine together at Huntingdon. 
and perhaps your wise heads may hit upon some plan for removing or diminishing the danger of your farther progress northward. And now, taking out a Morocco case, let me put you in funds for the campaign. I am ashamed, my dear Colonel. Nay, said Colonel Talbot, you should command my purse in any event, but this money is your own. Your father, considering the chance of your being attained Ted, left me his trustee for your advantage. So that you are worth above fifteen thousand pounds, besides Breerwood Lodge, a very independent person, I promise you. There are bills here for two hundred pounds, any larger sum you may have, or credit abroad, as soon as your motions require it. The first use which occurred to Waverley of his newly acquired wealth was to write to honest farmer Jobson, requesting his acceptance of a silver tankard on the part of his friend Williams. Who had not forgotten the night of the 18th December last. He begged him at the same time carefully to preserve for him his highland garb and accoutrements, particularly the arms, curious in themselves, and to which the friendship of the donors gave additional value. Lady Emily undertook to find some suitable token of remembrance likely to flatter the vanity and please the taste of Mrs. Williams. And the colonel, who was a kind of farmer, promised to send the Ullswater patriarch an excellent team of horses for cart and plough. One happy day Waverley spent in London. And, travelling in the manner projected, he met with Frank Stanley at Huntingdon. The two young men were acquainted in a minute. I can read my uncle's riddle, said Stanley. The cautious old soldier did not care to hint to me that I might hand over to you this passport, which I have no occasion for, but if it should afterwards come out as the rattle-pated trick of a young cantab, sail any tire or rain. You are therefore to be Francis Stanley, with this passport. This proposal appeared in effect to alleviate a great part of the difficulties which Edward must otherwise have encountered at every turn. And accordingly he scrupled not to avail himself of it the more especially as he had discarded all political purposes from his present journey, and could not be accused of furthering machinations against the government while travelling under protection of the secretary's passport. The day passed merrily away. The young student was inquisitive about Waverley's campaigns, and the manners of the Highlands, and Edward was obliged to satisfy his curiosity by whistling a pibroch, dancing a strathspey, and singing a Highland song. The next morning Stanley rode a stage northward with his new friend, and parted from him with great reluctance, upon the remonstrances of Spontoon, who, accustomed to submit to discipline, was rigid in enforcing it. Chapter 34 Desolation Waverly Riding Post, as was the usual fashion of the period, without any adventure save one or two queries, which the talisman of his passport sufficiently answered, reached the borders of Scotland. Here he heard the tidings of the decisive Battle of Culloden. It was no more than he had long expected, though the success at Falkirk had thrown a faint and setting gleam over the arms of the Chevalier. Yet it came upon him like a shock, by which he was for a time altogether unmanned. The generous, the courteous, the noble-minded adventurer was then a fugitive, with a price upon his head. His adherents, so brave, so enthusiastic, so faithful, were dead, imprisoned, or exiled. Where, now, was the exalted and high-souled Fergus, if, indeed, he had survived the night at Clifton? Where the pure-hearted and primitive Baron of Bradwardine, whose foibles seemed foils to set off the disinterestedness of his disposition, the genuine goodness of his heart, and his unshaken courage? Those who clung for support to these fallen columns, Rose and Flora, where were they to be sought, and in what distress must not the loss of their natural protectors have involved them? Of Flora he thought with the regard of a brother for a sister. Of Rose with a sensation yet more deep and tender. It might be still his fate to supply the want of those guardians they had lost. Agitated by these thoughts he precipitated his journey. When he arrived in Edinburgh, where his inquiries must necessarily commence, he felt the full difficulty of his situation. Many inhabitants of that city had seen and known him as Edward Waverley. How, then, could he avail himself of a passport as Francis Stanley? He resolved, therefore, to avoid all company, and to move northward as soon as possible. He was, however, obliged to wait a day or two in expectation of a letter from Colonel Talbot, and he was also to leave his own address, under his feigned character, at a place agreed upon. With this latter purpose he sallied out in the dusk through the well-known streets, carefully shunning observation, but in vain, 
one of the first persons whom he met at once recognized him. It was Mrs. Flockhart, Fergus MacIver's good-humored landlady. Good guide us, Mr. Waverley, is this you? Nah, ye needna be feared for me. I wad betray nay gentleman in your circumstances. Eh, lackaday. Lackaday. Here's a change, oh, markets. How merry Colonel MacIver and you used to be in our house. And the good-natured widow shed a few natural tears. As there was no resisting her claim of acquaintance, Waverley acknowledged it with a good grace, as well as the danger of his own situation. As it's near the darkening, sir, wad ye just step in by to our house and tack a dish o' oh, tea? And I am sure if ye like to sleep in the little room, I wad tack care ye are no disturbed, and naebody wad ken ye, for Kate and Mattie, the limmers, geed af y, t w a o, Holly's dragoons, and I hey t w a new queens instead o, oh, them. Waverley accepted her invitation, and engaged her lodging for a night or two, satisfied he should be safer in the house of this simple creature than anywhere else. When he entered the parlor his heart swelled to see Fergus's bonnet, with the white cockade, hanging beside the little mirror. I, said Mrs. Flockhart, sighing, as she observed the direction of his eyes, the queer colonel bought a new ain just the day before they marched, and I winna let them tack that ain down, but just to brush it ilk a day missile. And whiles I look at it till I just think I hear him cry to Callum to bring him his bonnet, as he used to do when he was ganging out. It's unco silly, the neighbors see a me a Jacobite, but they may say their say, I am sure it's no for that, but he was as kind-hearted a gentleman as ever lived, and as will F.A.R.D. too. Oh, d can, sir, when he is to suffer? Suffer. Good heaven. Why, where is he? Eh, Lord Sake. Do you know Ken? The poor healin' body, Dougald Mahoney, cam here a while sign, why ain't o' oh, his arms cut it off, and a sare clower in the head, yeel mine Dougald, he carried I an axe on his shout her, and he cam here just begging, as I may say, for something to eat. A wheel, he told us the chief, as they see aid him, but I I see a, him the colonel, and ensign Macambich, that ye mind wheel, were tain somewhere beside the English border, when it was say dark that his folk never missed him till it was hour late. And they were like to gang clean daft. And he said that little Callum beg, he was a bald mischievous colon that, and your honor were killed that same night in the Toolsy, and Moni may bra men. But he grat when he spack oh, the colonel, ye never saw the like. And now the word gangs the colonel is to be tried, and to suffer why, them that were tain at Carlisle. And his sister? I, that they see aid the Lady Flora, will, she's away up to Carlisle to him, and lives why, some grand papist lady thereabouts to be near him. And, said Edward, the other young lady? Wilk other? I ken only of A.E. sister the colonel had. I mean Miss Bradwardine, said Edward. Oh, I, the laird's daughter, said his landlady. She was a very bonny lassie, poor thing, but far shyer than Lady Flora. Where is she, for God's sake? Oh, wha kens where oni o oh, them is now? Queer things, their sair tain down for their white cockades and their white roses, but she geed north to her father's in Perthshire, when the government troops came back to Edinburgh. There was some pretty men among them, and ain Major Wacker was quartered on me, a very civil gentleman, but oh, Mr. Waverley, he was nathing sae will f-a-r-d as the poor colonel. Do you know what has become of Miss Bradwardine's father? The old laird? Nah, naebody kens that. But they say he fought very hard in that bloody battle at Inverness. And Deacon Clank, the white iron smith, says that the government folk are Sarah gain him for having been out twice, and troth he might hae tain warning, but there's nae fuel like an old fuel. The poor colonel was only out ants. Such conversation contained almost all the good-natured widow knew of the fate of her late lodgers and acquaintances. But it was enough to determine Edward, at all hazards, to proceed instantly to Tully Veolan, where he concluded he should see, or at least hear, something of Rose. He therefore left a letter for Colonel Talbot at the place agreed upon, signed by his assumed name, and giving for his address the post town next to the Baron's residence. From Edinburgh to Perth he took post horses resolving to make the rest of his journey on foot. 
a mode of traveling to which he was partial, and which had the advantage of permitting a deviation from the road when he saw parties of military at a distance. His campaign had considerably strengthened his constitution and improved his habits of enduring fatigue. His baggage he sent before him as opportunity occurred. As he advanced northward, the traces of war became visible. Broken carriages, dead horses, unroofed cottages, trees felled for palisades, and bridges destroyed or only partially repaired, all indicated the movements of hostile armies. In those places where the gentry were attached to the Stuart cause, their houses seemed dismantled or deserted, the usual course of what may be called ornamental labor was totally interrupted, and the inhabitants were seen gliding about, with fear, sorrow, and dejection on their faces. It was evening when he approached the village of Tully Veolan, with feelings and sentiments, how different from those which attended his first entrance. Then, life was so new to him that a dull or disagreeable day was one of the greatest misfortunes which his imagination anticipated, and it seemed to him that his time ought only to be consecrated to elegant or amusing study. And relieved by social or youthful frolic. Now, how changed, how saddened, yet how elevated was his character, within the course of a very few months. Danger and misfortune are rapid, though severe teachers. A sadder and a wiser man, he felt an internal confidence and mental dignity a compensation for the gay dreams which in his case experience had so rapidly dissolved. As he approached the village he saw, with surprise and anxiety, that a party of soldiers were quartered near it, and, what was worse, that they seemed stationary there. This he conjectured from a few tents which he beheld glimmering upon what was called the common moor. To avoid the risk of being stopped and questioned in a place where he was so likely to be recognized, he made a large circuit, altogether avoiding the hamlet, and approaching the upper gate of the avenue by a by-path well known to him. A single glance announced that great changes had taken place. One half of the gate, entirely destroyed and split up for firewood, lay in piles, ready to be taken away, the other swung uselessly about upon its loosened hinges. The battlements above the gate were broken and thrown down, and the carved bears, which were said to have done sentinels' duty upon the top for centuries, now, hurled from their posts, lay among the rubbish. The avenue was cruelly wasted. Several large trees were felled and left lying across the path, and the cattle of the villagers, and the more rude hoofs of dragoon horses, had poached into black mud the verdant turf which Waverley had so much admired. Upon entering the courtyard, Edward saw the fears realized which these circumstances had excited. The place had been sacked by the king's troops, who, in wanton mischief, had even attempted to burn it. And though the thickness of the walls had resisted the fire, unless to a partial extent, the stables and outhouses were totally consumed. The towers and pinnacles of the main building were scorched and blackened. The pavement of the court broken and shattered, the doors torn down entirely, or hanging by a single hinge, the windows dashed in and demolished, and the court strewed with articles of furniture broken into fragments. The accessories of ancient distinction, to which the baron, in the pride of his heart, had attached so much importance and veneration, were treated with peculiar contumely. The fountain was demolished, and the spring which had supplied it now flooded the courtyard. The stone basin seemed to be destined for a drinking trough for cattle, from the manner in which it was arranged upon the ground. The whole tribe of bears, large and small, had experienced as little favor as those at the head of the avenue, and one or two of the family pictures, which seemed to have served as targets for the soldiers, lay on the ground in tatters. With an aching heart, as may well be imagined, Edward viewed this wreck of a mansion so respected. But his anxiety to learn the fate of the proprietors, and his fears as to what that fate might be, increased with every step. When he entered upon the terrace new scenes of desolation were visible. The balustrade was broken down, the walls destroyed, the borders overgrown with weeds, and the fruit trees cut down or grubbed up. In one compartment of this old-fashioned garden were two immense horse chestnut trees, of whose size the baron was particularly vain. Too lazy, perhaps, to cut them down, the spoilers, with malevolent ingenuity, had mined them and placed a quantity of gunpowder in the cavity. One had been shivered to pieces by the explosion, and the fragments lay scattered around, encumbering the ground it had so long shadowed. The other mine had been more partial in its effect. About one-fourth of the trunk of the tree was torn from the mass, which, mutilated and defaced on the one side, 
still spread on the other its ample and undiminished boughs. A pair of chestnut trees, destroyed, the one entirely in the other in part, by such a mischievous and wanton act of revenge, grew at Invergary Castle, the fastness of MacDonald of Glengarry. Amid these general marks of ravage, there were some which more particularly addressed the feelings of Waverley. Viewing the front of the building thus wasted and defaced, his eyes naturally sought the little balcony which more properly belonged to Rose's apartment, her Chuazim, or rather Sinkiim, edage. It was easily discovered, for beneath it lay the stage flowers and shrubs with which it was her pride to decorate it, and which had been hurled from the bartizan, several of her books were mingled with broken flower pots and other remnants. Among these Waverley distinguished one of his own, a small copy of Ariosto, and gathered it as a treasure, though wasted by the wind and rain. While, plunged in the sad reflections which the scene excited, he was looking around for someone who might explain the fate of the inhabitants, he heard a voice from the interior of the building singing, in well-remembered accents. An old Scottish song. They came upon us in the night. And break my bower and slew my knight. My servants of for life did flee. And left us in extremity. They slew my knight, to me sae dear. They slew my knight, and drave his gear wink with a frown. The moon may set, the sun may rise. But a deadly sleep has closed his eyes. The first three couplets are from an old ballad, called The Border Widow's Lament. Alas, thought Edward, is it thou? Poor helpless being, art thou alone left, to gibber and moan, and fill with thy wild and unconnected scraps of minstrelsy the halls that protected thee? He then called, first low, and then louder, Davy, Davy Jellotly. The poor simpleton showed himself from among the ruins of a sort of greenhouse, that once terminated what was called the terrace walk, but at first sight of a stranger retreated, as if in terror. Waverley, remembering his habits, began to whistle a tune to which he was partial, which Davy had expressed great pleasure in listening to, and had picked up from him by the ear. Our hero's minstrelsy no more equaled that of Blondel than poor Davy resembled Cur de Lion but the melody had the same effect of producing recognition. Davy again stole from his lurking place, but timidly, while Waverley, afraid of frightening him, stood making the most encouraging signals he could devise. It's his gayest, muttered Davy. Yet, coming nearer, he seemed to acknowledge his living acquaintance. The poor fool himself appeared the ghost of what he had been. The peculiar dress in which he had been attired in better days showed only miserable rags of its whimsical finery, the lack of which was oddly supplied by the remnants of tapestried hangings, window curtains, and shreds of pictures with which he had bedizened his tatters. His face, too, had lost its vacant and careless air, and the poor creature looked hollow-eyed, meager, half-starved, and nervous to a pitiable degree. After long hesitation, he at length approached Waverley with some confidence, stared him sadly in the face, and said, A, uh, dead and gain, a, uh, dead and gain. Who are dead? said Waverley, forgetting the incapacity of Davy to hold any connected discourse. Baron, and Bailey, and Saunders Saunderson, and Lady Rose that sang S.A.E. sweet, a, uh, dead and gain, dead and gain. But follow, follow me. While glowworms light the Leah. I'll show ye where the dead should be. Each in his shroud. While winds pipe loud. And the red moon peeps dim through the cloud. Follow, follow me. Brave should he be. That treads by night the dead man's Leah. With these words, chanted in a wild and earnest tone, he made a sign to Waverley to follow him, and walked rapidly towards the bottom of the garden, tracing the bank of the stream which, it may be remembered, was its eastern boundary. Edward, over whom an involuntary shuddering stole at the import of his words, followed him in some hope of an explanation. As the house was evidently deserted, he could not expect to find among the ruins any more rational informer. Davy, walking very fast, soon reached the extremity of the garden, and scrambled over the ruins of the wall that once had divided it from the wooded glen in which the old tower of Tully Veolan was situated. He then jumped down into the bed of the stream, and, followed by Waverley, proceeded at a great pace, climbing over some fragments of rock and turning with difficulty round others. They passed beneath the ruins of the castle. Waverley followed, keeping up with his guide with difficulty, for the twilight began to fall. 
following the descent of the stream a little lower, he totally lost him, but a twinkling light which he now discovered among the tangled copse wood and bushes seemed a sure guide. He soon pursued a very uncouth path. And by its guidance at length reached the door of a wretched hut. A fierce barking of dogs was at first heard, but it stilled at his approach. A voice sounded from within, and he held it most prudent to listen before he advanced. What hast thou brought here, thou unsancy villain, thou, said an old woman, apparently in great indignation. He heard Davy Jellotly in answer whistle a part of the tune by which he had recalled himself to the simpleton's memory, and had now no hesitation to knock at the door. There was a dead silence instantly within, except the deep growling of the dogs, and he next heard the mistress of the hut approach the door, not probably for the sake of undoing a latch, but of fastening a bolt. To prevent this Waverley lifted the latch himself. In front was an old wretched-looking woman, exclaiming, What comes into folks' houses in this gate, at this time, oh, the night? On one side, two grim and half-starved deer greyhounds laid aside their ferocity at his appearance, and seemed to recognize him. On the other side, half concealed by the open door, yet apparently seeking that concealment reluctantly, with a cocked pistol in his right hand and his left in the act of drawing another from his belt, stood a tall bony gaunt figure in the remnants of a faded uniform and a beard of three weeks' growth. It was the Baron of Bradwardine. It is unnecessary to add, that he threw aside his weapon and greeted Waverley with a hearty embrace. Chapter 35 Comparing of Notes The Baron's story was short, when divested of the adages and commonplaces, Latin, English, and Scotch, with which his erudition garnished it. He insisted much upon his grief at the loss of Edward and of Glenacoich, fought the fields of Falkirk and Culloden, and related how, after all was lost in the last battle, he had returned home. Under the idea of more easily finding shelter among his own tenants and on his own estate than elsewhere. A party of soldiers had been sent to lay waste his property, for clemency was not the order of the day. Their proceedings, however, were checked by an order from the civil court. The estate, it was found, might not be forfeited to the crown to the prejudice of Malcolm Bradwardine of Inchgrabbit, the heir male, whose claim could not be prejudiced by the baron's attainder, as deriving no right through him, and who, therefore, like other heirs of entail in the same situation, entered upon possession. But, unlike many in similar circumstances, the new laird speedily showed that he intended utterly to exclude his predecessor from all benefit or advantage in the estate, and that it was his purpose to avail himself of the old baron's evil fortune to the full extent. This was the more ungenerous, as it was generally known that, from a romantic idea of not prejudicing this young man's right as heir male, the baron had refrained from settling his estate on his daughter. This selfish injustice was resented by the country people, who were partial to their old master, and irritated against his successor. In the baron's own words, the matter did not coincide with the feelings of the commons of Bradwardine, Mr. Waverley, and the tenants were slack and repugnant in payment of their mails and duties, and when my kinsman came to the village why, the new factor, Mr. James Howey, to lift the rents, some wanchancy person, I suspect John Heatherblutter, the old gamekeeper, that was out why and me in the year fifteen, fired a shot at him in the gloaming, whereby he was so affrighted. That I may say with Tullius in Catalinum, abiat, evasit, erupit, effugit. He fled, sir, as one may say, incontinent to Stirling. And now he hath advertised the estate for sale, being himself the last substitute in the entail. And if I were to lament about sick matters, this would grieve me mere than its passing from my immediate possession, Wilk, by the course of nature, must have happened in a few years. Whereas now it passes from the lineage that should have possessed it in secula seculorum. But God's will be done, humana perpessi summus. Sir John of Bradwardine, Black Sir John, as he is called, who was the common ancestor of our house and the inch grabbits, little thought such a person would have sprung from his loins. Meantime, he has accused me to some of the primates, the rulers for the time, as if I were a cutthroat, and an abettor of bravos and assassinates and coopjarrets. And they have sent soldiers here to abide on the estate, and hunt me like a partridge upon the mountains, as scripture says of good King David, or like our valiant Sir William Wallace, not that I bring myself into comparison with either. I thought, when I heard you at the door, 
they had driven the old deer to his den at last, and so I Ian proposed to die at bay, like a buck of the first head. But now, Janet, can I gie us something for supper? Oh I, sir, I'll brander the more fowl that John Heatherblutter brought in this morning, and ye see poor Davies roasting the black hen's eggs. I dare say, Mr. Waverley, ye never ken that a, uh, the eggs that were sae will roasted at supper in the ha house where I turned by our Davy? There's no the like o, oh, him oni gate for powdering why, his fingers amang the het peat ashes and roasting eggs. Davy all this while lay with his nose almost in the fire, nuzzling among the ashes, kicking his heels, mumbling to himself, turning the eggs as they lay in the hot embers, as if to confute the proverb, that, there goes reason to roasting of eggs. And justify the eulogium which poor Janet poured out upon. Him whom she loved, her idiot boy. Davies no sae silly as folk tack him for, Mr. Waverley, he wadna hay brought you here unless he had kenned ye was a friend to his honour, indeed the very dogs kenned ye, Mr. Waverley, for ye was I kind to beast and body. I can tell you a story, O oh, Davy, why, his honours leave. His honour, ye see, being under hiding in they sair times, the mare's the pity, he lies at day, and whiles at a night, in the cove in the dern hag. But though it's a bealdy enough bit, and the old goodman o, oh, coarse clough has panged it why, a kemple o, oh, stray a mayest, yet when the country's quiet, and the night very called. His honour whiles creeps down here to get a warm at the ingle and a sleep among the blankets, and gangs awa in the morning. And so, a e morning, sick can a fright as I got. Twa unlucky redcoats were up for black fishing, or some sick can ploy, for the neb o, oh, them's never out o, oh, mischief, and they just got a glisk o, oh, his honour as he geed into the wood, and banged aff a gun at him. I out like a jafalcon, and cried, Wad they shoot an honest woman's poor innocent bairn? And I flayed at them, and three pit it was my son, and they damned and swore at me that it was the old rebel, as the villain see ate his honour. And Davy was in the wood, and heard the toolsy, and he, just out o, oh, his ein head, got up the old grey mantle that his honour had flung off him to gang the faster, and he came out o, oh, the very same bit o, oh, the wood. Majoring and looking about sae like his honour, that they were clean beguiled and thought they had let ten f their gun at crack brain sawney, as they see a, him. And they gie me saxpence, and twa salmon fish, to say naething about it. Nah, nah, Davies no just like other folk, queer fallow, but he's no sae silly as folk tack him for. But, to be sure, how can we do enough for his honour, when we and ours have lived on his ground this twa hundred years, and when he keep it my queer Jamie at school and college, and even at the ha house, till he geed to a better place. And when he saved me fray being tain to Perth as a witch, Lord forgee them that would touch sick a queer silly old body, and has maintained queer Davy at heck and manger maced feck o' oh, his life? Waverley at length found an opportunity to interrupt Janet's narrative by an inquiry after Miss Bradwardine. She's weal and safe, thank God. At the Duckran, answered the Baron. The lairds distantly related to us, and more nearly to my chaplain, Mr. Rubrick, and, though he be of Whig principles, yet he's not forgetful of old friendship at this time. The Bailey's doing what he can to save something out of the wreck for Puir Rose, but I doubt, I doubt, I shall never see her again, for I maun lay my banes in some far country. Hout na, your honour, said old Janet, you were just as ill aff in the fifteen, and got the bonny barony back, and uh. And now the eggs is ready, and the meercocks brandered, and there's ilk ain a trencher and some sot, and the heel o, oh, the white loaf that cam fray the baileys, and there's plenty o, oh, brandy in the greybeard that Lucky McCleary sent down. And winna ye be suppered like princes? I wish one prince, at least, of our acquaintance may be no worse off, said the baron to Waverley, who joined him in cordial hopes for the safety of the unfortunate chevalier. They then began to talk of their future prospects. The baron's plan was very simple. It was, to escape to France, where, by the interest of his old friends, he hoped to get some military employment, of which he still conceived himself capable. He invited Waverley to go with him, a proposal in which he acquiesced, providing the interest of Colonel Talbot should fail in procuring his pardon. Tacitly he hoped the Baron would sanction his addresses to Rose, and give him a right to assist him in his exile, 
but he forbore to speak on this subject until his own fate should be decided. They then talked of Glenacoich, for whom the baron expressed great anxiety, although, he observed, he was, the very Achilles of Horatius Flaccus. Impiger, Iracundus, inexorabilis, Acer. Which, he continued, has been thus rendered, vernacularly, by Struan Robertson. A fiery etter cap, a fractious chiel. As head as ginger, and as steve as steel. Flora had a large and unqualified share of the good old man's sympathy. It was now wearing late. Old Janet got into some kind of kennel behind the hallan, Davy had been long asleep and snoring between Ban and Busker. These dogs had followed him to the hut after the mansion house was deserted, and there constantly resided, and their ferocity, with the old woman's reputation of being a witch, contributed a good deal to keep visitors from the glen. With this view, Bailey Macweeble provided Janet underhand with meal for their maintenance, and also with little articles of luxury for his patron's use, in supplying which much precaution was necessarily used. After some compliments, the baron occupied his usual couch, and Waverley reclined in an easy chair of tattered velvet, which had once garnished the state bedroom of Tully Veolan, for the furniture of this mansion was now scattered through all the cottages in the vicinity, and went to sleep as comfortably as if he had been in a bed of down. Chapter 36 More Explanation With the first dawn of day, old Janet was scuttling about the house to wake the baron, who usually slept sound and heavily. I must go back, he said to Waverley, to my cove, will you walk down the glen why me? They went out together, and followed a narrow and entangled footpath, which the occasional passage of anglers or woodcutters had traced by the side of the stream. On their way the baron explained to Waverley that he would be under no danger in remaining a day or two at Tully Veolan, and even in being seen walking about. If he used the precaution of pretending that he was looking at the estate as agent or surveyor for an English gentleman who designed to be purchaser. With this view he recommended to him to visit the bailey, who still lived at the factor's house, called Little Veolan, about a mile from the village, though he was to remove at next term. Stanley's passport would be an answer to the officer who commanded the military, and as to any of the country people who might recognize Waverley, the baron assured him he was in no danger of being betrayed by them. I believe, said the old man, half the people of the barony know that their poor old laird is somewhere hereabout, for I see they do not suffer a single baron to come here a bird nesting. A practice whilk, when I was in full possession of my power as baron, I was unable totally to inhibit. Nay, I often find bits of things in my way, that the poor bodies, God help them. Leave there, because they think they may be useful to me. I hope they will get a wiser master, and as kind a one as I was. A natural sigh closed the sentence, but the quiet equanimity with which the baron endured his misfortunes had something in it venerable and even sublime. There was no fruitless repining, no turbid melancholy, he bore his lot, and the hardships which it involved, with a good-humoured, though serious composure, and used no violent language against the prevailing party. I did what I thought my duty, said the good old man, and questionless they are doing what they think theirs. It grieves me sometimes to look upon these blackened walls of the house of my ancestors. But doubtless officers cannot always keep the soldier's hand from depredation and spoilsy, and Gustavus Adolphus himself, as ye may read in Colonel Monroe his expedition with the worthy Scotch regiment called Mackay's regiment, did often permit it. Indeed I have myself seen as sad sights as Tully Veolan now is when I served with the marital Duke of Berwick. To be sure we may say with Virgilius Morrow, Fly mistros, and there's the end of an old sang. But houses and families and men have a stood lang enough when they have stood till they fall with honor, and now I hae gotten a house that is not unlike a domus ultima, they were now standing below a steep rock. We poor Jacobites, continued the baron, looking up, are now like the conies in holy scripture, which the great traveller Pocock calleth Jerboa, a feeble people, that make our abode in the rocks. So, fare you well, my good lad, till we meet at Janet's in the even, for I must get into my Patmos, which is no easy matter for my old stiff limbs. With that he began to ascend the rock, striding, with the help of his hands, from one precarious footstep to another, till he got about halfway up, where two or three bushes concealed the mouth of a hole, resembling an oven. Into which the baron insinuated, first his head and shoulders, and then, by slow gradation, 
the rest of his long body. His legs and feet finally disappearing, coiled up like a huge snake entering his retreat, or a long pedigree introduced with care and difficulty into the narrow pigeonhole of an old cabinet. Waverley had the curiosity to clamber up and look in upon him in his den, as the lurking place might well be termed. Upon the whole, he looked not unlike that ingenious puzzle called, a reel in a bottle, the marvel of children, and of some grown people too, myself for one, who can neither comprehend the mystery how it has got in or how it is to be taken out. The cave was very narrow, too low in the roof to admit of his standing, or almost of his sitting up, though he made some awkward attempts at the latter posture. His sole amusement was the perusal of his old friend Titus Levius, varied by occasionally scratching Latin proverbs and texts of scripture with his knife on the roof and walls of his Fort Alice, which were of sandstone. As the cave was dry, and filled with clean straw and withered fern, it made, as he said, coiling himself up with an air of snugness and comfort which contrasted strangely with his situation, unless when the wind was due north. A very passable jeet for an old soldier. Neither, as he observed, was he without sentries for the purpose of reconnoitering. Davy and his mother were constantly on the watch to discover and avert danger. And it was singular what instances of address seemed dictated by the instinctive attachment of the poor simpleton when his patron's safety was concerned. With Janet, Edward now sought an interview. He had recognized her at first sight as the old woman who had nursed him during his sickness after his delivery from gifted Gilfillan. The hut also, although a little repaired and somewhat better furnished, was certainly the place of his confinement. And he now recollected on the common moor of Tully Veal and the trunk of a large decayed tree, called the Tristing Tree, which he had no doubt was the same at which the Highlanders rendezvoused on that memorable night. All this he had combined in his imagination the night before, but reasons which may probably occur to the reader prevented him from catechizing Janet in the presence of the Baron. He now commenced the task in good earnest. And the first question was, who was the young lady that visited the hut during his illness? Janet paused for a little, and then observed, that to keep the secret now would neither do good nor ill to anybody. It was just a leddy that has na her equal in the world, Miss Rose Bradwardine. Then Miss Rose was probably also the author of my deliverance, inferred Waverley, delighted at the confirmation of an idea which local circumstances had already induced him to entertain. I what will, Mr. Waverley, and that was she Ian. But sir, sir angry and affronted wad she hae been, poor thing, if she had thought ye had been ever to ken a word about the matter, for she guard me speak I Gaelic when ye was in hearing, to mak ye tro we were in the Helands. I can speak it well enough, for my mother was a Heland woman. A few more questions now brought out the whole mystery respecting Waverley's deliverance from the bondage in which he left Cairnbrecken. Never did music sound sweeter to an amateur than the drowsy tautology with which old Janet detailed every circumstance thrilled upon the ears of Waverley. But my reader is not a lover and I must spare his patience, by attempting to condense within reasonable compass the narrative which old Janet spread through a harangue of nearly two hours. When Waverley communicated to Fergus the letter he had received from Rose Bradwardine by Davy Jellotley, giving an account of Tully Veland being occupied by a small party of soldiers. That circumstance had struck upon the busy and active mind of the chieftain. Eager to distress and narrow the posts of the enemy, desirous to prevent their establishing a garrison so near him. And willing also to oblige the baron, for he often had the idea of marriage with Rose floating through his brain, he resolved to send some of his people to drive out the redcoats and to bring Rose to Glenacoich. But just as he had ordered Evan with a small party on this duty, the news of Copes having marched into the highlands, to meet and disperse the forces of the Chevalier ere they came to a head, obliged him to join the standard with his whole forces. He sent to order Donald Bean to attend him. But that cautious freebooter, who well understood the value of a separate command, instead of joining, sent various apologies which the pressure of the times compelled Fergus to admit as current. Though not without the internal resolution of being revenged on him for his procrastination, time and place convenient. However, as he could not amend the matter, he issued orders to Donald to descend into the low country, drive the soldiers from Tully Veolan, and, paying all respect to the mansion of the baron, to take his abode somewhere near it. For protection of his daughter and family, and to harass and drive away any of the armed volunteers or small parties of military which he might find moving about the vicinity. 
As this charge formed a sort of roving commission, which Donald proposed to interpret in the way most advantageous to himself, as he was relieved from the immediate terrors of Fergus, and as he had, from former secret services. Some interest in the councils of the Chevalier, he resolved to make hay while the sun shone. He achieved without difficulty the task of driving the soldiers from Tully Veolan. But, although he did not venture to encroach upon the interior of the family, or to disturb Miss Rose, being unwilling to make himself a powerful enemy in the Chevalier's army. For well he knew the Baron's wrath was deadly. Yet he set about to raise contributions and exactions upon the tenantry, and otherwise to turn the war to his own advantage. Meanwhile he mounted the white cockade, and waited upon Rose with a pretext of great devotion for the service in which her father was engaged, and many apologies for the freedom he must necessarily use for the support of his people. It was at this moment that Rose learned, by open-mouthed fame, with all sorts of exaggeration, that Waverley had killed the smith at Cairnbrecken, in an attempt to arrest him. Had been cast into a dungeon by Major Melville of Cairnbrecken, and was to be executed by martial law within three days. In the agony which these tidings excited she proposed to Donald Bean the rescue of the prisoner. It was the very sort of service which he was desirous to undertake, judging it might constitute a merit of such a nature as would make amends for any peccadilloes which he might be guilty of in the country. He had the art, however, pleading all the while duty and discipline, to hold off, until poor Rose, in the extremity of her distress, offered to bribe him to the enterprise with some valuable jewels which had been her mother's. Donald Bean, who had served in France, knew, and perhaps overestimated, the value of these trinkets. But he also perceived Rose's apprehensions of its being discovered that she had parted with her jewels for Waverley's liberation. Resolved this scruple should not part him and the treasure, he voluntarily offered to take an oath that he would never mention Miss Rose's share in the transaction. And, foreseeing convenience in keeping the oath and no probable advantage in breaking it, he took the engagement, in order, as he told his lieutenant, to deal handsomely by the young lady, in the only mode and form which, by a mental pact eye on with himself, he considered as binding, he swore secrecy upon his drawn dirk. He was the more especially moved to this act of good faith by some attentions that Miss Bradwardine showed to his daughter Alice, which, while they gained the heart of the mountain damsel, highly gratified the pride of her father. Alice, who could now speak a little English, was very communicative in return for Rose's kindness, readily confided to her the whole papers respecting the intrigue with Gardiner's regiment, of which she was the depositary, and as readily undertook. At her instance, to restore them to Waverley without her father's knowledge. For, they may oblige the bonny young lady and the handsome young gentleman, said Alice, and what use has my father for a win bits o oh, scart paper? The reader is aware that she took an opportunity of executing this purpose on the eve of Waverley's leaving the Glen. How Donald executed his enterprise the reader is aware. But the expulsion of the military from Tully Veolan had given alarm, and while he was lying in wait for Gilfillan, a strong party, such as Donald did not care to face, was sent to drive back the insurgents in their turn, to encamp there. And to protect the country. The officer, a gentleman and a disciplinarian, neither intruded himself on Miss Bradwardine, whose unprotected situation he respected, nor permitted his soldiers to commit any breach of discipline. He formed a little camp upon an eminence near the house of Tully Veolan, and placed proper guards at the passes in the vicinity. This unwelcome news reached Donald Bean Lean as he was returning to Tully Veolan. Determined, however, to obtain the guerdon of his labor, he resolved, since approach to Tully Veolan was impossible, to deposit his prisoner in Janet's cottage. A place the very existence of which could hardly have been suspected even by those who had long lived in the vicinity, unless they had been guided thither, and which was utterly unknown to Waverley himself. This effected, he claimed and received his reward. Waverley's illness was an event which deranged all their calculations. Donald was obliged to leave the neighborhood with his people, and to seek more free course for his adventures elsewhere. At Rose's entreaty, he left an old man, a herbalist, who was supposed to understand a little of medicine, to attend Waverley during his illness. In the meanwhile, new and fearful doubts started in Rose's mind. They were suggested by old Janet, who insisted that, a reward having been offered for the apprehension of Waverley, and his own personal effects being so valuable, there was no saying to what breach of faith Donald might be tempted. 
In an agony of grief and terror, Rose took the daring resolution of explaining to the prince himself the danger in which Mr. Waverley stood, judging that, both as a politician and a man of honor and humanity, Charles Edward would interest himself to prevent his falling into the hands of the opposite party. This letter she at first thought of sending anonymously, but naturally feared it would not in that case be credited. She therefore subscribed her name, though with reluctance and terror, and consigned it in charge to a young man, who at leaving his farm to join the Chevalier's army, made it his petition to her to have some sort of credentials to the adventurer, from whom he hoped to obtain a commission. The letter reached Charles Edward on his descent to the Lowlands, and, aware of the political importance of having it supposed that he was in correspondence with the English Jacobites. He caused the most positive orders to be transmitted to Donald Bean Lean to transmit Waverley, safe and uninjured, in person or effects, to the governor of Dune Castle. The freebooter durst not disobey, for the army of the prince was now so near him that punishment might have followed. Besides, he was a politician as well as a robber, and was unwilling to cancel the interest created through former secret services by being refractory on this occasion. He therefore made a virtue of necessity and transmitted orders to his lieutenant to convey Edward to Dune, which was safely accomplished in the mode mentioned in a former chapter. The governor of Dune was directed to send him to Edinburgh as a prisoner, because the prince was apprehensive that Waverley, if set at liberty, might have resumed his purpose of returning to England. Without affording him an opportunity of a personal interview. In this, indeed, he acted by the advice of the chieftain of Glenacoich with whom it may be remembered the Chevalier communicated upon the mode of disposing of Edward, though without telling him how he came to learn the place of his confinement. This, indeed, Charles Edward considered as a lady's secret. For although Rose's letter was couched in the most cautious and general terms, and professed to be written merely from motives of humanity and zeal for the prince's service, yet she expressed so anxious a wish that she should not be known to have interfered, that the Chevalier was induced to suspect the deep interest which she took in Waverley's safety. This conjecture, which was well founded, led, however, to false inferences. For the emotion which Edward displayed on approaching Flora and Rose at the ball of Holyrood was placed by the Chevalier to the account of the latter. And he concluded that the Baron's views about the settlement of his property, or some such obstacle, thwarted their mutual inclinations. Common fame, it is true, frequently gave Waverley to Miss MacIver. But the prince knew that common fame is very prodigal in such gifts, and, watching attentively the behavior of the ladies towards Waverley, he had no doubt that the young Englishman had no interest with Flora, and was beloved by Rose Bradwardine. Desirous to bind Waverley to his service, and wishing also to do a kind and friendly action, the prince next assailed the baron on the subject of settling his estate upon his daughter. Mr. Bradwardine acquiesced. But the consequence was that Fergus was immediately induced to prefer his double suit for a wife and an earldom, which the prince rejected in the manner we have seen. The chevalier, constantly engaged in his own multiplied affairs, had not hitherto sought any explanation with Waverley, though often meaning to do so. But after Fergus's declaration he saw the necessity of appearing neutral between the rivals, devoutly hoping that the matter, which now seemed fraught with the seeds of strife, might be permitted to lie over till the termination of the expedition. When, on the march to Derby, Fergus, being questioned concerning his quarrel with Waverley, alleged as the cause that Edward was desirous of retracting the suit he had made to his sister. The Chevalier plainly told him that he had himself observed Miss MacIver's behavior to Waverley, and that he was convinced Fergus was under the influence of a mistake in judging of Waverley's conduct, who, he had every reason to believe was engaged to Miss Bradwardine. The quarrel which ensued between Edward and the chieftain is, I hope, still in the remembrance of the reader. These circumstances will serve to explain such points of our narrative as, according to the custom of storytellers, we deemed it fit to leave unexplained, for the purpose of exciting the reader's curiosity. When Janet had once finished the leading facts of this narrative, Waverley was easily enabled to apply the clue which they afforded to other mazes of the labyrinth in which he had been engaged. To Rose Bradwardine, then, he owed the life which he now thought he could willingly have laid down to serve her. A little reflection convinced him, however, that to live for her sake was more convenient and agreeable, and that, being possessed of independence, she might share it with him either in foreign countries or in his own. 
The pleasure of being allied to a man of the baron's high worth, and who was so much valued by his uncle Sir Everard, was also an agreeable consideration, had anything been wanting to recommend the match. His absurdities, which had appeared grotesquely ludicrous during his prosperity, seemed, in the sunset of his fortune, to be harmonized and assimilated with the noble features of his character, so as to add peculiarity without exciting ridicule. His mind occupied with such projects of future happiness, Edward sought Little Violin, the habitation of Mr. Duncan Macweeble. Chapter 37 Now is Cupid a child of conscience, he makes restitution. Shakespeare Mr. Duncan Macweeble, no longer commissary or bailey, though still enjoying the empty name of the latter dignity, had escaped proscription by an early secession from the insurgent party and by his insignificance. Edward found him in his office, immersed among papers and accounts. Before him was a large bicker of oatmeal porridge, and at the side thereof a horn spoon and a bottle of twopenny. Eagerly running his eye over a voluminous law paper, he from time to time shoveled an immense spoonful of these nutritive viands into his capacious mouth. A pot-bellied Dutch bottle of brandy which stood by intimated either that this honest limb of the law had taken his morning already, or that he meant to season his porridge with such digestive. Or perhaps both circumstances might reasonably be inferred. His nightcap and morning gown, had Wylome been of tartan, but, equally cautious and frugal, the honest Bailey had got them dyed black lest their original ill omened color might remind his visitors of his unlucky excursion to Derby. To sum up the picture, his face was daubed with snuff up to the eyes, and his fingers with ink up to the knuckles. He looked dubiously at Waverley as he approached the little green rail which fenced his desk and stool from the approach of the vulgar. Nothing could give the Bailey more annoyance than the idea of his acquaintance being claimed by any of the unfortunate gentlemen who were now so much more likely to need assistance than to afford profit. But this was the rich young Englishman. Who knew what might be his situation? He was the baron's friend too, what was to be done? While these reflections gave an air of absurd perplexity to the poor man's visage, Waverley, reflecting on the communication he was about to make to him, of a nature so ridiculously contrasted with the appearance of the individual, could not help bursting out a laughing, as he checked the propensity to exclaim with Syphax. Cato's a proper person to entrust a love tale with. As Mr. Macweeble had no idea of any person laughing heartily who was either encircled by peril or oppressed by poverty, the hilarity of Edward's countenance greatly relieved the embarrassment of his own, and, giving him a tolerably hearty welcome to Little Veland, he asked what he would choose for breakfast. His visitor had, in the first place, something for his private ear, and begged leave to bolt the door. Duncan by no means liked this precaution which savoured of danger to be apprehended, but he could not now draw back. Convinced he might trust this man, as he could make it his interest to be faithful, Edward communicated his present situation and future schemes to Macweeble. The wily agent listened with apprehension when he found Waverley was still in a state of proscription, was somewhat comforted by learning that he had a passport, rubbed his hands with glee when he mentioned the amount of his present fortune, opened huge eyes when he heard the brilliancy of his future expectations, but when he expressed his intention to share them with Miss Rose Bradwardine, ecstasy had almost deprived the honest man of his senses. The bailey started from his three-footed stool like the pythoness from her tripod, flung his best wig out of the window, because the block on which it was placed stood in the way of his career, chucked his cap to the ceiling, caught it as it fell. Whistled Tullicorum, danced a highland fling with inimitable grace and agility, and then threw himself exhausted into a chair, exclaiming, Lady Waverley. Ten thousand a year the least penny. Lord preserve my poor understanding. Amen with all my heart, said Waverley, but now, Mr. Macweeble, let us proceed to business. This word had somewhat a sedative effect, but the bailey's head, as he expressed himself, was still, in the bees. He mended his pen, however, marked half a dozen sheets of paper with an ample marginal fold, whipped down Dallas of a stee. Martin's, Styles, from a shelf, where that venerable work roost with stairs, institutions, Dalton's, doubts, Balfour's, practiques, and a parcel of old account books, opened the volume at the article contract of marriage. And prepared to make what he called a SMA a minute to prevent parties fray resiling. With some difficulty Waverley made him comprehend that he was going a little too fast. 
He explained to him that he should want his assistance, in the first place, to make his residence safe for the time, by writing to the officer at Tully Veland that Mr. Stanley, an English gentleman nearly related to Colonel Talbot, was upon a visit of business at Mr. MacWeeble's, and, knowing the state of the country, had sent his passport for Captain Foster's inspection. This produced a polite answer from the officer, with an invitation to Mr. Stanley to dine with him, which was declined, as may easily be supposed, under pretense of business. Waverley's next request was, that Mr. MacWeeble would dispatch a man and horse to, the post town at which Colonel Talbot was to address him, with directions to wait there until the post should bring a letter from Mr. Stanley, and then to forward it to Little Veland with all speed. In a moment the bailey was in search of his apprentice, or servitor, as he was called sixty years since, Jock Screever, and in not much greater space of time Jock was on the back of the white pony. Tack care ye guide him wheel, sir, for he's I been short in the wind since, ahem, Lord be good to me. In a low voice, I was gone to come out why, since I rode whip and spur to fetch the chevalier to red Mr. Waverley and Vich Ian Vor. And an uncanny coup I gat for my pains. Lord forge your honor. I might hae broken my neck, but troth it was an adventure, may ways, nor ain, but this max amends for a. Lady Waverley. Ten thousand a year. Lord be good unto me. But you forget, Mr. MacWeeble, we want the baron's consent, the ladies. Never fear, S.E. be cautioned for them, S.E. G.I.E. you my personal warrandus. Ten thousand a year. It dings Balmawapple out and out, a year's rent's worth of a Balmawapple, fee and life rent. Lord make us thankful. To turn the current of his feelings, Edward inquired if he had heard anything lately of the chieftain of Glenacoich. Not one word, answered MacWeeble, but that he was still in Carlisle Castle, and was soon to be panelled for his life. I dinna wish the young gentleman ill, he said, but I hope that they that hay got him will keep him, and no let him back to this Heeland border to plague us why, a black male and a, a manner o, violent, wrong us, and masterfew, oppression and spoliation. Both by himself and others of his causing, sending, and hounding out. And he couldn't attack care o, the siller when he had gotten it neither, but flung it a, into yon idle queen's lap at Edinburgh, but light come light gain. For my part, I never wish to see a kilt in the country again, nor a red coat, nor a gun, for that matter, unless it were to shoot a pie trick, there a tard y a e stick. And when they have done ye rang, even when ye hae gotten decreed of spoilsy, oppression, and violent profits against them, what better are ye? They hae na a plaque to pay ye, ye need never extract it. With such discourse, and the intervening topics of business, the time passed until dinner, MacWeeble meanwhile promising to devise some mode of introducing Edward at the Duckran, where Rose at present resided, without risk of danger or suspicion. Which seemed no very easy task, since the laird was a very zealous friend to government. The poultry yard had been laid under requisition, and cockaliki and scotch collops soon reeked in the bailey's little parlor. The landlord's corkscrew was just introduced into the muzzle of a pint bottle of claret, cribbed possibly from the cellars of Tully Veland, when the sight of the grey pony passing the window at full trot induced the bailey. But with due precaution, to place it aside for the moment. Enter Jock Screever with a packet for Mr. Stanley, it is Colonel Talbot's seal, and Edward's ringers tremble as he undoes it. Two official papers, folded, signed, and sealed in all formality, drop out. They were hastily picked up by the bailey, who had a natural respect for everything resembling a deed, and, glancing slyly on their titles, his eyes, or rather spectacles are greeted with protection by His Royal Highness to the person of Cosmo Common Bradwardine, E.S.Q. Of that ilk, commonly called Baron of Bradwardine, forfeited for his accession to the late rebellion. The other proves to be a protection of the same tenor in favor of Edward Waverley, E.S.Q. Colonel Talbot's letter was in these words. My dear Edward, I am just arrived here, and yet I have finished my business, it has cost me some trouble though, as you shall hear. I waited upon His Royal Highness immediately on my arrival, and found him in no very good humor for my purpose. Three or four Scotch gentlemen were just leaving his levy. After he had expressed himself to me very courteously. Would you think it, he said, Talbot, 
here have been half a dozen of the most respectable gentlemen and best friends to government north of the fourth, Major Melville of Cairnvrecken, Rubrick of Duckran, and others, who have fairly wrung from me. By their downright importunity, a present protection and the promise of a future pardon for that stubborn old rebel whom they call Baron of Bradwardine. They allege that his high personal character, and the clemency which he showed to such of our people as fell into the rebels' hands, should weigh in his favor, especially as the loss of his estate is likely to be a severe enough punishment. Rubrick has undertaken to keep him at his own house till things are settled in the country, but it's a little hard to be forced in a manner to pardon such a mortal enemy to the house of Brunswick. This was no favorable moment for opening my business, however, I said I was rejoiced to learn that His Royal Highness was in the course of granting such requests, as it emboldened me to present one of the like nature in my own name. He was very angry, but I persisted. I mentioned the uniform support of our three votes in, the House, touched modestly on services abroad, though valuable only in His Royal Highness's having been pleased kindly to accept them. And founded pretty strongly on his own expressions of friendship and goodwill. He was embarrassed, but obstinate. I hinted the policy of detaching, on all future occasions, the heir of such a fortune as your uncle's from the machinations of the disaffected. But I made no impression. I mentioned the obligations which I lay under to Sir Everard and to you personally, and claimed, as the sole reward of my services, that he would be pleased to afford me the means of evincing my gratitude. I perceived that he still meditated a refusal, and, taking my commission from my pocket, I said, as a last resource, that, as His Royal Highness did not, under these pressing circumstances, think me worthy of a favor which he had not scrupled to grant to other gentlemen whose services I could hardly judge more important than my own, I must beg leave to deposit, with all humility, my commission in His Royal Highness's hands. And to retire from the service. He was not prepared for this, he told me to take up my commission, said some handsome things of my services, and granted my request. You are therefore once more a free man, and I have promised for you that you will be a good boy in future, and remember what you owe to the lenity of government. Thus you see my prince can be as generous as yours. I do not pretend, indeed, that he confers a favor with all the foreign graces and compliments of your chevalier errant. But he has a plain English manner, and the evident reluctance with which he grants your request indicates the sacrifice which he makes of his own inclination to your wishes. My friend, the adjutant general, has procured me a duplicate of the baron's protection, the original being in Major Melville's possession, which I send to you. As I know that if you can find him you will have pleasure in being the first to communicate the joyful intelligence. He will of course repair to the Duckran without loss of time, there to ride quarantine for a few weeks. As for you, I give you leave to escort him thither, and to stay a week there, as I understand a certain fair lady is in that quarter. And I have the pleasure to tell you that whatever progress you can make in her good graces will be highly agreeable to Sir Everard and Mrs. Rachel, who will never believe your views and prospects settled, and the three ermines passant in actual safety, until you present them with a Mrs. Edward Waverley. Now, certain love affairs of my own, a good many years since, interrupted some measures which were then proposed in favor of the three ermines passant, so I am bound in honor to make them amends. Therefore make good use of your time, for, when your week is expired, it will be necessary that you go to London to plead your pardon in the law courts. Ever, dear Waverley, yours most truly. Philip Talbot. Chapter 38. Happy's the wooing. That's not long a doing. When the first rapturous sensation occasioned by these excellent tidings had somewhat subsided, Edward proposed instantly to go down to the glen to acquaint the baron with their import. But the cautious Bailey justly observed that, if the baron were to appear instantly in public, the tenantry and villagers might become riotous in expressing their joy, and give offense to the powers that be. A sort of persons for whom the Bailey always had unlimited respect. He therefore proposed that Mr. Waverley should go to Janet Jellatley's and bring the baron up under cloud of night to Little Veland, where he might once more enjoy the luxury of a good bed. In the meanwhile, he said, he himself would go to Captain Foster and show him the baron's protection, and obtain his countenance for harboring him that night. And he would have horses ready on the morrow to set him on his way to the Duckrun along with Mr. Stanley, Wilk denomination, I apprehend, your honor will for the present retain, said the bailey. 
Certainly, Mr. MacWeeble, but will you not go down to the Glen yourself in the evening to meet your patron? That I wad why, uh, my heart. And Mickle obliged to your honor for putting me in mind, oh, my bounden duty. But it will be past sunset afore I get back frae the captains, and at these unsancy hours the Glen has a bad name. There's something no that canny about all Janet Jellotly. The Laird Hill no believe they things, but he was I our rash and venturesome, and feared neither man nor devil, an essay seen oat. But right sure am I Sir George Mackinney says, that no divine can doubt there are witches, since the Bible says thou shalt not suffer them to live, and that no lawyer in Scotland can doubt it, since it is punishable with death by our law. So there's baith law and gospel for it. And his honor winna believe the Leviticus, he might I believe the statute book, but he may tack his ain way oat, it's a hain to Duncan MacWeeble. However, I shall send to ask up all Janet this e'en. It's best no to lightly them that have that character, and will want Davy to turn the spit, for I'll gar Ippy put down a fat goose to the fire for your honors to your supper. When it was near sunset Waverley hastened to the hut. And he could not but allow that superstition had chosen no improper locality, or unfit object, for the foundation of her fantastic terrors. It resembled exactly the description of Spencer. There, in a gloomy hollow glen, she found a little cottage built of sticks and reeds, in homely wise, and walled with sods around, in which a witch did dwell in loathly weeds, and willful want, all careless of her needs, so choosing solitary to abide, far from all neighbors, that her devilish deeds, and hellish arts, from people she might hide, and hurt far off, unknown, whomsoever she espied. He entered the cottage with these verses in his memory. Poor old Janet, bent double with age and bleared with peat smoke, was tottering about the hut with a birch broom, muttering to herself as she endeavored to make her hearth and floor a little clean for the reception of her expected guests. Waverley's step made her start, look up, and fall a trembling, so much had her nerves been on the rack for her patron's safety. With difficulty Waverley made her comprehend that the baron was now safe from personal danger. And when her mind had admitted that joyful news, it was equally hard to make her believe that he was not to enter again upon possession of his estate. It behoved to be, she said, he wad get it back again. Nobody wad be sae gripple as to tack his gear after they had gien him a pardon, and for that inch grab it, I could whiles wish missile a witch for his sake, if I were enough feared the enemy wad tack me at my word. Waverley then gave her some money, and promised that her fidelity should be rewarded. How can I be rewarded, sir, sae weel as just to see my auld maester and Miss Rose come back and brook their ein? Waverley now took leave of Janet, and soon stood beneath the baron's patmos. At a low whistle he observed the veteran peeping out to reconnoitre, like an old badger with his head out of his hole. Ye hey come rather early, my good lad, said he, descending, I question if the redcoats hey beat the tattoo yet, and we're not safe till then. Good news cannot be told too soon, said Waverley. And with infinite joy communicated to him the happy tidings. The old man stood for a moment in silent devotion, then exclaimed, Praise be to God! I shall see my bairn again. And never, I hope, to part with her more, said Waverley. I trust in God not, unless it be to win the means of supporting her, for my things are but in a bruckle state, but what signifies world's gear? And if, said Waverley modestly, there were a situation in life which would put Miss Bradwardine beyond the uncertainty of fortune, and in the rank to which she was born, would you object to it, my dear Baron? Because it would make one of your friends the happiest man in the world? The Baron turned and looked at him with great earnestness. Yes, continued Edward, I shall not consider my sentence of banishment as repealed unless you will give me permission to accompany you to the Duckran, Anne. The Baron seemed collecting all his dignity to make a suitable reply to what? At another time, he would have treated as the propounding a treaty of alliance between the houses of Bradwardine and Waverley. But his efforts were in vain, the father was too mighty for the Baron, the pride of birth and rank were swept away. In the joyful surprise a slight convulsion passed rapidly over his features, as he gave way to the feelings of nature, threw his arms around Waverley's neck, and sobbed out, My son, my son! If I had been to search the world, 
would have made my choice here. Edward returned the embrace with great sympathy of feeling, and for a little while they both kept silence. At length it was broken by Edward. But Miss Bradwardine? She had never a will but her old father's, besides, you are a likely youth, of honest principles and high birth. No, she never had any other will than mine, and in my proudest days I could not have wished a mere eligible espousal for her than the nephew of my excellent old friend, Sir Everard. But I hope, young man, ye deal na rashly in this matter. I hope ye hae secured the approbation of your ain friends and allies, particularly of your uncle, who is in loco parentis. Ah! We maun tak heed o oh, that. Edward assured him that Sir Everard would think himself highly honored in the flattering reception his proposal had met with, and that it had his entire approbation, in evidence of which he put Colonel Talbot's letter into the baron's hand. The baron read it with great attention. Sir Everard, he said, always despised wealth in comparison of honor and birth, and indeed he hath no occasion to court the diva pecunia. Yet I now wish, since this Malcolm turns out such a parricide, for I can call him no better. As to think of alienating the family inheritance, I now wish, his eyes fixed on a part of the roof which was visible above the trees, that I could have left Rose the old holy house and the rigs belonging to it. And yet, said he, resuming more cheerfully, it's maybe as weal as it is. For, as Baron of Bradwardine, I might have thought it my duty to insist upon certain compliances respecting name and bearings, Wilk now, as a landless laird why, a talkerless daughter, no one can blame me for departing from. Now, heaven be praised, thought Edward, that Sir Everard does not hear these scruples. The three ermines passant and rampant bear would certainly have gone together by the ears. He then, with all the ardor of a young lover, assured the baron that he sought for his happiness only in Rose's heart and hand, and thought himself as happy in her father's simple approbation as if he had settled an earldom upon his daughter. They now reached little Veolan. The goose was smoking on the table, and the bailey brandished his knife and fork. A joyous greeting took place between him and his patron. The kitchen, too, had its company. All Janet was established at the ingle nook. Davy had turned the spit to his immortal honor, and even Ban and Busker, in the liberality of Macweeble's joy, had been stuffed to the throat with food, and now lay snoring on the floor. The next day conducted the baron and his young friend to the Duckran, where the former was expected, in consequence of the success of the nearly unanimous application of the Scottish friends of government in his favor. This had been so general and so powerful that it was almost thought his estate might have been saved, had it not passed into the rapacious hands of his unworthy kinsman, whose right, arising out of the baron's attainder, could not be affected by a pardon from the crown. The old gentleman, however, said, with his usual spirit, he was more gratified by the hold he possessed in the good opinion of his neighbors than he would have been in being rehabilitated and restored in integrum, had it been found practicable. We shall not attempt to describe the meeting of the father and daughter, loving each other so affectionately and separated under such perilous circumstances. Still less shall we attempt to analyze the deep blush of Rose at receiving the compliments of Waverley, or stop to inquire whether she had any curiosity respecting the particular cause of his journey to Scotland at that period. We shall not even trouble the reader with the humdrum details of a courtship sixty years since. It is enough to say that, under so strict a martinet as the Baron, all things were conducted in due form. He took upon himself, the morning after their arrival, the task of announcing the proposal of Waverley to Rose, which she heard with a proper degree of maiden timidity. Fame does, however, say that Waverley had the evening before found five minutes to apprise her of what was coming, while the rest of the company were looking at three twisted serpents which formed a jet d'eau in the garden. My fair readers will judge for themselves, but, for my part, I cannot conceive how so important an affair could be communicated in so short a space of time at least, it certainly took a full hour in the baron's mode of conveying it. Waverley was now considered as a received lover in all the forms. He was made, by dint of smirking and nodding on the part of the lady of the house, to sit next Miss Bradwardine at dinner, to be Miss Bradwardine's partner at cards. If he came into the room, she of the four Miss Rubricks who chanced to be next rose was sure to recollect that her thimble or her scissors were at the other end of the room in order to leave the seat nearest to Miss Bradwardine vacant for his occupation. 
and sometimes, if Papa and Mama were not in the way to keep them on their good behavior, the missus would titter a little. The old Laird of Duckran would also have his occasional jest, and the old lady her remark. Even the Baron could not refrain. But here Rose escaped every embarrassment but that of conjecture, for his wit was usually couched in a Latin quotation. The very footmen sometimes grinned too broadly, the maidservants giggled mayhap too loud and a provoking air of intelligence seemed to pervade the whole family. Alice Bean, the pretty maid of the cavern, who, after her father's misfortune, as she called it, had attended Rose as fee to chamber, smiled and smirked with the best of them. Rose and Edward, however, endured all these little vexatious circumstances as other folks have done before and since, and probably contrived to obtain some indemnification, since they are not supposed, on the whole to have been particularly unhappy during Waverley's six days' stay at the Duckrin. It was finally arranged that Edward should go to Waverley Honour to make the necessary arrangements for his marriage, thence to London to take the proper measures for pleading his pardon, and return as soon as possible to claim the hand of his plighted bride. He also intended in his journey to visit Colonel Talbot, but, above all, it was his most important object to learn the fate of the unfortunate chief of Glenacoich. To visit him at Carlisle, and to try whether anything could be done for procuring, if not a pardon, a commutation at least, or alleviation, of the punishment to which he was almost certain of being condemned. And, in case of the worst, to offer the miserable Flora an asylum with Rose, or otherwise to assist her views in any mode which might seem possible. The fate of Fergus seemed hard to be averted. Edward had already striven to interest his friend, Colonel Talbot, in his behalf but had been given distinctly to understand by his reply that his credit in matters of that nature was totally exhausted. The colonel was still in Edinburgh, and proposed to wait there for some months upon business confided to him by the Duke of Cumberland. He was to be joined by Lady Emily, to whom easy travelling and goat's way were recommended, and who was to journey northward under the escort of Francis Stanley. Edward, therefore, met the colonel at Edinburgh, who wished him joy in the kindest manner on his approaching happiness and cheerfully undertook many commissions which our hero was necessarily obliged to delegate to his charge. But on the subject of Fergus he was inexorable. He satisfied Edward, indeed, that his interference would be unavailing, but, besides, Colonel Talbot owned that he could not conscientiously use any influence in favor of that unfortunate gentleman. Justice, he said, which demanded some penalty of those who had wrapped the whole nation in fear and in mourning, could not perhaps have selected a fitter victim. He came to the field with the fullest light upon the nature of his attempt. He had studied and understood the subject. His father's fate could not intimidate him, the lenity of the laws which had restored to him his father's property and rights could not melt him. That he was brave, generous, and possessed many good qualities only rendered him the more dangerous, that he was enlightened and accomplished made his crime the less excusable. That he was an enthusiast in a wrong cause only made him the more fit to be its martyr. Above all, he had been the means of bringing many hundreds of men into the field who, without him, would never have broken the peace of the country. I repeat it, said the colonel, though heaven knows with a heart distressed for him as an individual, that this young gentleman has studied and fully understood the desperate game which he has played. He threw for life or death, a coronet or a coffin, and he cannot now be permitted, with justice to the country, to draw stakes because the dice have gone against him. Such was the reasoning of those times, held even by brave and humane men towards a vanquished enemy. Let us devoutly hope that, in this respect at least, we shall never see the scenes or hold the sentiments that were general in Britain sixty years since. Chapter 39 Tomorrow? Oh that's sudden, spare him, spare him. Shakespeare Edward, attended by his former servant Alec Polworth, who had re-entered his service at Edinburgh, reached Carlisle while the commission of Oyer and Terminer on his unfortunate associates was yet sitting. He had pushed forward in haste, not, alas, with the most distant hope of saving Fergus, but to see him for the last time. I ought to have mentioned that he had furnished funds for the defense of the prisoners in the most liberal manner, as soon as he heard that the day of trial was fixed. A solicitor and the first counsel accordingly attended but it was upon the same footing on which the first physicians are usually summoned to the bedside of some dying man of rank, the doctors to take the advantage of some incalculable chance of an exertion of nature. 
the lawyers to avail themselves of the barely possible occurrence of some legal flaw. Edward pressed into the court, which was extremely crowded, but by his arriving from the north, and his extreme eagerness and agitation, it was supposed he was a relation of the prisoners, and people made way for him. It was the third sitting of the court, and there were two men at the bar. The verdict of guilty was already pronounced. Edward just glanced at the bar during the momentous pause which ensued. There was no mistaking the stately form and noble features of Fergus MacIver, although his dress was squalid and his countenance tinged with the sickly yellow hue of long and close imprisonment. By his side was Evan Macambich. Edward felt sick and dizzy as he gazed on them. But he was recalled to himself as the clerk of arraigns pronounced the solemn words, Fergus MacIver of Glenacoich, otherwise called Vich Ian Vor, and Evan MacIver, in the DHU of Tarasclough, otherwise called Evan DHU. Otherwise called Evan Macambich, or Evan DHU Macambich, you, and each of you, stand attainted of high treason. What have you to say for yourselves why the court should not pronounce judgment against you, that you die according to law? Fergus, as the presiding judge was putting on the fatal cap of judgment, placed his own bonnet upon his head, regarded him with a steadfast and stern look, and replied in a firm voice. I cannot let this numerous audience suppose that to such an appeal I have no answer to make. But what I have to say you would not bear to hear, for my defense would be your condemnation. Proceed, then, in the name of God, to do what is permitted to you. Yesterday and the day before you have condemned loyal and honorable blood to be poured forth like water. Spare not mine. Were that of all my ancestors in my veins, would have periled it in this quarrel. He resumed his seat and refused again to rise. Evan Macambich looked at him with great earnestness, and, rising up, seemed anxious to speak. But the confusion of the court, and the perplexity arising from thinking in a language different from that in which he was to express himself, kept him silent. There was a murmur of compassion among the spectators, from the idea that the poor fellow intended to plead the influence of his superior as an excuse for his crime. The judge commanded silence, and encouraged Evan to proceed. I was only ganging to say, my lord, said Evan, in what he meant to be an insinuating manner, that if your excellent honor and the honorable court would let Vich Ian Vore go free just this once, and let him gee back to France. And no to trouble King George's government again, that only six o, oh, the very best of his clan will be willing to be justified in his stead. And if you'll just let me gee down to Glenacoich, I'll fetch them up to ye missile, to head or hang, and you may begin why, me the very first man. Notwithstanding the solemnity of the occasion, a sort of laugh was heard in the court at the extraordinary nature of the proposal. The judge checked this indecency, and Evan, looking sternly around, when the murmur abetted, if the Saxon gentlemen are laughing, he said, because a poor man, such as me, thinks my life, or the life of six of my degree, is worth that of Vich Ian Vor, it's like enough they may be very right. But if they laugh because they think I would not keep my word and come back to redeem him, I can tell them they can neither the heart of a Highlandman nor the honor of a gentleman. There was no farther inclination to laugh among the audience, and a dead silence ensued. The judge then pronounced upon both prisoners the sentence of the law of high treason, with all its horrible accompaniments. The execution was appointed for the ensuing day. For you, Fergus MacIver, continued the judge, I can hold out no hope of mercy. You must prepare against tomorrow for your last sufferings here, and your great audit hereafter. I desire nothing else, my lord, answered Fergus, in the same manly and firm tone. The hard eyes of Evan, which had been perpetually bent on his chief, were moistened with a tear. For you, poor ignorant man, continued the judge, who, following the ideas in which you have been educated, have this day given us a striking example how the loyalty due to the king and state alone is, from your unhappy ideas of clanship. Transferred to some ambitious individual who ends by making you the tool of his crimes, for you, I say, I feel so much compassion that, if you can make up your mind to petition for grace, I will endeavor to procure it for you. Otherwise. Grace me no grace, said Evan, since you are to shed Vich Ian Vor's blood, the only favor I would accept from you is to bid them loose my hands and gie me my claymore, and bide you just a minute sitting where you are. Remove the prisoners, said the judge, his blood be upon his own head. Almost stupefied with his feelings, 
Edward found that the rush of the crowd had conveyed him out into the street ere he knew what he was doing. His immediate wish was to see and speak with Fergus once more. He applied at the castle where his unfortunate friend was confined, but was refused admittance. The high sheriff, a non-commissioned officer said, had requested of the governor that none should be admitted to see the prisoner excepting his confessor and his sister. And where was Miss MacIver? They gave him the direction. It was the house of a respectable Catholic family near Carlisle. Repulsed from the gate of the castle, and not venturing to make application to the high sheriff or judges in his own unpopular name, he had recourse to the solicitor who came down in Fergus's behalf. This gentleman told him that it was thought the public mind was in danger of being debauched by the account of the last moments of these persons, as given by the friends of the pretender. That there had been a resolution, therefore, to exclude all such persons as had not the plea of near kindred for attending upon them. Yet he promised, to oblige the heir of Waverley Honor, to get him an order for admittance to the prisoner the next morning, before his irons were knocked off for execution. Is it of Fergus MacIver they speak thus, thought Waverley, or do I dream? Of Fergus, the bold, the chivalrous, the free-minded, the lofty chieftain of a tribe devoted to him? Is it he, that I have seen lead the chase and head the attack, the brave, the active, the young, the noble, the love of ladies, and the theme of song, is it he who is ironed like a malefactor, who is to be dragged on a hurdle to the common gallows? To die a lingering and cruel death, and to be mangled by the hand of the most outcast of wretches? Evil indeed was the spectre that boded such a fate as this to the brave chief of Glenacoich. With a faltering voice he requested the solicitor to find means to warn Fergus of his intended visit, should he obtain permission to make it. He then turned away from him, and, returning to the inn, wrote a scarcely intelligible note to Flora MacIver, intimating his purpose to wait upon her that evening. The messenger brought back a letter in Flora's beautiful Italian hand, which seemed scarce to tremble even under this load of misery. Miss Flora MacIver, the letter bore could not refuse to see the dearest friend of her dear brother, even in her present circumstances of unparalleled distress. When Edward reached Miss MacIver's present place of abode he was instantly admitted. In a large and gloomy tapestried apartment Flora was seated by a latticed window, sewing what seemed to be a garment of white flannel. At a little distance sat an elderly woman, apparently a foreigner, and of a religious order. She was reading in a book of Catholic devotion but when Waverley entered laid it on the table and left the room. Flora rose to receive him, and stretched out her hand, but neither ventured to attempt speech. Her fine complexion was totally gone, her person considerably emaciated. And her face and hands as white as the purest statuary marble, forming a strong contrast with her sable dress and jet-black hair. Yet, amid these marks of distress there was nothing negligent or ill-arranged about her attire. Even her hair, though totally without ornament, was disposed with her usual attention to neatness. The first words she uttered were, Have you seen him? Alas, no, answered Waverley, I have been refused admittance. It accords with the rest, she said, but we must submit. Shall you obtain leave, do you suppose? For, for, tomorrow, said Waverley, but muttering the last word so faintly that it was almost unintelligible. I, then or never, said Flora, until, she added, looking upward, the time when, I trust, we shall all meet. But I hope you will see him while earth yet bears him. He always loved you at his heart, though, but it is vain to talk of the past. Vain indeed, echoed Waverley. Or even of the future, my good friend, said Flora, so far as earthly events are concerned. For how often have I pictured to myself the strong possibility of this horrid issue, and tasked myself to consider how I could support my part, and yet how far has all my anticipation fallen short of the unimaginable bitterness of this hour. Dear Flora, if your strength of mind. I, there it is, she answered, somewhat wildly, there is, Mr. Waverley, there is a busy devil at my heart that whispers, but it were madness to listen to it that the strength of mind on which Flora prided herself has murdered her brother. Good God! How can you give utterance to a thought so shocking? I, is it not so? But yet it haunts me like a phantom, I know it is unsubstantial and vain, but it will be present. Will intrude its horrors on my mind. 
We'll whisper that my brother, as volatile as ardent, would have divided his energies amid a hundred objects. It was I who taught him to concentrate them and to gauge all on this dreadful and desperate cast. Oh that I could recollect that I had but once said to him, he that striketh with the sword shall die by the sword, that I had but once said, remain at home, reserve yourself, your vassals, your life, for enterprises within the reach of man. But oh, Mr. Waverley, I spurred his fiery temper, and half of his ruin at least lies with his sister. The horrid idea which she had intimated, Edward endeavored to combat by every incoherent argument that occurred to him. He recalled to her the principles on which both thought it their duty to act, and in which they had been educated. Do not think I have forgotten them, she said, looking up with eager quickness, I do not regret his attempt because it was wrong. Oh no, on that point I am armed, but because it was impossible it could end otherwise than thus. Yet it did not always seem so desperate and hazardous as it was. And it would have been chosen by the bold spirit of Fergus whether you had approved it or no, your counsels only served to give unity and consistence to his conduct, to dignify, but not to precipitate, his resolution. Flora had soon ceased to listen to Edward, and was again intent upon her needlework. Do you remember, she said, looking up with a ghastly smile, you once found me making Fergus's bride favors, and now I am sewing his bridal garment. Our friends here, she continued, with suppressed emotion, are to give hallowed earth in their chapel to the bloody relics of the last vich Ian Vor. But they will not all rest together, no, his head. I shall not have the last miserable consolation of kissing the cold lips of my dear, dear Fergus. The unfortunate Flora here, after one or two hysterical sobs, fainted in her chair. The lady, who had been attending in the anteroom, now entered hastily, and begged Edward to leave the room, but not the house. When he was recalled, after the space of nearly half an hour, he found that, by a strong effort, Miss MacIver had greatly composed herself. It was then he ventured to urge Miss Bradwardine's claim to be considered as an adopted sister, and empowered to assist her plans for the future. I have had a letter from my dear Rose, she replied, to the same purpose. Sorrow is selfish and engrossing, or I would have written to express that, even in my own despair, I felt a gleam of pleasure at learning her happy prospects, and at hearing that the good old baron has escaped the general wreck. Give this to my dearest Rose, it is her poor Flora's only ornament of value, and was the gift of a princess. She put into his hands a case containing the chain of diamonds with which she used to decorate her hair. To me it is in future useless. The kindness of my friends has secured me a retreat in the convent of the Scottish Benedictine nuns in Paris. Tomorrow, if indeed I can survive tomorrow, I set forward on my journey with this venerable sister. And now, Mr. Waverley, adieu. May you be as happy with Rose as your amiable dispositions deserve, and think sometimes on the friends you have lost. Do not attempt to see me again, it would be mistaken kindness. She gave him her hand, on which Edward shed a torrent of tears, and with a faltering step withdrew from the apartment, and returned to the town of Carlisle. At the inn he found a letter from his law friend intimating that he would be admitted to Fergus next morning as soon as the castle gates were opened. And permitted to remain with him till the arrival of the sheriff gave signal for the fatal procession. Chapter 40 A darker departure is near. The death drum is muffled, and sable the beer. Campbell After a sleepless night, the first dawn of morning found Waverley on the esplanade in front of the old Gothic gate of Carlisle Castle. But he paced it long in every direction before the hour when, according to the rules of the garrison, the gates were opened and the drawbridge lowered. He produced his order to the sergeant of the guard and was admitted. The place of Fergus's confinement was a gloomy and vaulted apartment in the central part of the castle, a huge old tower, supposed to be of great antiquity, and surrounded by outworks, seemingly of Henry VIII's time, or somewhat later. The grating of the large old-fashioned bars and bolts, withdrawn for the purpose of admitting Edward, was answered by the clash of chains, as the unfortunate chieftain, strongly and heavily fettered, shuffled along the stone floor of his prison to fling himself into his friend's arms. My dear Edward, he said, in a firm and even cheerful voice, this is truly kind. I heard of your approaching happiness with the highest pleasure. And how does Rose? And how is our old whimsical friend the Baron? 
Well, I trust, since I see you at freedom. And how will you settle precedence between the three ermines passant and the baron bootjack? How, oh how, my dear Fergus, can you talk of such things at such a moment? Why, we have entered Carlisle with happier auspices, to be sure, on the 16th of November last, for example, when we marched in side by side, and hoisted the white flag on these ancient towers. But I am no boy, to sit down and weep because the luck has gone against me. I knew the stake which I risked, we played the game boldly and the forfeit shall be paid manfully. And now, since my time is short, let me come to the questions that interest me most, the prince, has he escaped the bloodhounds? He has, and is in safety. Praise be God for that. Tell me the particulars of his escape. Waverley communicated that remarkable history, so far as it had then transpired, to which Fergus listened with deep interest. He then asked after several other friends, and made many minute inquiries concerning the fate of his own clansmen. They had suffered less than other tribes who had been engaged in the affair. For, having in a great measure dispersed and returned home after the captivity of their chieftain, according to the universal custom of the Highlanders, they were not in arms when the insurrection was finally suppressed. And consequently were treated with less rigor. This Fergus heard with great satisfaction. You are rich, he said, Waverly, and you are generous. When you hear of these poor MacIvers being distressed about their miserable possessions by some harsh overseer or agent of government, remember you have worn their tartan and are an adopted son of their race. The Baron, who knows our manners and lives near our country, will apprise you of the time and means to be their protector. Will you promise this to the last Vich Ian Vor? Edward, as may well be believed, pledged his word. Which he afterward so amply redeemed that his memory still lives in these glens by the name of the friend of the sons of Ivor. Would to God, continued the chieftain, I could bequeath to you my rights to the love and obedience of this primitive and brave race. Or at least, as I have striven to do, persuade poor Evan to accept of his life upon their terms, and be to you what he has been to me, the kindest, the bravest, the most devoted. The tears which his own fate could not draw forth fell fast for that of his foster brother. But, said he, drying them, that cannot be. You cannot be to them vich Ian Vor. And these three magic words, said he, half smiling, are the only open sesame to their feelings and sympathies, and poor Evan must attend his foster brother in death, as he has done through his whole life. And I am sure, said Macambich, raising himself from the floor, on which, for fear of interrupting their conversation, he had lain so still that, in the obscurity of the apartment. Edward was not aware of his presence, I am sure Evan never desired or deserved a better end than just to die with his chieftain. And now, said Fergus, while we are upon the subject of clanship, what think you now of the prediction of the Bodak glass? Then, before Edward could answer, I saw him again last night he stood in the slip of moonshine which fell from that high and narrow window towards my bed. Why should I fear him? I thought. Tomorrow, long ere this time, I shall be as immaterial as he. False spirit, I said, art thou come to close thy walks on earth and to enjoy thy triumph in the fall of the last descendant of thine enemy? The specter seemed to beckon and to smile as he faded from my sight. What do you think of it? I asked the same question of the priest who is a good and sensible man. He admitted that the church allowed that such apparitions were possible, but urged me not to permit my mind to dwell upon it, as imagination plays us such strange tricks. What do you think of it? Much as your confessor, said Waverley, willing to avoid dispute upon such a point at such a moment. A tap at the door now announced that good man, and Edward retired while he administered to both prisoners the last rites of religion, in the mode which the Church of Rome prescribes. In about an hour he was readmitted. Soon after, a file of soldiers entered with a blacksmith, who struck the fetters from the legs of the prisoners. You see the compliment they pay to our highland strength and courage. We have lain chained here like wild beasts, till our legs are cramped into palsy, and when they free us they send six soldiers with loaded muskets to prevent our taking the castle by storm. Edward afterwards learned that these severe precautions had been taken in consequence of a desperate attempt of the prisoners to escape, in which they had very nearly succeeded. Shortly afterwards the drums of the garrison beat to arms. 
This is the last turnout, said Fergus, that I shall hear and obey. And now, my dear, dear Edward, ere we part let us speak of Flora, a subject which awakes the tenderest feeling that yet thrills within me. We part not here, said Waverley. Oh yes, we do, you must come no farther. Not that I fear what is to follow for myself, he said proudly. Nature has her tortures as well as art, and how happy should we think the man who escapes from the throes of a mortal and painful disorder in the space of a short half hour. And this matter, spin it out as they will, cannot last longer. But what a dying man can suffer firmly may kill a living friend to look upon. This same law of high treason, he continued, with astonishing firmness and composure, is one of the blessings, Edward, with which your free country has accommodated poor old Scotland, her own jurisprudence, as I have heard, was much milder. But I suppose one day or other, when there are no longer any wild Highlanders to benefit by its tender mercies, they will blot it from their records as leveling them with a nation of cannibals. The mummery, too, of exposing the senseless head, they have not the wit to grace mine with a paper coronet, there would be some satire in that, Edward. I hope they will set it on the Scotch gate though, that I may look, even after death, to the blue hills of my own country, which I love so dearly. The baron would have added. Morator, e Morian's dulces reminiscitor argos. A bustle, and the sound of wheels and horses' feet, was now heard in the courtyard of the castle. As I have told you why you must not follow me, and these sounds admonish me that my time flies fast, tell me how you found poor Flora. Waverley, with a voice interrupted by suffocating sensations, gave some account of the state of her mind. Poor Flora, answered the chief, she could have borne her own sentence of death, but not mine. You, Waverley, will soon know the happiness of mutual affection in the married state, long, long may rose and you enjoy it. But you can never know the purity of feeling which combines two orphans like Flora and me, left alone as it were in the world and being all in all to each other from our very infancy. But her strong sense of duty and predominant feeling of loyalty will give new nerve to her mind after the immediate and acute sensation of this parting has passed away. She will then think of Fergus as of the heroes of our race, upon whose deeds she loved to dwell. Shall she not see you then? asked Waverley. She seemed to expect it. A necessary deceit will spare her the last dreadful parting. I could not part with her without tears, and I cannot bear that these men should think they have power to extort them. She was made to believe she would see me at a later hour, and this letter, which my confessor will deliver, will apprise her that all is over. An officer now appeared and intimated that the high sheriff and his attendants waited before the gate of the castle to claim the bodies of Fergus MacIver and Evan Macambitch. I come, said Fergus. Accordingly, Supporting Edward by the arm and followed by Evan D.H.U. and the priest, he moved down the stairs of the tower, the soldiers bringing up the rear. The court was occupied by a squadron of dragoons and a battalion of infantry, drawn up in hollow square. Within their ranks was the sledge or hurdle on which the prisoners were to be drawn to the place of execution, about a mile distant from Carlisle. It was painted black, and drawn by a white horse. At one end of the vehicle sat the executioner a horrid-looking fellow, as beseemed his trade, with the broad axe in his hand, at the other end, next the horse, was an empty seat for two persons. Through the deep and dark gothic archway that opened on the drawbridge were seen on horseback the high sheriff and his attendants, whom the etiquette betwixt the civil and military powers did not permit to come farther. This is well got up for a closing scene, said Fergus, smiling disdainfully as he gazed around upon the apparatus of terror. Evan D.H.U. exclaimed with some eagerness, after looking at the dragoons, these are the very shields that galloped off at Gladsmere, before we could kill a dozen o oh, them. They look bold enough now, however. The priest entreated him to be silent. The sledge now approached, and Fergus, turning round, embraced Waverley, kissed him on each side of the face, and stepped nimbly into his place. Evan sat down by his side. The priest was to follow in a carriage belonging to his patron, the Catholic gentleman at whose house Flora resided. As Fergus waved his hand to Edward the ranks closed around the sledge, and the whole procession began to move forward. There was a momentary stop at the gateway, while the governor of the castle and the high sheriff went through a short ceremony, 
the military officer there delivering over the persons of the criminals to the civil power. God save King George! said the High Sheriff. When the formality concluded, Fergus stood erect in the sledge, and, with a firm and steady voice, replied, God save King James! These were the last words which Waverley heard him speak. The procession resumed its march, and the sledge vanished from beneath the portal, under which it had stopped for an instant. The dead march was then heard, and its melancholy sounds were mingled with those of a muffled peal told from the neighboring cathedral. The sound of military music died away as the procession moved on. The sullen clang of the bells was soon heard to sound alone. The last of the soldiers had now disappeared from under the vaulted archway through which they had been filing for several minutes. The courtyard was now totally empty, but Waverley still stood there as if stupefied, his eyes fixed upon the dark pass where he had so lately seen the last glimpse of his friend. At length a female servant of the governor's, struck with compassion, at the stupefied misery which his countenance expressed, asked him if he would not walk into her master's house and sit down? She was obliged to repeat her question twice ere he comprehended her, but at length it recalled him to himself. Declining the courtesy by a hasty gesture, he pulled his hat over his eyes, and, leaving the castle, walked as swiftly as he could through the empty streets till he regained his inn, then rushed into an apartment and bolted the door. In about an hour and a half, which seemed an age of unutterable suspense, the sound of the drums and fifes performing a lively air, and the confused murmur of the crowd which now filled the streets, so lately deserted, apprised him that all was finished, and that the military and populace were returning from the dreadful scene. I will not attempt to describe his sensations. In the evening the priest made him a visit, and informed him that he did so by directions of his deceased friend, to assure him that Fergus MacIver had died as he lived, and remembered his friendship to the last. He added, he had also seen Flora, whose state of mind seemed more composed since all was over. With her and Sister Teresa the priest proposed next day to leave Carlisle for the nearest seaport from which they could embark for France. Waverley forced on this good man a ring of some value and a sum of money to be employed, as he thought might gratify Flora, in the services of the Catholic Church for the memory of his friend. Fungark in the Munera, he repeated, as the ecclesiastic retired. Yet why not class these acts of remembrance with other honors, with which affection in all sects pursues the memory of the dead? The next morning ere daylight he took leave of the town of Carlisle, promising to himself never again to enter its walls. He dared hardly look back towards the Gothic battlements of the fortified gate under which he passed, for the place is surrounded with an old wall. There no there, said Alec Polworth, who guessed the cause of the dubious look which Waverley cast backward, and who, with the vulgar appetite for the horrible, was master of each detail of the butchery, the heads are our the scotchiate. As they see it. It's a great pity of Evan D.H.U., who was a very well-meaning, good-natured man, to be a highlandman, and indeed so was the Laird O. Glenacoich too, for that matter, when he wasna in ain O. his tiravis. Chapter 41 Dulce Domum the impression of horror with which Waverley left Carlyle softened by degrees into melancholy, a gradation which was accelerated by the painful yet soothing task of writing to Rose. And, while he could not suppress his own feelings of the calamity, he endeavored to place it in a light which might grieve her without shocking her imagination. The picture which he drew for her benefit he gradually familiarized to his own mind, and his next letters were more cheerful, and referred to the prospects of peace and happiness which lay before them. Yet, though his first horrible sensations had sunk into melancholy, Edward had reached his native country before he could, as usual on former occasions, look round for enjoyment upon the face of nature. He then, for the first time since leaving Edinburgh, began to experience that pleasure which almost all feel who return to a verdant, populous, and highly cultivated country from scenes of waste desolation or of solitary and melancholy grandeur. But how were those feelings enhanced when he entered on the domain so long possessed by his forefathers, recognized the old oaks of Waverley Chase, thought with what delight he should introduce Rose to all his favorite haunts. Beheld at length the towers of the venerable hall arise above the woods which embowered it, and finally threw himself into the arms of the venerable relations to whom he owed so much duty and affection. The happiness of their meeting was not tarnished by a single word of reproach. 
On the contrary, whatever pained Sir Everard and Mrs. Rachel had felt during Waverley's perilous engagement with the young chevalier, it assorted too well with the principles in which they had been brought up to incur reprobation, or even censure. Colonel Talbot also had smoothed the way with great address for Edward's favorable reception by dwelling upon his gallant behavior in the military character, particularly his bravery and generosity at Preston. Until, warmed at the idea of their nephews engaging in single combat, making prisoner, and saving from slaughter so distinguished an officer as the colonel himself. The imagination of the baronet and his sister ranked the exploits of Edward with those of Wilibert, Hildebrand, and Nigel, the vaunted heroes of their line. The appearance of Waverley, embrowned by exercise and dignified by the habits of military discipline, had acquired an athletic and hardy character, which not only verified the colonel's narration, but surprised and delighted all the inhabitants of Waverley honor. They crowded to see, to hear him, and to sing his praises. Mr. Pembroke, who secretly extolled his spirit and courage in embracing the genuine cause of the Church of England, censured his pupil gently, nevertheless, for being so careless of his manuscripts, which indeed, he said, had occasioned him some personal inconvenience, as, upon the baronet's being arrested by a king's messenger, he had deemed it prudent to retire to a concealment called, the priest's hole from the use it had been put to in former days. Where, he assured our hero, the butler had thought it safe to venture with food only once in the day, so that he had been repeatedly compelled to dine upon victuals either absolutely cold or, what was worse, only half warm. Not to mention that sometimes his bed had not been arranged for two days together. Waverley's mind involuntarily turned to the Patmos of the Baron of Bradwardine who was well pleased with Janet's fare and a few bunches of straw stowed in a cleft in the front of a sand cliff. But he made no remarks upon a contrast which could only mortify his worthy tutor. All was now in a bustle to prepare for the nuptials of Edward, an event to which the good old baronet and Mrs. Rachel looked forward as if to the renewal of their own youth. The match, as Colonel Talbot had intimated, had seemed to them in the highest degree eligible, having every recommendation but wealth of which they themselves had more than enough. Mr. Clippurse was therefore summoned to Waverley Honor, under better auspices than at the commencement of our story. But Mr. Clippurse came not alone. For, being now stricken in years, he had associated with him a nephew, a younger vulture, as our English juvenile, who tells the tale of Swallow the attorney, might have called him, and they now carried on business as Messrs. Clippurse and Hookham. These worthy gentlemen had directions to make the necessary settlements on the most splendid scale of liberality, as if Edward were to wed a peeress in her own right, with her paternal estate tacked to the fringe of her ermine. But before entering upon a subject of proverbial delay, I must remind my reader of the progress of a stone rolled downhill by an idle truant boy, a pastime at which I was myself expert in my more juvenile years, it moves at first slowly. Avoiding by inflection every obstacle of the least importance. But when it has attained its full impulse, and draws near the conclusion of its career, it smokes and thunders down, taking a rood at every spring, clearing hedge and ditch like a Yorkshire huntsman, and becoming most furiously rapid in its course when it is nearest to being consigned to rest for ever. Even such is the course of a narrative like that which you are perusing. The earlier events are studiously dwelt upon, that you, kind reader, may be introduced to the character rather by narrative than by the duller medium of direct description. But when the story draws near its close, we hurry over the circumstances, however important, which your imagination must have forestalled, and leave you to suppose those things which it would be abusing your patience to relate at length. We are, therefore, so far from attempting to trace the dull progress of Messrs. Clippurse and Hookham, or that of their worthy official brethren who had the charge of suing out the pardons of Edward Waverley and his intended father-in-law, that we can but touch upon matters more attractive. The mutual epistles, for example, which were exchanged between Sir Everard and the Baron upon this occasion, though matchless specimens of eloquence in their way, must be consigned to merciless oblivion. Nor can I tell you at length how worthy Aunt Rachel, not without a delicate and affectionate allusion to the circumstances which had transferred Rose's maternal diamonds to the hands of Donald Bean Lean. Stocked her casket with a set of jewels that a duchess might have envied. Moreover, the reader will have the goodness to imagine that Job Houghton and his dame were suitably provided for, although they could never be persuaded that their son fell otherwise than fighting by the young squire's side. 
So that Alec, who, as a lover of truth, had made many needless attempts to expound the real circumstances to them, was finally ordered to say not a word more upon the subject. He indemnified himself, however, by the liberal allowance of desperate battles, grisly executions, and rawhead and bloody bone stories with which he astonished the servants' hall. But although these important matters may be briefly told in narrative, like a newspaper report of a chancery suit, yet, with all the urgency which Waverley could use, the real time which the law proceedings occupied. Joined to the delay occasioned by the mode of travelling at that period, rendered it considerably more than two months ere Waverley, having left England. Alighted once more at the mansion of the Laird of Duckran to claim the hand of his plighted bride. The day of his marriage was fixed for the sixth after his arrival. The Baron of Bradwardine, with whom bridles, christenings, and funerals were festivals of high and solemn import, felt a little hurt that. Including the family of the Duckran and all the immediate vicinity who had title to be present on such an occasion, there could not be above thirty persons collected. When he was married, he observed, three hundred horse of gentlemen born, besides servants, and some score or two of highland lairds, who never got on horseback, were present on the occasion. But his pride found some consolation in reflecting that, he and his son-in-law having been so lately in arms against government, it might give matter of reasonable fear and offence to the ruling powers if they were to collect together the kith, kin, and allies of their houses, arrayed in a fear of war, as was the ancient custom of Scotland on these occasions, and, without dubitation, he concluded with a sigh. Many of those who would have rejoiced most freely upon these joyful espousals are either gone to a better place or are now exiles from their native land. The marriage took place on the appointed day. The Reverend Mr. Rubrick, kinsman to the proprietor of the hospitable mansion where it was solemnest, and chaplain to the Baron of Bradwardine, had the satisfaction to unite their hands. And Frank Stanley acted as bridesman, having joined Edward with that view soon after his arrival. Lady Emmeline Colonel Talbot had proposed being present, but Lady Emily's health, when the day approached, was found inadequate to the journey. In amends it was arranged that Edward Waverley and his lady, who, with the baron, proposed an immediate journey to Waverley Honour, should in their way spend a few days at an estate which Colonel Talbot had been tempted to purchase in Scotland as a very great bargain, and at which he proposed to reside for some time. Chapter 42 This is no mine ein house, I ken by the biggying oat. Old Song The nuptial party travelled in great style. There was a coach and six after the newest pattern, which Sir Everard had presented to his nephew, that dazzled with its splendor the eyes of one half of Scotland, there was the family coach of Mr. Rubrick. Both these were crowded with ladies, and there were gentlemen on horseback, with their servants, to the number of a round score. Nevertheless, without having the fear of famine before his eyes, Bailey Macweeble met them in the road to entreat that they would pass by his house at Little Veolan. The Baron stared, and said his son and he would certainly ride by Little Veolan and pay their compliments to the bailey, but could not think of bringing with them the Hail Comitatus Nuptialis, or matrimonial procession. He added, that, as he understood that the barony had been sold by its unworthy possessor, he was glad to see his old friend Duncan had regained his situation under the new dominus, or proprietor. The bailey ducked, bowed, and fidgeted, and then again insisted upon his invitation. Until the baron, though rather piqued at the pertinacity of his instances, could not nevertheless refuse to consent without making evident sensations which he was anxious to conceal. He fell into a deep study as they approached the top of the avenue, and was only startled from it by observing that the battlements were replaced, the ruins cleared away, and, most wonderful of all, that the two great stone bears. Those mutilated dagons of his idolatry, had resumed their posts over the gateway. Now this new proprietor, said he to Edward, has shown mere gusto, as the Italians call it, in the short time he has had this domain, than that hound Malcolm, though I bred him here missile, has acquired Vita at Huck Durante. And now I talk of hounds, is not yon ban and busker who come scooping up the avenue with Davy Jellotly? I vote we should go to meet them, sir, said Waverley, for I believe the present master of the house is Colonel Talbot, who will expect to see us. We hesitated to mention to you at first that he had purchased your ancient patrimonial property, and even yet, if you do not incline to visit him, we can pass on to the Baileys. The Baron had occasion for all his magnanimity. However, 
He drew a long breath, took a long snuff, and observed, since they had brought him so far, he could not pass the colonel's gate, and he would be happy to see the new master of his old tenants. He alighted accordingly, as did the other gentlemen and ladies. He gave his arm to his daughter, and as they descended the avenue pointed out to her how speedily the diva pecunia of the South Ron, their tutelary deity, he might call her, had removed the marks of spoliation. In truth, not only had the felled trees been removed, but, their stumps being grubbed up and the earth round them leveled and sown with grass, every mark of devastation, unless to an eye intimately acquainted with the spot, was already totally obliterated. There was a similar reformation in the outward man of Davy Jellotly, who met them, every now and then stopping to admire the new suit which graced his person, in the same colors as formerly. But bedizened fine enough to have served Touchstone himself. He danced up with his usual ungainly frolics, first to the baron and then to Rose, passing his hands over his clothes, crying, bra, bra, Davy. And scarce able to sing a bar to an end of his thousand and one songs for the breathless extravagance of his joy. The dogs also acknowledged their old master with a thousand gambols. Upon my conscience, Rose, ejaculated the baron, the gratitude, oh, they dumb brutes and of that poor innocent brings the tears into my auld een. While well, that's Skellum Malcolm, but I'm obliged to Colonel Talbot for putting my hounds into such good condition, and likewise for poor Davy. But, Rose, my dear, we must not permit them to be a life-rent burden upon the estate. As he spoke, Lady Emily, leaning upon the arm of her husband, met the party at the lower gate with a thousand welcomes. After the ceremony of introduction had been gone through, much abridged by the ease and excellent breeding of Lady Emily. She apologized for having used a little art to wile them back to a place which might awaken some painful reflections, but as it was to change masters, we were very desirous that the baron. Mr. Bradwardine, madam, if you please, said the old gentleman. Mr. Bradwardine, then, and Mr. Waverley should see what we have done towards restoring the mansion of your father's to its former state. The baron answered with a low bow. Indeed, when he entered the court, excepting that the heavy stables, which had been burnt down, were replaced by buildings of a lighter and more picturesque appearance. All seemed as much as possible restored to the state in which he had left it when he assumed arms some months before. The pigeon house was replenished. The fountain played with its usual activity, and not only the bear who predominated over its basin, but all the other bears whatsoever, were replaced on their several stations and renewed or repaired with so much care that they bore no tokens of the violence which had so lately descended upon them. While these minutiae had been so needfully attended to, it is scarce necessary to add that the house itself had been thoroughly repaired, as well as the gardens, with the strictest attention to maintain the original character of both, and to remove as far as possible all appearance of the ravage they had sustained. The baron gazed in silent wonder. At length he addressed Colonel Talbot. While I acknowledge my obligation to you, sir, for the restoration of the badge of our family, I cannot but marvel that you have nowhere established your own crest, Wilk is, I believe, a mastiff. Anciently called a Talbot. As the poet has it. A Talbot strong, a sturdy tyke. At least such a dog is the crest of the martial and renowned earls of Shrewsbury, to whom your family are probably blood relations. I believe, said the colonel, smiling, our dogs are whelps of the same litter, for my part, if crests were to dispute precedence, I should be apt to let them, as the proverb says, fight dog, fight bear. As he made this speech, at which the baron took another long pinch of snuff, they had entered the house, that is, the baron, Rose, and Lady Emily, with young Stanley and the Bailey. For Edward and the rest of the party remained on the terrace to examine a new greenhouse stocked with the finest plants. The baron resumed his favorite topic, however it may please you to derogate from the honor of your burgonet, Colonel Talbot, which is doubtless your humor, as I have seen in other gentlemen of birth and honor in your country. I must again repeat it as a most ancient and distinguished bearing, as well as that of my young friend Francis Stanley, which is the eagle and child. The bird and bantling they call it in Derbyshire, sir, said Stanley. Yuri a daft collant, sir, said the baron who had a great liking to this young man, perhaps because he sometimes teased him, Yuri a daft collant, and I must correct you some of these days, shaking his great brown fist at him. 
But what I meant to say, Colonel Talbot, is, that yours is an ancient presapia, or descent, and since you have lawfully and justly acquired the estate for you and yours which I have lost for me and mine. I wish it may remain in your name as many centuries as it has done in that of the late proprietors. That, answered the colonel, is very handsome, Mr. Bradwardine, indeed. And yet, sir, I cannot but marvel that you, colonel, whom I noted to have so much of the Amor Patriti, when we met in Edinburgh as even to vilipend other countries, should have chosen to establish your Laras, or household gods. Procol a patriae finibus, and in a manner to expatriate yourself. Why really, Baron, I do not see why, to keep the secret of these foolish boys, Waverley and Stanley, and of my wife, who is no wiser, one old soldier should continue to impose upon another. You must know, then, that I have so much of that same prejudice in favor of my native country, that the sum of money which I advanced to the seller of this extensive barony has only purchased for me a box in, Shire, called Breerwood Lodge. With about two hundred and fifty acres of land, the chief merit of which is, that it is within a very few miles of Waverley Honor. And who, then, in the name of heaven, has bought this property? That, said the colonel, it is this gentleman's profession to explain. The bailey, whom this reference regarded, and who had all this while shifted from one foot to another with great impatience, like a hen, as he afterwards said, upon a het girdle. And chuckling, he might have added, like the said hen in all the glory of laying an egg, now pushed forward. That I can, that I can, your honor, drawing from his pocket a budget of papers, and untying the red tape with a hand trembling with eagerness. Here is the disposition and assignation by Malcolm Bradwardine of Inch Grabbit, regularly signed and tested in terms of the statute, whereby, for a certain sum of sterling money presently contented and paid to him, he has disponed, alienated, and conveyed the whole estate and barony of Bradwardine, Tully Veolan, and others, with the Fort Alice and Manor Place. For God's sake, to the point, sir. I have all that by heart, said the colonel. To Cosmo Common Bradwardine, E.S.Q., pursued the Bailey, his heirs and assignees, simply and irredeemably, to be held either a me vel de me. Pray read short, sir. On the conscience of an honest man, Colonel, I read as short as is consistent with style, under the burden and reservation always. Mr. Macweeble, this would outlast a Russian winter, give me leave. In short, Mr. Bradwardine, your family estate is your own once more in full property, and at your absolute disposal, but only burdened with the sum advanced to repurchase it, which I understand is utterly disproportioned to its value. An auld sang, an auld sang, if it please your honours, cried the bailey, rubbing his hands, look at the rental book. Which sum being advanced, by Mr. Edward Waverley, chiefly from the price of his father's property which I bought from him, is secured to his lady or daughter and her family by this marriage. It is a Catholic security, shouted the bailey, to Rose Common Bradwardine, alias Waverley, in life rent, and the children of the said marriage in fee. And I made up a wee bit minute of an antenuptial contract, intuitive matrimonage, so it cannot be subject to reduction hereafter, as a donation inter virum et uxorum. It is difficult to say whether the worthy baron was most delighted with the restitution of his family property or with the delicacy and generosity that left him unfettered to pursue his purpose in disposing of it after his death. And which avoided as much as possible even the appearance of laying him under pecuniary obligation. When his first pause of joy and astonishment was over, his thoughts turned to the unworthy airmail, who, he pronounced, had sold his birthright, like Esau, for a mess o' oh, pottage. But wa who kit the porridge for him, exclaimed the bailey. I wad like to ken that, wa but your honours to command, Duncan Macweeble. His honour, young Mr. Waverley, put it a, into my hand fray the beginning, fray the first calling o, oh, the summons, as I may say. I circumvented them, I played at bogle about the bush why, at them, I cajoled them, and if I have a jean inch grabbit and Jamie Howie a bonny begunk, they ken themselves. Him a writer. I did na gee slapdash to them why, our young bra bridegroom, to gar them bought up the market. Nah, nah. I scared them why, our wild tenantry, and the MacIvers, that are but ill settled yet, till they durst na on ony errand whatsoever gang our the doorstain after gloaming, 
for fear John Heatherblutter, or some sick can dare the deal. Should tack a bath at them. Then, on the other hand, I beflummed them why, Colonel Talbot, wad they offer to keep up the price again, the Duke's friend? Did they not ken wa was master? Had they not seen enough, by the sad example of Moni a poor misguided unhappy body? Who went to Derby, for example, Mr. Macweeble, said the colonel to him aside. Oh wished, colonel, for the love oh God. Let that flea stick I the wa. There were Moni good folk at Derby, and it's ill speaking of halters, with a sly cast of his eye toward the baron, who was in a deep reverie. Starting out of it at once, he took Macweeble by the button and led him into one of the deep window recesses, whence only fragments of their conversation reached the rest of the party. It certainly related to stamp paper and parchment. For no other subject, even from the mouth of his patron, and he once more an efficient one, could have arrested so deeply the Bailey's reverent and absorbed attention. I understand your honor perfectly. It can be done as easy as taking out a decree in absence. To her and him, after my demise, and to their heirs male, but preferring the second son, if God shall bless them with two, who is to carry the name and arms of Bradwardine of that ilk, without any other name or armorial bearings whatsoever. Tut, your honor, whispered the bailey, I'll make a slight jotting the morn, it will cost but a charter of resignation in favorum, and I'll hay it ready for the next term in exchequer. Their private conversation ended, the baron was now summoned to do the honors of Tully Veland to new guests. These were Major Melville of Cairnbrecken and the Reverend Mr. Morton, followed by two or three others of the baron's acquaintances, who had been made privy to his having again acquired the estate of his father's. The shouts of the villagers were also heard beneath in the courtyard. For Saunders Saunderson, who had kept the secret for several days with laudable prudence, had unloosed his tongue upon beholding the arrival of the carriages. But, while Edward received Major Melville with politeness and the clergyman with the most affectionate and grateful kindness, his father-in-law looked a little awkward. As uncertain how he should answer the necessary claims of hospitality to his guests, and forward the festivity of his tenants. Lady Emily relieved him by intimating that, though she must be an indifferent representative of Mrs. Edward Waverley in many respects, she hoped the baron would approve of the entertainment she had ordered in expectation of so many guests and that they would find such other accommodations provided as might in some degree support the ancient hospitality of Tully Veolan. It is impossible to describe the pleasure which this assurance gave the baron, who, with an air of gallantry half appertaining to the stiff Scottish laird and half to the officer in the French service, offered his arm to the fair speaker. And led the way, in something between a stride and a minuet step, into the large dining parlour, followed by all the rest of the good company. By dint of Saunderson's directions and exertions, all here, as well as in the other apartments, had been disposed as much as possible according to the old arrangement. And where new movables had been necessary, they had been selected in the same character with the old furniture. There was one addition to this fine old apartment, however, which drew tears into the baron's eyes. It was a large and spirited painting, representing Fergus MacIver and Waverley in their highland dress, the scene a wild, rocky, and mountainous pass, down which the clan were descending in the background. It was taken from a spirited sketch, drawn while they were in Edinburgh by a young man of high genius, and had been painted on a full-length scale by an eminent London artist. Rayburn himself, whose Highland chiefs do all but walk out of the canvas, could not have done more justice to the subject. And the ardent, fiery, an impetuous character of the unfortunate chief of Glenacoich was finely contrasted with the contemplative, fanciful, and enthusiastic expression of his happier friend. Beside this painting hung the arms which Waverley had borne in the unfortunate civil war. The whole piece was beheld with admiration and deeper feelings. Men must, however, eat, in spite both of sentiment and virtu. And the baron, while he assumed the lower end of the table, insisted that Lady Emily should do the honors of the head, that they might, he said, set a meat example to the young folk. After a pause of deliberation, employed in adjusting in his own brain the precedence between the Presbyterian Kirk and Episcopal Church of Scotland, he requested Mr. Morton, as the stranger, would crave a blessing, observing that Mr. Rubrick, who was at home, would return thanks for the distinguished mercies it had been his lot to experience. The dinner was excellent. Saunderson attended in full costume, 
with all the former domestics, who had been collected, excepting one or two, that had not been heard of since the affair of Culloden. The cellars were stocked with wine which was pronounced to be superb, and it had been contrived that the bear of the fountain, in the courtyard, should, for that night only, play excellent brandy punch for the benefit of the lower orders. When the dinner was over the baron, about to propose a toast, cast a somewhat sorrowful look upon the sideboard, which, however, exhibited much of his plate, that had either been secreted or purchased by neighboring gentlemen from the soldiery. And by them gladly restored to the original owner. In the late times, he said, those must be thankful who have saved life and land. Yet when I am about to pronounce this toast, I cannot but regret an old heirloom, Lady Emily, Apoculum Potatorium, Colonel Talbot. Here the baron's elbow was gently touched by his majordomo, and, turning round, he beheld in the hands of Alexander of Alexandro the celebrated cup of St. Duthac, the blessed bear of Brad Radine. I question if the recovery of his estate afforded him more rapture. By my honor, he said, one might almost believe in brownies and fairies, Lady Emily, when your ladyship is in presence. I am truly happy, said Colonel Talbot, that, by the recovery of this piece of family antiquity, it has fallen within my power to give you some token of my deep interest in all that concerns my young friend Edward. But that you may not suspect Lady Emily for a sorceress, or me for a conjurer, which is no joke in Scotland, I must tell you that Frank Stanley, your friend, who has been seized with a tartan fever ever since he heard Edward's tales of old Scottish manners, happened to describe to us at second hand this remarkable cup. My servant, Spontoon, who, like a true old soldier, observes everything and says little, gave me afterwards to understand that he thought he had seen the piece of plate Mr. Stanley mentioned in the possession of a certain Mrs. Nosebag, who, having been originally the helpmate of a pawnbroker, had found opportunity during the late unpleasant scenes in Scotland to trade a little in her old line. And so became the depositary of the more valuable part of the spoil of half the army. You may believe the cup was speedily recovered, and it will give me very great pleasure if you allow me to suppose that its value is not diminished by having been restored through my means. A tear mingled with the wine which the baron filled, as he proposed a cup of gratitude to Colonel Talbot, and at the prosperity of the United Houses of Waverley Honor and Brad Radine. It only remains for me to say that, as no wish was ever uttered with more affectionate sincerity, there are few which, allowing for the necessary mutability of human events, have been upon the whole more happily fulfilled. Chapter 43 A Postscript Which Should Have Been a Preface Our journey is now finished, gentle reader, and if your patience has accompanied me through these sheets, the contract is, on your part, strictly fulfilled. Yet, like the driver who has received his full hire, I still linger near you, and make, with becoming diffidence, a trifling additional claim upon your bounty and good nature. You are as free, however, to shut the volume of the one petitioner as to close your door in the face of the other. This should have been a prefatory chapter, but for two reasons, first, that most novel readers, as my own conscience reminds me, are apt to be guilty of the sin of omission respecting that same matter of prefaces. Secondly, that it is a general custom with that class of students to begin with the last chapter of a work, so that, after all, these remarks, being introduced last in order, have still the best chance to be read in their proper place. There is no European nation which, within the course of half a century or little more, has undergone so complete a change as this kingdom of Scotland. The effects of the insurrection of 1745, the destruction of the patriarchal power of the Highland chiefs, the abolition of the heritable jurisdictions of the lowland nobility and barons, the total eradication of the Jacobite party, which, averse to intermingle with the English or adopt their customs, long continued to pride themselves upon maintaining ancient Scottish manners and customs, commenced this innovation. The gradual influx of wealth and extension of commerce have since united to render the present people of Scotland a class of beings as different from their grandfathers as the existing English are from those of Queen Elizabeth's time. The political and economical effects of these changes have been traced by Lord Selkirk with great precision and accuracy. But the change, though steadily and rapidly progressive, has nevertheless been gradual. And, like those who drift down the stream of a deep and smooth river, we are not aware of the progress we have made until we fix our eye on the now distant point from which we have been drifted. 
such of the present generation as can recollect the last 20 or 25 years of the 18th century will be fully sensible of the truth of this statement. Especially if their acquaintance and connections lay among those who in my younger time were facetiously called folks of the old leaven, who still cherished a lingering, though hopeless, attachment to the house of Stuart. This race has now almost entirely vanished from the land, and with it, doubtless, much absurd political prejudice. But also many living examples of singular and disinterested attachment to the principles of loyalty which they received from their fathers, and of old Scottish faith, hospitality, worth, and honor. It was my accidental lot, though not born a Highlander, which may be an apology for much bad Gaelic, to reside during my childhood and youth among persons of the above description. And now, for the purpose of preserving some idea of the ancient manners of which I have witnessed the almost total extinction, I have embodied in imaginary scenes, and ascribed to fictitious characters. A part of the incidents which I then received from those who were actors in them. Indeed, the most romantic parts of this narrative are precisely those which have a foundation in fact. The exchange of mutual protection between a Highland gentleman and an officer of rank in the King's service, together with the spirited manner in which the latter asserted his right to return the favor he had received, is literally true. The accident by a musket shot, and the heroic reply imputed to Flora, relate to a lady of rank not long deceased. And scarce a gentleman who was, in hiding, after the Battle of Culloden but could tell a tale of strange concealments and of wild and hair's breadth, scapes as extraordinary as any which I have ascribed to my heroes. Of this, the escape of Charles Edward himself, as the most prominent, is the most striking example. The accounts of the Battle of Preston and skirmish at Clifton are taken from the narrative of intelligent eyewitnesses, and corrected from the History of the Rebellion by the late venerable author of Douglas. The lowland Scottish gentlemen and the subordinate characters are not given as individual portraits, but are drawn from the general habits of the period, of which I have witnessed some remnants in my younger days, and partly gathered from tradition. It has been my object to describe these persons, not by a caricatured and exaggerated use of the national dialect, but by their habits, manners, and feelings so as in some distant degree to emulate the admirable Irish portraits drawn by Miss Edgeworth, so different from the Teagues and dear Joys, who so long, with the most perfect family resemblance to each other, occupied the drama and the novel. I feel no confidence, however, in the manner in which I have executed my purpose. Indeed, so little was I satisfied with my production, that I laid it aside in an unfinished state, and only found it again by mere accident among other waste papers in an old cabinet. The drawers of which I was rummaging in order to accommodate a friend with some fishing tackle, after it had been mislaid for several years. Two works upon similar subjects, by female authors whose genius is highly creditable to their country, have appeared in the interval, I mean Mrs. Hamilton's, Glenbony, and the late account of, Highland Superstitions. But the first is confined to the rural habits of Scotland, of which it has given a picture with striking and impressive fidelity, and the traditional records of the respectable and ingenious Mrs. Grant of Lagan are of a nature distinct from the fictitious narrative which I have here attempted. I would willingly persuade myself that the preceding work will not be found altogether uninteresting. To elder persons it will recall scenes and characters familiar to their youth, and to the rising generation the tale may present some idea of the manners of their forefathers. Yet I heartily wish that the task of tracing the evanescent manners of his own country had employed the pen of the only man in Scotland who could have done it justice, of him so eminently distinguished in elegant literature. And whose sketches of Colonel Caustic and Umfreville are perfectly blended with the finer traits of national character. I should in that case have had more pleasure as a reader than I shall ever feel in the pride of a successful author, should these sheets confer upon me that envied distinction. And, as I have inverted the usual arrangement, Placing these remarks at the end of the work to which they refer, I will venture on a second violation of form. By closing the whole with a dedication. These volumes. Being respectfully inscribed. 2. Our Scottish Addison. Henry Mackenzie. By. An unknown admirer. Of. His genius. Notes, Volume 1. Long the oracle of the country gentlemen of the high Tory party. The ancient newsletter was written in manuscript and copied by clerks, who addressed the copies to the subscribers. 
The politician by whom they were compiled picked up his intelligence at coffee houses, and often pleaded for an additional gratuity in consideration of the extra expense attached to frequenting such places of fashionable resort. There is a family legend to this purpose, belonging to the knightly family of Bradshay, the proprietors of Hay Hall, in Lancashire, where, I have been told, the event is recorded on a painted glass window. The German ballad of the noble Moringer turns upon a similar topic. But undoubtedly many such incidents may have taken place, where, the distance being great and the intercourse infrequent, false reports concerning the fate of the absent crusaders must have been commonly circulated. And sometimes perhaps rather hastily credited at home. The attachment to this classic was, it is said, actually displayed in the manner mentioned in the text by an unfortunate Jacobite in that unhappy period. He escaped from the jail in which he was confined for a hasty trial and certain condemnation, and was retaken as he hovered around the place in which he had been imprisoned. For which he could give no better reason than the hope of recovering his favorite Titus Levius. I am sorry to add that the simplicity of such a character was found to form no apology for his guilt as a rebel, and that he was condemned and executed. Nicholas Amhust, a noted political writer, who conducted for many years a paper called The Craftsman, under the assumed name of Caleb Danvers. He was devoted to the Tory interest, and seconded with much ability the attacks of Pulteney on Sir Robert Walpole. He died in 1742, neglected by his great patrons and in the most miserable circumstances. Amhus survived the downfall of Walpole's power, and had reason to expect a reward for his labors. If we excuse Bolingbroke, who had only saved the shipwreck of his fortunes, we shall be at a loss to justify Pulteney, who could with ease have given this man a considerable income. The utmost of his generosity to Amhust that I ever heard of was a hogshead of claret. He died, it is supposed, of a broken heart, and was buried at the charge of his honest printer, Richard Franklin, Lord Chesterfield's characters reviewed. I have now given in the text the full name of this gallant and excellent man, and proceed to copy the account of his remarkable conversion, as related by Dr. Doddridge. This memorable event, says the pious writer, happened towards the middle of July 1719. The major had spent the evening, and, if I mistake not, it was the Sabbath, in some gay company, and had an unhappy assignation with a married woman, whom he was to attend exactly at twelve. The company broke up about eleven, and, not judging it convenient to anticipate the time appointed, he went into his chamber to kill the tedious hour, perhaps with some amusing book, or some other way. But it very accidentally happened that he took up a religious book, which his good mother or aunt had, without his knowledge, slipped into his portmanteau. It was called, if I remember the title exactly, The Christian Soldier, or Heaven Taken by Storm, and it was written by Mr. Thomas Watson. Guessing by the title of it that he would find some phrases of his own profession spiritualized in a manner which he thought might afford him some diversion, he resolved to dip into it, but he took no serious notice of anything it had in it. And yet, while this book was in his hand, an impression was made upon his mind, perhaps God only knows how, which drew after it a train of the most important and happy consequences. He thought he saw an unusual blaze of light fall upon the book which he was reading, which he at first imagined might happen by some accident in the candle, but, lifting up his eyes, he apprehended to his extreme amazement that there was before him. As it were suspended in the air, a visible representation of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross, surrounded on all sides with a glory and was impressed as if a voice, or something equivalent to a voice, had come to him, to this effect, for he was not confident as to the words, O, oh, sinner! Did I suffer this for thee, and are these thy returns? Struck with so amazing a phenomenon as this, there remained hardly any life in him, so that he sunk down in the armchair in which he sat, and continued, he knew not how long, insensible. With regard to this vision, says the ingenious D.R., Hibbert, the appearance of our Saviour on the cross, and the awful words repeated, can be considered in no other light than as so many recollected images of the mind, which probably had their origin in the language of some urgent appeal to repentance that the colonel might have casually read or heard delivered. From what cause, however, such ideas were rendered as vivid as actual impressions, we have no information to be depended upon. This vision was certainly attended with one of the most important of consequences connected with the Christian dispensation, the conversion of a sinner. And hence no single narrative has, perhaps, 
done more to confirm the superstitious opinion that apparitions of this awful kind cannot arise without a divine fiat. Dr. Hibbert adds in a note, a short time before the vision, Colonel Gardiner had received a severe fall from his horse. Did the brain receive some slight degree of injury from the accident, so as to predispose him to this spiritual illusion? Hibbert's Philosophy of Apparitions, Edinburgh, 1824 The courtesy of an invitation to partake a traveler's meal, or at least that of being invited to share whatever liquor the guest called for, was expected by certain old landlords in Scotland even in the youth of the author. In requital mine host was always furnished with the news of the country, and was probably a little of a humorist to boot. The devolution of the whole actual business and drudgery of the inn upon the poor good wife was very common among the Scottish Bonifaces. There was in ancient times, in the city of Edinburgh, a gentleman of good family who condescended, in order to gain a livelihood, to become the nominal keeper of a coffee house. One of the first places of the kind which had been opened in the Scottish metropolis. As usual, it was entirely managed by the careful and industrious Mrs. B., while her husband amused himself with field sports, without troubling his head about the matter. Once upon a time, the premises having taken fire, the husband was met walking up the high street loaded with his guns and fishing rods, and replied calmly to someone who inquired after his wife. That the poor woman was trying to save a parcel of crockery and some trumpery books. The last being those which served her to conduct the business of the house. There were many elderly gentlemen in the author's younger days who still held it part of the amusement of a journey to parley with mine host, who often resembled, in his quaint humor, mine host of the Garter and the Merry Wives of Windsor. Or blog of the George and the Merry Devil of Edmonton. Sometimes the landlady took her share of entertaining the company. In either case, the omitting to pay them due attention gave displeasure, and perhaps brought down a smart jest, as on the following occasion. A jolly dame who, not sixty years since, kept the principal caravansary at Greenlaw, in Berwickshire, had the honor to receive under her roof a very worthy clergyman, with three sons of the same profession, each having a cure of souls. Be it said in passing, none of the reverend party were reckoned powerful in the pulpit. After dinner was over, the worthy senior, in the pride of his heart, asked Mrs. Buchan whether she ever had had such a party in her house before. Here sit I, he said, a placed minister of the Kirk of Scotland, and here sit my three sons, each a placed minister of the same Kirk. Confess, lucky Buchan, you never had such a party in your house before. The question was not premised by any invitation to sit down and take a glass of wine or the like, so Mrs. B. Answered drilly, indeed, sir, I cannot just say that ever I had such a party in my house before, except once in the forty-five when I had a Highland Piper here, with his three sons, all Highland Pipers. And deal a spring they could play among them. There is no particular mansion described under the name of Tully Veolan, but the peculiarities of the description occur in various old Scottish seats. The house of Warrender upon Brunsfield Links and that of Old Ravelston, belonging, the former to Sir George Warrender, the latter to Sir Alexander Keith, have both contributed several hints to the description in the text. The House of Dean, near Edinburgh, has also some points of resemblance with Tully Veolan. The author has, however, been informed that the House of Grand Tully resembles that of the Baron of Bradwardine still more than any of the above. I am ignorant how long the ancient and established custom of keeping fools has been disused in England. Swift writes an epitaph on the Earl of Suffolk's fool, whose name was Dickie Pierce. In Scotland, the custom subsisted till late in the last century. At Glamis Castle is preserved the dress of one of the jesters, very handsome, and ornamented with many bells. It is not above thirty years since such a character stood by the sideboard of a nobleman of the first rank in Scotland, and occasionally mixed in the conversation, till he carried the joke rather too far. In making proposals to one of the young ladies of the family, and publishing the bands betwixt her and himself in the public church. After the revolution of 1688, and on some occasions when the spirit of the Presbyterians had been unusually animated against their opponents, the Episcopal clergymen, who were chiefly non-jurors, were exposed to be mobbed, as we should now say. Or rabbled, as the phrase then went, to expiate their political heresies. But notwithstanding that the Presbyterians had the persecution in Charles II. And his brother's time to exasperate them, 
there was little mischief done beyond the kind of petty violence mentioned in the text. I may here mention that the fashion of competition described in the text was still occasionally practiced in Scotland in the author's youth. A company, after having taken leave of their host, often went to finish the evening at the Clocken or village, in Womb of Tavern. Their entertainer always accompanied them to take the stirrup cup, which often occasioned a long and late revel. The poculum potatorium of the valiant baron, his blessed bear, has a prototype at the fine old castle of Glamis, so rich in memorials of ancient times. It is a massive beaker of silver, double gilt, molded into the shape of a lion, and holding about an English pint of wine. The form alludes to the family name of Strathmore, which is lion, and, when exhibited, the cup must necessarily be emptied to the earl's health. The author ought perhaps to be ashamed of recording that he has had the honor of swallowing the contents of the lion, and the recollection of the feat served to suggest the story of the bear of Bradwardine. In the family of Scott of Tholestane, not Tholestane in the forest, but the place of the same name in Roxburghshire, was long preserved a cup of the same kind, in the form of a jackboot. Each guest was obliged to empty this at his departure. If the guest's name was Scott, the necessity was doubly imperative. When the landlord of an inn presented his guests with Diak and Dorus, that is, the drink at the door, or the stirrup cup, the draft was not charged in the reckoning. On this point a learned bailey of the town of Forfar pronounced a very sound judgment. A. An alewife in Forfar, had brewed her peck of malt and set the liquor out of doors to cool, the cow of B, a neighbor of A. Chanced to come by, and seeing the good beverage, was allured to taste it, and finally to drink it up. When A. Came to take in her liquor, she found her tub empty, and from the cows staggering and staring, so as to betray her intemperance, she easily divined the mode in which her broust had disappeared. To take vengeance on Crummy's ribs with a stick was her first effort. The roaring of the cow brought B, her master, who remonstrated with his angry neighbor, and received in reply a demand for the value of the ale which Crummy had drunk up. B. Refused payment and was conveyed before C, the bailey or sitting magistrate. He heard the case patiently, and then demanded of the plaintiff A, whether the cow had sat down to her potation or taken it standing. The plaintiff answered, she had not seen the deed committed, but she supposed the cow drank the ale while standing on her feet, adding, that had she been near she would have made her use them to some purpose. The bailey, on this admission, solemnly adjudged the cow's drink to be Diak and Dorus, a stirrup cup, for which no charge could be made without violating the ancient hospitality of Scotland. The story last told was said to have happened in the south of Scotland, but said Aunt Armatogai and let the gown have its dues. It was an old clergyman, who had wisdom and firmness enough to resist the panic which seized his brethren, who was the means of rescuing a poor insane creature from the cruel fate which would otherwise have overtaken her. The accounts of the trials for witchcraft form one of the most deplorable chapters in Scottish story. Although canting heraldry is generally reprobated, it seems nevertheless to have been adopted in the arms and mottos of many honorable families. Thus the motto of the Vernons, Vernon Semper Vire, is a perfect pun, and so is that of the Onslows, Festina Lente. The Periusum Ni Parisum of the Anstruthers is liable to a similar objection. One of that ancient race, finding that an antagonist, with whom he had fixed a friendly meeting, was determined to take the opportunity of assassinating him, prevented the hazard by dashing out his brains with a battle-axe. Two sturdy arms, brandishing such a weapon, form the usual crest of the family, with the above motto, Periusum ni Parisum, I had died, unless I had gone through with it. MacDonald of Barrisdale, one of the very last Highland gentlemen who carried on the plundering system to any great extent, was a scholar no well-bred gentleman. He engraved on his broadswords the well-known lines. Hey tibi arunt arts pasisk imponera morum. Parser subjectus, et debeller superboss. Indeed, the levying of blackmail was, before 1745, practiced by several chiefs of very high rank, who, in doing so, contended that they were lending the laws the assistance of their arms and swords. And affording a protection which could not be obtained from the magistracy in the disturbed state of the country. The author has seen a memoir of Macpherson of Cluny, chief of that ancient clan, from which it appears that he levied protection money to a very large amount, which was willingly paid even by some of his most powerful neighbors. 
A gentleman of this clan, hearing a clergyman hold forth to his congregation on the crime of theft, interrupted the preacher to assure him he might leave the enforcement of such doctrines to Clooney Macpherson, whose broadsword would put a stop to theft sooner than all the sermons of all the ministers of the Synod. The town guard of Edinburgh were, till a late period, armed with this weapon when on their police duty. There was a hook at the back of the axe, which the ancient Highlanders used to assist them to climb over walls, fixing the hook upon it and raising themselves by the handle. The axe, which was also much used by the natives of Ireland, is supposed to have been introduced into both countries from Scandinavia. An adventure very similar to what is here stated actually befell the late Mr. Abercrombie of Tullybody, grandfather of the present Lord Abercrombie, and father of the celebrated Sir Ralph. When this gentleman, who lived to a very advanced period of life, first settled in Stirlingshire, his cattle were repeatedly driven off by the celebrated Rob Roy or some of his gang. And at length he was obliged, after obtaining a proper safe conduct, to make the Kate Ran such a visit as that of Waverley to be lean in the text. Rob received him with much courtesy, and made many apologies for the accident, which must have happened, he said, through some mistake. Mr. Abercrombie was regaled with call-ops from two of his own cattle, which were hung up by the heels in the cavern, and was dismissed in perfect safety, after having agreed to pay in future a small sum of blackmail. In consideration of which Rob Roy not only undertook to forbear his herds in future, but to replace any that should be stolen from him by other freebooters. Mr. Abercrombie said Rob Roy affected to consider him as a friend to the Jacobite interest and a sincere enemy to the Union. Neither of these circumstances were true. But the laird thought it quite unnecessary to undeceive his Highland host at the risk of bringing on a political dispute in such a situation. This anecdote I received many years since, about 1792, from the mouth of the venerable gentleman who was concerned in it. This celebrated gibbet was, in the memory of the last generation, still standing at the western end of the town of Creef, in Perthshire. Why it was called the kind gallows we are unable to inform the reader with certainty. But it is alleged that the Highlanders used to touch their bonnets as they passed a place which had been fatal to many of their countrymen, with the ejaculation, God bless her name cell, and the teal tam you. It may therefore have been called kind, as being a sort of native or kindred place of doom to those who suffered there, as in fulfillment of a natural destiny. The story of the bridegroom carried off by Caterans on his bridal day is taken from one which was told to the author by the late Laird of MacNab many years since. To carry off persons from the lowlands, and to put them to ransom, was a common practice with the wild Highlanders, as it is said to be at the present day with the banditti in the south of Italy. Upon the occasion alluded to, a party of Caterans carried off the bridegroom and secreted him in some cave near the mountain of Shehalion. The young man caught the smallpox before his ransom could be agreed on. And whether it was the fine cool air of the place, or the want of medical attendance, MacNab did not pretend to be positive. But so it was, that the prisoner recovered, his ransom was paid, and he was restored to his friends and bride, but always considered the Highland robbers as having saved his life by their treatment of his malady. This happened on many occasions. Indeed, it was not till after the total destruction of the clan influence, after 1745, that purchasers could be found who offered a fair price for the estates forfeited in 1715, which were then brought to sale by the creditors of the York Buildings Company, who had purchased the whole, or greater part, from government at a very small price. Even so late as the period first mentioned, the prejudices of the public in favor of the heirs of the forfeited families threw various impediments in the way of intending purchasers of such property. This sort of political game ascribed to MacIver was in reality played by several Highland chiefs, the celebrated Lord Lovat in particular, who used that kind of finesse to the uttermost. The Laird of Mac was also captain of an independent company, but valued the sweets of present pay too well to incur the risk of losing them in the Jacobite cause. His martial consort raised his clan and headed it in 1745. But the chief himself would have nothing to do with king-making, declaring himself for that monarch, and no other, who gave the laird of Mac, half a guinea the day and half a guinea the morn. In explanation of the military exercise observed at the castle of Glenacoich, the author begs to remark that the Highlanders were not only well practiced in the use of the broadsword, firelock, 
and most of the manly sports and trials of strength common throughout Scotland, but also used a peculiar sort of drill, suited to their own dress and mode of warfare. There were, for instance, different modes of disposing the plaid, one when on a peaceful journey, another when danger was apprehended. One way of enveloping themselves in it when expecting undisturbed repose, and another which enabled them to start up with sword and pistol in hand on the slightest alarm. Previous to 1720 or thereabouts, the belted plaid was universally worn, in which the portion which surrounded the middle of the wearer and that which was flung around his shoulders were all of the same piece of tartan. In a desperate onset all was thrown away, and the clan charged bare beneath the doublet, save for an artificial arrangement of the shirt, which, like that of the Irish, was always ample, and for the spar mollock, or goat skin purse. The manner of handling the pistol and dirk was also part of the Highland manual exercise, which the author has seen gone through by men who had learned it in their youth. Pork or swine's flesh, in any shape, was, till of late years, much abominated by the Scotch, nor is it yet a favorite food amongst them. King Jamie carried this prejudice to England, and is known to have abhorred pork almost as much as he did tobacco. Ben Jonson has recorded this peculiarity, where the gypsy in a mask, examining the king's hand, says. You should, by this line. Love a horse and a hound, but no part of a swine. The gypsies metamorphosed. James's own proposed banquet for the devil was a loin of pork and a pole of ling, with a pipe of tobacco for digestion. In the number of persons of all ranks who assembled at the same table, though by no means to discuss the same fare, the Highland chiefs only retained a custom which had been formerly universally observed throughout Scotland. I myself, says the traveller, finds Morrison, in the end of Queen Elizabeth's reign, the scene being the lowlands of Scotland, was at a knight's house, who had many servants to attend him. That brought in his meat with their heads covered with blue caps, the table being more than half furnished with great platters of porridge, each having a little piece of sodden meat. And when the table was served, the servants did sit down with us, but the upper mess, instead of porridge, had a pullet, with some prunes in the broth, travels. Till within this last century the farmers, even of a respectable condition, dined with their workpeople. The difference betwixt those of high degree was ascertained by the place of the party above or below the salt, or sometimes by a line drawn with chalk on the dining table. Lord Lovat who knew well how to feed the vanity and restrain the appetites of his clansmen, allowed each sturdy Fraser who had the slightest pretensions to be a Dunhuasel the full honor of the sitting. But at the same time took care that his young kinsmen did not acquire at his table any taste for outlandish luxuries. His lordship was always ready with some honorable apology why foreign wines and French brandy, delicacies which he conceived might sap the hardy habits of his cousins, should not circulate past an assigned point on the table. In the Irish ballads relating to Fion, the Fingal of Macpherson, there occurs, as in the primitive poetry of most nations, a cycle of heroes, each of whom has some distinguishing attribute. Upon these qualities, and the adventures of those possessing them, many proverbs are formed, which are still current in the Highlands. Among other characters, Conan is distinguished as in some respects a kind of Thersites, but brave and daring even to rashness. He had made a vow that he would never take a blow without returning it. And having, like other heroes of antiquity, descended to the infernal regions, he received a cuff from the archfiend who presided there, which he instantly returned, using the expression in the text. Sometimes the proverb is worded thus, claw for claw, and the devil take the shortest nails, as Conan said to the devil. The description of the waterfall mentioned in this chapter is taken from that of Lettered, at the farm's so called, on the northern side of Lochid, and near the head of the lake, four or five miles from Aberfoyle. It is upon a small scale, but otherwise one of the most exquisite cascades it is possible to behold. The appearance of Flora with the harp, as described, has been justly censured as too theatrical and affected for the ladylike simplicity of her character. But something may be allowed to her French education, in which point and striking effect always make a considerable object. The author has been sometimes accused of confounding fiction with reality. He therefore thinks it necessary to state that the circumstance of the hunting described in the text as preparatory to the insurrection of 1745 is, so far as he knows, entirely imaginary. But it is well known such a great hunting was held in the forest of Braemar, under the auspices of the Earl of Mar, 
as preparatory to the rebellion of 1715. And most of the Highland chieftains who afterwards engaged in that civil commotion were present on this occasion. Glossary, Volume 1. A, uh, all. Abun, abun, above. Aby, abai, endure, suffer. Accolade, the salutation marking the bestowal of knighthood. An, own. Elaine, alone. An, if. Ani, one. Array, annoy, trouble. Auld, old. A wheel, well. Aye, always. Bailey, a city magistrate in Scotland. Ban, curse. Body, sly, cunning. Baxter, a baker. Bees, in the, stupefied, bewildered. Believe, belive, by and by. Ben, in, inside. Bent, an open field. Baird, a bard. Black fishing, fishing by torchlight poaching. Blinked, glanced. Blood, braid, blood. Blythe, gay, glad. Bodel, a copper coin worth a third of an English penny. Bowl, a bowl. Bootketch, a bootjack. Brae, the side of a hill. Bristlecock, a turkey cock. Breeks, breeches. Brogues, highland shoes. Broken men, outlaws. Brought far ben, held in special favor. Broust, a brewing. Bruik, enjoy. Bucky, a perverse or refractory person. Bullseg, a gelded bull. Bird, bird, a term of familiarity. Burn, a brook. Busking, dress, decoration. Buttock mail, a fine for fornication. Bydand, a waiting. C-L-L-I-C-H-S, old women on whom devolved the duty of lamenting for the dead, which the Irish call keening. Collant, a young lad, a fine fellow. Canny, prudent, skillful, lucky. Cantor, a canting, whining beggar. Cantrip, a trick. Carl, a churl, an old man. Caterin, a highland irregular soldier, a freebooter. Chap, a customer. Clocken, a hamlet. Claw favor, curry favor. Claymore, a broad sword. C-L-E-K, a hook. C-L-E-I-K the kunzi, steal the silver. C-O-B, beat. Coble, a small fishing boat. Cogs, wooden vessels. Cog, a round wooden vessel. Concussed, violently shaken, disturbed, forced. Coronach, a dirge. Cory, a mountain hollow. Cove, a cave. Crame, a booth, a merchant's shop. Cray, an incursion for plunder, termed on the borders a raid. Kraus, bold, courageous. Crummy, a cow with crooked horns. C-U-I-T-T-L-E, tickle. Curruck, a highland boat. Daft, mad, foolish. Debinded, bound down. Decrete, an order of decree. Diak and Dorois, the stirrup cup or parting drink. Dern, concealed, secret. Dinmans, weathers in the second year. Dewar, an agent, a manager. Dune, down, down. Dovering, dozing. Duan Wassel, Dunny Wassel, a Highland gentleman, usually the cadet of a family of rank. Ian Arrowick, the regalia presented by Rob Roy to the Laird of Tullybody. Enough, enuch, enough. Ergastulo, in a penitentiary. Exeemed, exempt. Factory, stewardship. Feel and divot, turf and thatch. FECK, a quantity. Fifteen, the Jacobite Rebellion of 1715. Fendi, good at making a shift. Fire raising, setting an incendiary fire. Flemet, frightened. FRAE, from. Foo, full. Fuel, fool. Gaberlunzi, a kind of professional beggar. Gain, gone. Gang, go. Ja, make. Gate, gate, way. Gun, going. Gay, gay, 
very. Gear, goods, property. Gilflirt, a flirty girl. Gilly, a servant, an attendant. Gilly Wetfoot, a barefooted highland lad. Jimmer, a youth from one to two years old. Glisked, glimpsed. Gripple, rapacious, niggardly. Gulpin, a simpleton. Che, hall. H-A-G, a portion of cops marked off for cutting. Hale, hole. Hallen, a partition, a screen. Haim, home. Hantel, a great deal. Kirsty, harvest. Herships, plunder. Hilding, a coward. Hursts, knolls. Horning, charge of, a summons to pay a debt, on pain of being pronounced a rebel, to the sound of a horn. How, a hollow. Howlerying and poolerying, hustling and pulling. Holy house, a broken down manor house. ILK, same, of that ilk, of the same name or place. ILK, each, every. In the bees, stupefied. Intramit, meddle with. Ken, no. Kittle, tickle, ticklish. Nobbler, a male deer in its second year. Kwloe, a small highland cow. Laird, squire, lord of the manor. Lang legged, long legged. Lawing, a tavern reckoning. Lee land, pasture land. Lie, a word used in old Scottish legal documents to call attention to the following word or phrase. Lift, capture, carry off by theft. Limmer, a jade. Lock, a lake. Loon, an idle fellow, a lout, a rogue. Lucky, an elderly woman. Lug, an ear, a handle. Lunzy, the loins, the waist. Mae, mare, more. Mains, the chief farm of an estate. Maltabun, the meal, the drink above the food, half seas over. Muen, must. Meal ark, a meal chest. Merk, thirteen and one third pence in English money. Mickle, much, great. Miscuggled, mangled, rumpled. Moni, many. Morn, the morn, tomorrow. Morning, a morning dram. Muckle, much, great. Muir, more. Na, nay, no, not. Nainsel, own self. Nice, simple. Nolt, black cattle. Oni, any. Orare, odd, unemployed. Orare time, occasionally. Hour, over. Peel house, a fortified tower. Pendicle, a small piece of ground. Pingle, a fuss, trouble. Plenishing, furnishings. Ploy, sport, entertainment. Pretty men, stout, warlike fellows. Rifes, robberies. Reavers, robbers. Rigs, ridges, plowed ground. Roclay, a short cloak. Rudas, coarse, hag-like. Sane, mark with the sign of the cross, bless. Sr, sore, very. Salmon, salmon. Sut, salt. Say, a sample. Skellum, a rascal. Scooping, scalping, skipping, leaping, running. Sianaki, a highland antiquary. Shearing, reaping, harvest. Shilpit, weak, sickly. Sichorn, shoes. Sic, sick can, such. Cityer DHU, black soldiers, independent companies raised to keep peace in the highlands, named from the tartans they wore. Cityer Roy, red soldiers, King George's men. Sykes, small brooks. Siller, silver, money. Simmer, summer. Sliver, slice, slit. Smoky, suspicious. Snack, cut. Snood, a fillet worn by young women. Sopite, quiet a brawl. Sorners, sorners, sojourners, sturdy beggars, especially those unwelcome visitors who exact lodgings and vittles by force. Sorted, arranged, adjusted. Spear, ask, investigate. 
Sparn Moloch, a Highland purse of goatskin. Sprack, animated, lively. Spring, a cheerful tune. Spursy, spoil. Steve, stiff, firm. Sterk, a young steer or heifer. Stot, a bullock. Stup, a jug, a pitcher. Stuthref, robbery. Stra, straw. Strath, a valley through which a river runs. Cybos, onions. Ta, the. Taglet, harassed, loitered. Taily, tail lie, a deed of entail. Tapate chien, a pewter pot that holds three English quarts. Tay out, tailier zor, in modern phrase, tally ho. Tiel, the devil. Tiendies, tithes. Tlt, told. Till, to. Tun, a hamlet, a farm. Trues, trousers. Tiro w, believe, suppose. Twa, two. Tyke, a dog, a snarling fellow. Unco, strange, very. Unkn end, unknown. Usqubuch, whiskey. Wa, wall. Where, spend. Wl, well. Wha, who. Whr, where. What for, why. Wilk, which. Whisk, whisk, brandish. Notes, Volume 2. The clan of Macfarlane, occupying the fastnesses of the western side of Loch Lomond, were great depredators on the low country, and as their excursions were made usually by night, the moon was proverbially called their lantern. Their celebrated pibroch of Hog Gil Nam Bo, which is the name of their gathering tune, intimates similar practices, the sense being. We are bound to drive the bullocks. All by hollows, hearsts, and hillocks. Through the sleet. And through the rain. When the moon is beaming low. On frozen lake and hills of snow. Bold and heartily we go. And all for little gain. This noble ruin is dear to my recollection, from associations which have been long and painfully broken. It holds a commanding station on the banks of the River Teeth, and has been one of the largest castles in Scotland. Murdoch, Duke of Albany, the founder of this stately pile, was beheaded on the castle hill of Stirling, from which he might see the Towers of Dune, the monument of his fallen greatness. In 1745-46, as stated in the text, a garrison on the part of the Chevalier was put into the castle, then less ruinous than at present. It was commanded by Mr. Stuart of Bola, as governor for Prince Charles. He was a man of property near Calendar. This castle became at that time the actual scene of a romantic escape made by John Home, the author of Douglas, and some other prisoners, who, having been taken at the Battle of Falkirk, were confined there by the insurgents. The poet, who had in his own mind a large stock of that romantic and enthusiastic spirit of adventure which he has described as animating the youthful hero of his drama, devised and undertook the perilous enterprise of escaping from his prison. He inspired his companions with his sentiments, and when every attempt at open force was deemed hopeless, they resolved to twist their bedclothes into ropes and thus to descend. Four persons, with home himself, reached the ground in safety. But the rope broke with the fifth, who was a tall, lusty man. The sixth was Thomas Barrow, a brave young Englishman, a particular friend of Holmes. Determined to take the risk, even in such unfavorable circumstances, Barrow committed himself to the broken rope, slid down on it as far as it could assist him, and then let himself drop. His friends beneath succeeded in breaking his fall. Nevertheless, he dislocated his ankle and had several of his ribs broken. His companions, however, were able to bear him off in safety. The Highlanders next morning sought for their prisoners with great activity. An old gentleman told the author he remembered seeing the Commandant Stuart. Bloody with spurring, fiery red with haste. Riding furiously through the country in quest of the fugitives. To go out, or to have been out, in Scotland was a conventional phrase similar to that of the Irish respecting a man having been up both having reference to an individual who had been engaged in insurrection. It was accounted ill-breeding in Scotland about forty years since to use the phrase rebellion or rebel, which might be interpreted by some of the parties present as a personal insult. 
It was also esteemed more polite, even for stanch Whigs, to denominate Charles Edward the Chevalier than to speak of him as the pretender. And this kind of accommodating courtesy was usually observed in society where individuals of each party mixed on friendly terms. The Jacobite sentiments were general among the western counties and in Wales. But although the great families of the Wyness, the Wyndhams, and others had come under an actual obligation to join Prince Charles if he should land. They had done so under the express stipulation that he should be assisted by an auxiliary army of French, without which they foresaw the enterprise would be desperate. Wishing well to his cause, therefore, and watching an opportunity to join him, they did not, nevertheless, think themselves bound in honor to do so, as he was only supported by a body of wild mountaineers, speaking an uncouth dialect and wearing a singular dress. The race up to Derby struck them with more dread than admiration. But it is difficult to say what the effect might have been had either the Battle of Preston or Falkirk been fought and won during the advance into England. Divisions early showed themselves in the Chevalier's little army, not only amongst the independent chieftains, who were far too proud to brook subjection to each other, but betwixt the Scotch and Charles's governor O'Sullivan, an Irishman by birth who, with some of his countrymen bred in the Irish brigade in the service of the King of France, had an influence with the adventurer much resented by the Highlanders, who were sensible that their own clans made the chief or rather the only strength of his enterprise. There was a feud, also, between Lord George Murray and John Murray of Broughton, the prince's secretary, whose disunion greatly embarrassed the affairs of the adventurer. In general, a thousand different pretensions divided their little army and finally contributed in no small degree to its overthrow. This circumstance, which is historical, as well as the description that precedes it, will remind the reader of the War of Lavade, in which the royalists, consisting chiefly of insurgent peasantry, attached a prodigious and even superstitious interest to the possession of a piece of brass ordnance, which they called Marie Jean. The highlanders of an early period were afraid of cannon, with the noise and effect of which they were totally unacquainted. It was by means of three or four small pieces of artillery that the earls of Huntley and Errol, in James VI's time, gained a great victory at Glenlivet, over a numerous Highland army, commanded by the Earl of Argyle. At the Battle of the Bridge of Dee, General Middleton obtained by his artillery a similar success, the Highlanders not being able to stand the discharge of Musket's mother, which was the name they bestowed on great guns. In an old ballad on the Battle of the Bridge of Dee these verses occur. The Highland men are pretty men. For handling sword and shield. But yet they are but simple men. To stand a stricken field. The Highland men are pretty men. For target and claymore. But yet they are but naked men. To face the cannon's roar. For the cannon's roar on a summer night. Like thunder in the air was never man in Highland garb, would face the cannon fair. But the Highlanders of 1745 had got far beyond the simplicity of their forefathers, and showed throughout the whole war how little they dreaded artillery. Although the common people still attached some consequence to the possession of the field piece which led to this disquisition. The faithful friend who pointed out the pass by which the Highlanders moved from Tranent to Seton was Robert Anderson, Jr., of Whitburg, a gentleman of property in East Lothian. He had been interrogated by the Lord George Murray concerning the possibility of crossing the uncouth and marshy piece of ground which divided the armies, and which he described as impracticable. When dismissed, he recollected that there was a circuitous path leading eastward through the marsh into the plain, by which the Highlanders might turn the flank of Sir John Cope's position without being exposed to the enemy's fire. Having mentioned his opinion to Mr. Hepburn of Keith, who instantly saw its importance, he was encouraged by that gentleman to awake Lord George Murray and communicate the idea to him. Lord George received the information with grateful thanks, and instantly awakened Prince Charles, who was sleeping in the field with a bunch of peas under his head. The adventurer received with alacrity the news that there was a possibility of bringing an excellently provided army to a decisive battle with his own irregular forces. His joy on the occasion was not very consistent with the charge of cowardice brought against him by Chevalier John Stone, a discontented follower, whose memoirs possess at least as much of a romantic as a historical character. Even by the account of the Chevalier himself, the prince was at the head of the second line of the Highland army during the battle, of which he says, 
it was gained with such rapidity that in the second line, where I was still by the side of the prince, we saw no other enemy than those who were lying on the ground killed and wounded, though we were not more than fifty paces behind our first line, running always as fast as we could to overtake them. This passage in the Chevalier's memoirs places the prince within fifty paces of the heat of the battle, a position which would never have been the choice of one unwilling to take a share of its dangers. Indeed, unless the chiefs had complied with the young adventurer's proposal to lead the van in person, it does not appear that he could have been deeper in the action. The death of this good Christian and gallant man is thus given by his affectionate biographer, Dr. Doddridge, from the evidence of eyewitnesses. He continued all night under arms, wrapped up in his cloak, and generally sheltered under a rick of barley which happened to be in the field. About three in the morning he called his domestic servants to him, of which there were four in waiting. He dismissed three of them with most affectionate Christian advice, and such solemn charges relating to the performance of their duty, and the care of their souls. As seemed plainly to intimate that he apprehended it was at least very probable he was taking his last farewell of them. There is great reason to believe that he spent the little remainder of the time, which could not be much above an hour, in those devout exercises of soul which had been so long habitual to him and to which so many circumstances did then concur to call him. The army was alarmed by break of day by the noise of the rebels' approach, and the attack was made before sunrise, yet when it was light enough to discern what passed. As soon as the enemy came within gunshot they made a furious fire. And it is said that the dragoons which constituted the left wing immediately fled. The colonel at the beginning of the onset, which in the whole lasted but a few minutes, received a wound by a bullet in his left breast, which made him give a sudden spring in his saddle. Upon which his servant, who led the horse, would have persuaded him to retreat, but he said it was only a wound in the flesh, and fought on, though he presently after received a shot in his right thigh. In the meantime, it was discerned that some of the enemy fell by him, and particularly one man who had made him a treacherous visit but a few days before, with great professions of zeal for the present establishment. Events of this kind pass in less time than the description of them can be written, or than it can be read. The colonel was for a few moments supported by his men, and particularly by that worthy person Lieutenant Colonel Whitney, who was shot through the arm here, and a few months after fell nobly at the Battle of Falkirk, and by Lieutenant West. A man of distinguished bravery, as also by about fifteen dragoons, who stood by him to the last. But after a faint fire, the regiment in general was seized with a panic and though their colonel and some other gallant officers did what they could to rally them once or twice, they at last took a precipitate flight. And just in the moment when Colonel Gardiner seemed to be making a pause to deliberate what duty required him to do in such circumstances, an accident happened, which must, I think, in the judgment of every worthy and generous man, be allowed a sufficient apology for exposing his life to so great hazard, when his regiment had left him. He saw a party of the foot, who were then bravely fighting near him, and whom he was ordered to support, had no officer to head them. Upon which he said eagerly, in the hearing of the person from whom I had this account, these brave fellows will be cut to pieces for want of a commander, or words to that effect. Which while he was speaking he rode up to them and cried out, Fire on, my lads, and fear nothing. But just as the words were out of his mouth, a highlander advanced towards him with a scythe fastened to a long pole, with which he gave him so dreadful a wound on his right arm, that his sword dropped out of his hand. And at the same time several others coming about him while he was thus dreadfully entangled with that cruel weapon, he was dragged off from his horse. The moment he fell, another Highlander, who, if the king's evidence at Carlisle may be credited, as I know not why they should not, though the unhappy creature died denying it, was one Macnaught, who was executed about a year after gave him a stroke either with a broadsword or a lahabar axe, for my informant could not exactly distinguish, on the hinder part of his head, which was the mortal blow. All that his faithful attendant saw farther at this time was that, as his hat was fallen off, he took it in his left hand and waved it as a signal to him to retreat and added, what were the last words he ever heard him speak? Take care of yourself. Upon which the servant retired, some remarkable passages in the life of Colonel James Gardiner, by P. Doddridge, D. D. London, 1747, P.187. I may remark on this extract, that it confirms the account given in the text of the resistance offered by some of the English infantry. 
surprised by a force of a peculiar and unusual description, their opposition could not be long or formidable, especially as they were deserted by the cavalry, and those who undertook to manage the artillery. But, although the affair was soon decided, I have always understood that many of the infantry showed an inclination to do their duty. It is scarcely necessary to say that the character of this brutal young laird is entirely imaginary. A gentleman, however, who resembled Balmawapple in the article of courage only, fell at Preston in the manner described. A Perthshire gentleman of high honor and respectability, one of the handful of cavalry who followed the fortunes of Charles Edward, pursued the fugitive dragoons almost alone till near St. Clement's Wells, where the efforts of some of the officers had prevailed on a few of them to make a momentary stand. Perceiving at this moment that they were pursued by only one man and a couple of servants, they turned upon him and cut him down with their swords. I remember when a child, sitting on his grave, where the grass long grew rank and green, distinguishing it from the rest of the field. A female of the family then residing at St. Clement's Wells used to tell me the tragedy, of which she had been an eyewitness, and showed me in evidence one of the silver clasps of the unfortunate gentleman's waistcoat. The name of Andrea de Ferrara is inscribed on all the Scottish broadswords which are accounted of peculiar excellence. Who this artist was, what were his fortunes, and when he flourished, have hitherto defied the research of antiquaries. Only it is in general believed that Andrea de Ferrara was a Spanish or Italian artificer, brought over by James IV. Or V. to instruct the Scots in the manufacture of sword blades. Most barbarous nations excel in the fabrication of arms. And the Scots had attained great proficiency in forging swords so early as the field of Pinky. At which period the historian Patton describes them as, all notably broad and thin, universally made to slice, and of such exceeding good temper that, as I never saw any so good. So I think it hard to devise better, account of Somerset's expedition. It may be observed that the best and most genuine Andrea Ferraras have a crown marked on the blades. The incident here said to have happened to Flora MacIver actually befell Miss Nairn, a lady with whom the author had the pleasure of being acquainted. As the Highland army rushed into Edinburgh, Miss Nairn, like other ladies who approved of their cause, stood waving her handkerchief from a balcony, when a ball from a Highlander's musket, which was discharged by accident, grazed her forehead. Thank God, said she, the instant she recovered, that the accident happened to me, whose principles are known. Had it befallen a Whig, they would have said it was done on purpose. The author of Waverley has been charged with painting the young adventurer in colors more amiable than his character deserved. But having known many individuals who were near his person, he has been described according to the light in which those eyewitnesses saw his temper and qualifications. Something must be allowed, no doubt, to the natural exaggerations of those who remembered him as the bold and adventurous prince in whose cause they had braved death and ruin. But is there evidence to give place entirely to that of a single malcontent? I have already noticed the imputations thrown by the Chevalier John Stone on the prince's courage. But some part at least of that gentleman's tale is purely romantic. It would not, for instance, be supposed that at the time he is favoring us with the highly wrought account of his amour with the adorable Peggy, the Chevalier John Stone was a married man, whose grandchild is now alive. Or that the whole circumstantial story concerning the outrageous vengeance taken by Gordon of Abbey on a Presbyterian clergyman is entirely apocryphal. At the same time it may be admitted that the prince, like others of his family, did not esteem the services done him by his adherents so highly as he ought. Educated in high ideas of his hereditary right, he has been supposed to have held every exertion and sacrifice made in his cause as too much the duty of the person making it to merit extravagant gratitude on his part. Dar. King's evidence, which his leaving the Jacobite interest renders somewhat doubtful, goes to strengthen this opinion. The ingenious editor of John Stone's memoirs has quoted a story said to be told by Helvidius, stating that Prince Charles Edward, far from voluntarily embarking on his daring expedition, was literally bound hand and foot, and to which he seems disposed to yield credit. Now, it being a fact as well known as any in his history, and, so far as I know, entirely undisputed, that the prince's personal entreaties and urgency positively forced Boysdale and Lochiel into insurrection. When they were earnestly desirous that he would put off his attempt until he could obtain a sufficient force from France. 
It will be very difficult to reconcile his alleged reluctance to undertake the expedition with his desperately insisting upon carrying the rising into effect against the advice and entreaty of his most powerful and most sage partisans. Surely a man who had been carried bound on board the vessel which brought him to so desperate an enterprise would have taken the opportunity afforded by the reluctance of his partisans to return to France in safety. It is averred in John Stone's memoirs that Charles Edward left the field of Culloden without doing the utmost to dispute the victory. And, to give the evidence on both sides, there is in existence the more trustworthy testimony of Lord Elcho, who states that he himself earnestly exhorted the prince to charge at the head of the left wing, which was entire, and retrieve the day or die with honor. And on his counsel being declined, Lord Elcho took leave of him with a bitter execration, swearing he would never look on his face again, and kept his word. On the other hand, it seems to have been the opinion of almost all the other officers that the day was irretrievably lost, one wing of the Highlanders being entirely routed, the rest of the army outnumbered, outflanked. And in a condition totally hopeless. In this situation of things the Irish officers who surrounded Charles's person interfered to force him off the field. A cornet who was close to the prince left a strong attestation that he had seen Sir Thomas Sheridan seize the bridle of his horse and turn him round there is some discrepancy of evidence. But the opinion of Lord Elcho, a man of fiery temper and desperate at the ruin which he beheld impending, cannot fairly be taken in prejudice of a character for courage which is intimated by the nature of the enterprise itself. By the prince's eagerness to fight on all occasions, by his determination to advance from Derby to London, and by the presence of mind which he manifested during the romantic perils of his escape. The author is far from claiming for this unfortunate person the praise due to splendid talents, but he continues to be of opinion that at the period of his enterprise he had a mind capable of facing danger and aspiring to fame. That Charles Edward had the advantages of a graceful presence, courtesy, and an address and manner becoming his station, the author never heard disputed by any who approached his person. Nor does he conceive that these qualities are overcharged in the present attempt to sketch his portrait. The following extracts corroborative of the general opinion respecting the prince's amiable disposition are taken from a manuscript account of his romantic expedition, by James Maxwell of Kirkconnell, of which I possess a copy. By the friendship of J. Menzies, E.S.Q., of Pitfoddles. The author, though partial to the prince, whom he faithfully followed, seems to have been a fair and candid man. And well acquainted with the intrigues among the adventurer's council. Everybody was mightily taken with the prince's figure and personal behavior. There was but one voice about them. Those whom interest or prejudice made a runaway to his cause could not help acknowledging that they wished him well in all other respects, and could hardly blame him for his present undertaking. Sundry things had concurred to raise his character to the highest pitch, besides the greatness of the enterprise and the conduct that had hitherto appeared in the execution of it. There were several instances of good nature and humanity that had made a great impression on people's minds. I shall confine myself to two or three. Immediately after the battle, as the prince was riding along the ground that Cope's army had occupied a few minutes before, one of the officers came up to congratulate him and said, pointing to the killed, Sir. There are your enemies at your feet. The prince, far from exulting, expressed a great deal of compassion for his father's deluded subjects whom he declared he was heartily sorry to see in that posture. Next day, while the prince was at Pinky House, a citizen of Edinburgh came to make some representation to Secretary Murray about the tents that city was ordered to furnish against a certain day. Murray happened to be out of the way, which the prince hearing of called to have the gentleman brought to him, saying, he would rather dispatch the business, whatever it was, himself than have the gentleman wait, which he did. By granting everything that was asked. So much affability in a young prince flushed with victory drew encomiums even from his enemies. But what gave the people the highest idea of him was the negative he gave to a thing that very nearly concerned his interest, and upon which the success of his enterprise perhaps depended. It was proposed to send one of the prisoners to London to demand of that court a cartel for the exchange of prisoners taken, and to be taken, during this war. And to intimate that a refusal would be looked upon as a resolution on their part to give no quarter. It was visible a cartel would be of great advantage to the prince's affairs, his friends would be more ready to declare for him if they had nothing to fear but the chance of war in the field. And if the court of London refused to settle a cartel, 
the prince was authorized to treat his prisoners in the same manner the elector of Hanover was determined to treat such of the prince's friends as might fall into his hands. It was urged that a few examples would compel the court of London to comply. It was to be presumed that the officers of the English army would make a point of it. They had never engaged in the service but upon such terms as are in use among all civilized nations, and it could be no stain upon their honor to lay down their commissions if these terms were not observed. And that owing to the obstinacy of their own prince. Though this scheme was plausible, and represented as very important, the prince could never be brought into it, it was below him, he said, to make empty threats, and he would never put such as those into execution. He would never in cold blood take away lives which he had saved in heat of action at the peril of his own. These were not the only proofs of good nature the prince gave about this time. Every day produced something new of this kind. These things softened the rigor of a military government which was only imputed to the necessity of his affairs, and which he endeavored to make as gentle and easy as possible. It has been said that the prince sometimes exacted more state and ceremonial than seemed to suit his condition. But, on the other hand, some strictness of etiquette was altogether indispensable where he must otherwise have been exposed to general intrusion. He could also endure, with a good grace, the retorts which his affectation of ceremony sometimes exposed him to. It is said, for example, that Grant of Glenmoriston having made a hasty march to join Charles, at the head of his clan, rushed into the prince's presence at Holyrood with unceremonious haste, without having attended to the duties of the toilet. The prince received him kindly, but not without a hint that a previous interview with the barber might not have been wholly unnecessary. It is not beardless boys, answered the displeased chief, who are to do your royal highness's turn. The chevalier took the rebuke in good part. On the whole, if Prince Charles had concluded his life soon after his miraculous escape, his character and history must have stood very high. As it was, his station is amongst those a certain brilliant portion of whose life forms a remarkable contrast to all which precedes and all which follows it. The following account of the skirmish at Clifton is extracted from the manuscript memoirs of Evan Macpherson of Clooney, chief of the clan Macpherson, who had the merit of supporting the principal brunt of that spirited affair. The memoirs appear to have been composed about 1755, only ten years after the action had taken place. They were written in France, where that gallant chief resided in exile, which accounts for some gallicisms which occur in the narrative. In the prince's return from Derby back toward Scotland, my lord George Murray, lieutenant general, cheerfully charged himself with the command of the rear, a post which, although honorable, was attended with great danger, many difficulties. And no small fatigue. For the prince, being apprehensive that his retreat to Scotland might be cut off by Mariscal Wade, who lay to the northward of him with an army much superior to what H.R.H. had, while the Duke of Comerland with his whole cavalry followed hard in the rear, was obliged to hasten his marches. It was not, therefore, possible for the artillery to march so fast as the prince's army, in the depth of winter, extremely bad weather, and the worst roads in England. So Lord George Murray was obliged often to continue his marches long after it was dark almost every night, while at the same time he had frequent alarms and disturbances from the Duke of Comerland's advanced parties. Towards the evening of the 28 December 1745 the prince entered the town of Penrith, in the province of Comerland. But as Lord George Murray could not bring up the artillery so fast as he would have wished, he was obliged to pass the night six miles short of that town, together with the regiment of Macdonnell of Glengarry which that day happened to have the arrear guard. The prince, in order to refresh his army, and to give my lord George and the artillery time to come up, resolved to sedure the 29th at Penrith. So ordered his little army to appear in the morning under arms, in order to be reviewed, and to know in what manner the numbers stood from his having entered England. It did not at that time amount to five thousand foot in all, with about four hundred cavalry, compassed of the noblesse who served as volunteers, part of whom formed a first troop of guards for the prince, under the command of my lord Elko, now Comte de Weems, who, being proscribed, is presently in France. Another part formed a second troop of guards under the command of my lord Balmerino, who was beheaded at the Tower of London. A third part served under my lord Le Comte de Kilmarnock, who was likewise beheaded at the Tower. A fourth part served under my lord Pitsligo, who is also proscribed. 
which cavalry, though very few in numbers, being all noblesse, were very brave, and of infinite advantage to the foot, not only in the day of battle, but in serving as advance guards on the several marches, and in patrolling during the night on the different roads which led towards the towns where the army happened to quarter. While this small army was out in a body on the December 20th, upon a rising ground to the northward of Penrith, passing review, Mons. De Cluny, with his tribe, was ordered to the bridge of Clifton, about a mile to southward of Penrith, after having passed in review before Mons. Petullo, who was charged with the inspection of the troops, and was likewise quartermaster general of the army, and is now in France. They remained under arms at the bridge, waiting the arrival of my lord George Murray with the artillery, whom Mons. De Cluny had orders to cover in passing the bridge. They arrived about sunset closely pursued by the Duke of Comerland with the whole body of his cavalry, reckoned upwards of three thousand strong, about a thousand of whom, as near as might be computed, dismounted. In order to cut off the passage of the artillery towards the bridge, while the Duke and the others remained on horseback in order to attack the rear. My Lord George Murray advanced, and although he found Mons. De Cluny and his tribe in good spirits under arms, yet the circumstance appeared extremely delicate. The numbers were vastly unequal, and the attack seemed very dangerous. So my lord George declined giving orders to such time as he asked Mons. De Cluny's opinion. I will attack them with all my heart, says Mons. De Cluny, if you order me. I do order it then, answered my lord George, and immediately went on himself along with Mons. De Cluny, and fought sword in hand on foot at the head of the single tribe of Macphersons. They in a moment made their way through a strong hedge of thorns, under the cover whereof the cavalry had taken their station, in the struggle of passing which hedge my lord George Murray, being dressed and Montagnard, as all the army were, lost his bonnet and wig. So continued to fight bareheaded during the action. They at first made a brisk discharge of their firearms on the enemy, then attacked them with their sabres, and made a great slaughter a considerable time, which obliged Comerland and his cavalry to fly with precipitation and in great confusion. In so much that, if the prince had been provided in a sufficient number of cavalry to have taken advantage of the disorder, it is beyond question that the Duke of Comerland and the bulk of his cavalry had been taken prisoners. By this time it was so dark that it was not possible to view or number the slain who filled all the ditches which happened to be on the ground where they stood. But it was computed that, besides those who went off wounded, upwards of a hundred at least were left on the spot, among whom was Colonel Honeywood, who commanded the dismounted cavalry, whose sabre of considerable value Mons. De Cluny brought off and still preserves, and his tribe likewise brought off many arms, the colonel was afterwards taken up, and, his wounds being dressed, with great difficulty recovered. Mons. De Cluny lost only in the action twelve men, of whom some having been only wounded, fell afterwards into the hands of the enemy, and were sent as slaves to America, when several of them returned, and one of them is now in France. A sergeant in the regiment of Royal Scots. How soon the accounts of the enemy's approach had reached the prince, H.R.H. had immediately ordered Milord Le Comte de Nairn, brigadier, who, being proscribed, is now in France, with the three battalions of the Duke of Athol, the battalion of the Duke of Perth, and some other troops under his command in order to support Cluny, and to bring off the artillery. But the action was entirely over before the Comte de Nairn, with his command, could reach nigh to the place. They therefore returned all to Penrith, and the artillery marched up in good order. Nor did the Duke of Comerland ever afterwards dare to come within a day's march of the prince and his army during the course of all that retreat, which was conducted with great prudence and safety when in some manner surrounded by enemies. As the heathen deities contracted an indelible obligation if they swore by sticks, the Scottish Highlanders had usually some peculiar solemnity attached to an oath which they intended should be binding on them. Very frequently it consisted in laying their hand, as they swore, on their own drawn dirk, which dagger, becoming a party to the transaction, was invoked to punish any breach of faith. But by whatever ritual the oath was sanctioned, the party was extremely desirous to keep secret what the especial oath was which he considered as irrevocable. This was a matter of great convenience, as he felt no scruple in breaking his asseveration when made in any other form than that which he accounted as peculiarly solemn. 
and therefore readily granted any engagement which bound him no longer than he inclined. Whereas, if the oath which he accounted inviolable was once publicly known, no party with whom he might have occasion to contract would have rested satisfied with any other. Louis XI. Of France practiced the same sophistry, for he also had a peculiar species of oath, the only one which he was ever known to respect, and which, therefore, he was very unwilling to pledge. The only engagement which that wily tyrant accounted binding upon him was an oath by the holy cross of Saint Lo Diage, which contained a portion of the true cross. If he prevaricated after taking this oath Louis believed he should die within the year. The constable Saint Paul, being invited to a personal conference with Louis, refused to meet the king unless he would agree to ensure him safe conduct under sanction of this oath. But, says Camin, the king replied, he would never again pledge that engagement to mortal man, though he was willing to take any other oath which could be devised. The treaty broke off, therefore, after much chaffering concerning the nature of the vow which Louis was to take. Such is the difference between the dictates of superstition and those of conscience. Glossary, Volume 2. A, uh, all. Abun, abun, above. A, E, 1. A, F, F, off. A, 4, before. A, hint, behind. A, N, own. A, I, T, S, oats. A, mayest, almost. A, M, B, R, Y, a cupboard, a pantry. An, if. A, N, E, 1. Anuch, enough. Array, annoy, trouble. Assolzied, absolved, acquitted. Assithment, satisfaction. Auld, old. Baff, a blow. Bagonet, a bayonet. Bailey, a city magistrate in Scotland. Bairn, a child. Baith, both. Baines, bones. Bang up, get up quickly. Bounce. Barley, a parley, a truce. Bald, bold. Balder, boulder. Bobby, a halfpenny. Body, sly, cunning. Bees, in the, bewildered, stupefied. Bflumm'd, flattered, cajoled. Begunk, a trick, a cheat. Ben, within, inside. Benempt, named. Bicker, a wooden dish. Bide, stay, endure. Bealdy, affording shelter. Biggying, building. Burlyman, a peace officer. Blackcock, the black grouse. Black fishing, ashing by torchlight, poaching. Blood, blood, blood. Bottle, bodle, a copper coin, worth one third of an English penny. Bogle about the bush, beat about the bush, a children's game. Bonny, beautiful, comely, fine. Bown, prepared. Bra, fine, handsome, showy. Brander, broil. Breeks, breeches. Brent, smooth, unwrinkled. Brogues, highland shoes. Biroo, brew, broth. Bruckle, brittle, infirm. Bruik, enjoy. Brolsey, brolsey, a broil, a fray. Bucky, a perverse or refractory person. Buttock mail, a fine for fornication. Bydand, a waiting. C.A., call. Cadger, a country carrier. C.A.L.L.A.C.H.S., old women on whom devolved the duty of lamenting for the dead, which the Irish call keening. Collant, a stripling, a fine fellow. Kennelly, prudently. Canny, cautious, lucky. Carl, a churl, an old man. Catherine, a freebooter. CGL, a young man. Clocken, a village, a hamlet. Clamihut, a blow, a drubbing. Clash, chatter, gossip. Clatter, tattle, noisy talk. Close, a narrow passage. CLUR, a bump, a bruise. Cocky leky, a soup made of a cock, seasoned with leeks. Coggling and drolling, wheezing and blowing. Coronach, a dirge. Cory, a mountain hollow. Coo, fall. Cow your cracks, cut short your talk, 
hold your tongues. Crack, boast. Craig, the neck, the throat. Crams, merchants' shops, booths. Cutlugged, crop-eared. Daft, foolish, mad, crazy. Dur, dare. Deaving, deafening. Decrete, an order of decree. Deliver, light, agile. Dern, hidden, concealed, secret. Ding, knock, beat, surpass. Dingle, dinnel, tingle, vibrate with sound. Doer, an agent, a manager. Doghead, the hammer of a gun. Doiled, crazed, silly. Doit, having the faculties impaired. Doorlock, a bundle. Dow, a dove. D-O-W-F, douf, dull, spiritless. Drappy, a little drop, a small quantity of drink. A fear, what is becoming. Enough, enough. Edder C-A-P, a spider, an ill-natured person. Evite, avoid, escape. Ewist, a wast, contiguous. Fallow, a fellow. Fold, fold. Feared, afraid. F-E-C-K, a quantity. F-L-E-Y-T, frightened, shy. F-R-A-E, from. G-A-D, a goad, a rod. Gain, gone, gang, go. J, make. Gate, way. G-U-N, going. Gear, goods. Gayest, a ghost. Jin, if. Jeet, crazy, a noodle. GLED, a kite. GLEG, quick, clever. Glisk, a glimpse. GOWD, gold. Graining, groaning. Jurate, wept. GREE, agree. Graybeard, a stone bottle or jug. Grice, grice, gree, a pig. Gripple, griping, niggardly. Good, GUID, good. Gulpin, a simpleton. Che, hall. HAG, a portion of cops marked off for cutting. Haggis, a pudding peculiar to Scotland, containing oatmeal, suet, minced sheep's liver, heart, etc., seasoned with onions, pepper, and salt, the whole mixture boiled in a sheep's stomach. Hail, whole. Heck, a hay rack, at heck and manger, in plenty. HET, hot. HOG, a young sheep before its first shearing. Horse cooer, horse cooper, a horse dealer. Hurdles, the buttocks. Hurley house, a large house fallen into disrepair. ILK, same, of that ilk, of the same name or place. ILKA, every. INGLE, a fire burning upon the hearth. In the bees, stupefied. Keep it, kept. Kempel, a scotch measure of straw or hay. Ken, no. Kippage, disorder, confusion. Kirk, church. Kittle, tickle, ticklish. Laird, lord of the manor. Landlooper, a wanderer, a vagabond. Letty, a lady. Lightly, make light of, disparage. Limmer, a hussy, a jade. Loon, a worthless fellow. A lout. Lou, leap, start. L-U-G, an ear. Lunzi, the loins, the waist. M-A-E, more. Mains, the chief farm of an estate. Mare, more. Maced, most, almost. Mart, beef salted down for winter. Mask, mash, infuse. M-U-N, must. Merc, an old silver coin worth thirteen and one-third pence, English. Mickle, large, much. Morn, tomorrow. Mousted, powdered. Muckle, great, much. Emuente, mount. Muchkin, a measure equal to about three-quarters of an imperial pint. N-A, nay, no, not. Nags, horses. Nail, the sixteenth part of a yard. Nadeless, nevertheless. Any be, knows, tip. Ne'er be in me, devil be in me. Old T.O. do, great doings. 
hour, over. Patrick, a partridge. Panged, crammed. Parich, oatmeal porridge. Pawnee, a peacock. Peculium, private property. Pinners, a headdress for women. Plaque, a copper coin worth one-third of a penny. Platy, an outer covering for the body. Plenish, furnish. Ploy, an entertainment, a pastime. Pottinger, an apothecary. Pony, a pony. Powdering, poking, stirring. Pretty man, a stout, warlike fellow. Qyuan, a young woman. Red, part, separate. Reeses, twigs, branches. Resiling, retracting, withdrawing. Rigs, ridges, plowed ground. Rintherout, a roving person, a vagabond. Row, roll. Road, rolled. R-O-W-T, cried out, bellowed. Roynish, scurvy, coarse. S-A-E, so. S-T. Johnstone's tippet, a rope or halter for hanging. S-R, sore, very. Sol, shall. Sark, a shirt. Salmon, a salmon. S-A-U-T, salt. Scart, scratched, scribbled over. Skellum, a rascal. Scroll, engross, copy. Shanks, legs. Shears, shears. Shouther, the shoulder. Sicken, sick, such. Siller, money. Silly, weak. Skig, the least quantity of anything. Sma, small. Smoky, suspicious. Snack, cut. Sorted, put in proper order, adjusted. Sowens, the seeds of oatmeal soured. Spear, ask, investigate. Spence, the place where provisions are kept. Sprack, lively. Sprechery, movables of an unimportant sort. Spoilsy, spoil. Spung, pick one's pocket. Steve, firm. Str, rough, harsh. Stra, straw. Strks, stretches, lies. Swr, swore. Sweni, before, now, ago. Taglet, harassed, encumbered, loitered. Told, told. Tje, those. Thur, these. Thol, bear, suffer. Thraw, twist, wrench. Threepit, maintained obstinately. Throssel, the thrush. Till, to. Tiravis, hasty fits of passion. Tockerless, without dowry. Tun, a town, a hamlet, a farm. Tilwai, an old fashioned cap for women. Trues, trousers. Trindling, rolling. Tiro W, believe. Tulsi, a quarrel. Tum, tomb, empty. Turnspit doggy, a kind of dog, long bodied and short legged, formerly used in turning a treadmill. Tyke, a dog, a rough fellow. Umquil, formerly, late. Unco, strange, very. Unsansi, unlucky. Usqubujich, whiskey. Veni, venue, about. Vivers, vittles. W.A., wall. W.A.D., wood. Wadset, a deed conveying property to a creditor. W.N., a wagon, to remove. Wayless, a portmanteau, saddlebags. Wan, one. One chancy, unlucky. Where, spend. W.L.F.A.R.D., Wilford, having a good appearance. Weising, inclining, directing. W-H-A, who? W-H-R, where? What for, why? W-H-E-N, a few. Wiles when he, a while ago. Wiles, sometimes. Wilk, which? W-H-N, a few. Whinging, whining. Winna, will not. Whisk, whisk. Y-A-T, gate. 